evening. I'm Carolyn Rye, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. on this 14th day of September 2021. Pursuant to the Virginia State Health Commissioner's Order of Public Health Emergency Statewide Requirement to Wear Masks in K-12 Schools issued August 12, 2021, and Virginia Acts of Assembly Number 1303, Chapter 456, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Guidance for K-12 Schools and the School Board's 2122 Reopening Plan adopted August 10th of this year. It's determined physical distancing will be used in school board chambers as a health mitigation strategy. Therefore, they'll, therefore, there'll be limited public seating available on a first come first serve basis beginning shortly before the school board meeting. Members of the public as always will are able to observe the school board meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com broadcast on VBTV channel 47 and on zoom. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you please take the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in school board chambers is Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Manning, Ms. Owens, Ms. Riggs, and Ms. Weems. Thank you. I now ask all present to join to join us in a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, that leads us to the student employee and public awards recognition part of the program. Um, Mrs. Melnick, would you please proceed? Tonight, we as a board have the pleasure of recognizing two division students who have been awarded or recognized during state, multi-state, or national competitions or events. With that in mind, we are pleased to announce the school board recognition recipients for September 14th, 2021. Mrs. Weems? We begin our recognitions tonight by honoring Mia O'Neill for the 2020-21 school year. Mia was a senior and became a proud 2021 VBCPS graduate from Lansdowne High School in June. As Mia was rounding out her high school career, she had one more meet to attend. Saturday, June 19th, she competed in the VHSL Group 6A Outdoor Track State Championship and won titles in the 200 meter dash with a time of 24.15 seconds and the 400 meter dash with a time of 55.26 seconds. This marks her second state title in the 400 meter dash. She also won the event in 2019. Mia ended up her high school career as a four time state track champion and is now proudly attending the University of Tennessee on a full track scholarship. And I grew up just an hour from, from Vol Country, so way to go, Mia. Congratulations. We know you will continue to make all of us proud as you continue your education and grow as a collegiate athlete. Next, we are excited to recognize Ella Schumacher for the 2020 uh, and 2021 school a year. Ella was a junior in the IB program at Princess Anne School High School in in um, high school and in June she was named the VHSL Film Festival State Champion in the category of commercial or public service announcement for her production of a PSA titled Expectations. Her PSA focused on teen activity and reflected the pressure she and her peers faced regarding school and the future. This film was created last year as a project in her cinema studies class. However, she had to wait to submit it until this year 
due to the cancellation of last year's competition. Ella now is a senior. She plans to compete again, again this year and hopes to challenge herself in one of the longer categories. Her PSA is viewable on the VHSL Film Festival on the YouTube channel. Congratulations, Ella. We know your future has great things ahead. This concludes the recognition for this meeting. Thank you, ladies, and congratulations again to our students. Okay, that leads us now to adoption of the agenda. Uh, please note that the PRC met for a special meeting last evening and has made some amendments to certain bylaws and policies in the action and information sections. These amendments have been sent out and the PRC will review them during the meeting. So motion, uh, motion to approve the agenda. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Anderson, any discussion? All right, hearing none, please show your approval with raised hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So that brings us to the superintendent's report. Uh, welcome, Dr. Spence. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, and good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. So here are a few items of interest for you and our families to know on this uh, Tuesday evening. First, last week, of course, we welcomed back more than 65,000 students along with thousands of teachers and staff as they came back into our building for the beginning of the 2021-22 school year. I know everyone was very excited to have students back in the classrooms again and their chattering in our hallways has never been a more welcome sound. On the first day of school, we did ask families and staff to share first day of school photos using the hashtag VBFirstDay, and on the screen you can see just a handful of some of the adorable and creative photos that graced our social media. I was able to visit four schools in our environmental studies program students at the Brock Center classroom last week, and I can say the energy and excitement of this year is something that I have not felt in a long time. And I'm proud, to be, uh, beyond proud, of the work, dedication, support of our teachers, our staff, and our families, and all that they've done to get us here. Thank you to everyone for a fantastic first few days and make sure you check out some of the other photos by viewing the VB First Day hashtag on the division's Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter accounts. Next up, two reminders this evening. First, our division calendar is available on the calendar page on vbschools.com. This calendar shows holidays, staff days, and other pertinent information, but also on the calendar page. You will find the AB schedule, the 4x4 schedule, and dates for progress reports and report cards. Also, please make sure your contact information is up to date with your child's school. This includes email addresses, phone numbers, etc. Our school division's rapid notification system, Alert Now, allows parents and legal guardians to receive timely communication about inclement weather, need to know events, available resources, COVID notifications, and more. And it's also important that our staff make sure that their information is up to date, which can be done on the intranet within the employee self-service tab where there are downloadable instructions available on the right side of that page. So for any of our stakeholders, if you're not receiving the voice, email, or text messages we're sending out through Alert Now, please call or email your child's school or email alertnowinfo at vbschools.com. Tonight, I have the honor of highlighting three individuals recognized by the Virginia Association for the Gifted. Two teachers and one division parent have been named as great supports and champions for gifted education, and it's my privilege to recognize them this evening. First, I'm very happy to honor Sunseret Betancourt. Ms. Betancourt is a gifted resource teacher with Newcastle Elementary School and was named one of two 2021 Outstanding Teachers of the Gifted. She has been described as a fierce advocate for gifted learners, and she works to ensure continued collaborative involvement between students, parents, and teachers. She's not only a leader within her school, but also in the division. She's delivered many professional learning sessions and presentations to staff at the local, state, and national levels covering various gifted topics. And she's presented alongside staff members with the gifted office within the Department of Teaching and Learning. Each year, Ms. Betancourt meets with families to share information about gifted learners and how they can be supported, and she also assists parents and guardians throughout the gifted identification process with a goal to ensure that gifted students receive authentic, relevant, and rigorous educational experiences. 
She's a hardworking advocate for gifted learners. She's an instructional leader and she's well respected by our colleagues in administration. And we are very thankful to have such a strong advocate for our gifted students. Next, I'm also proud to honor Jill Kim Campbell. Ms. Campbell was given the 2021 Gifted Parent of the Year Award by the Virginia Association for the Gifted. She's been described as someone who understands and recognizes the importance of reaching a variety of stakeholders in order to strengthen partnerships that benefit gifted learners and their families. She has served in a variety of roles to support gifted learning, including chairing the VBCPS Gifted Advisory Committee for Gifted Education. With this, she understands the importance of outreach advocacy community and perspective and is noted as being friendly and professional with steadfast determination to help all gifted students and their families. Ms. Campbell says she began volunteering as a way to give back to these schools and to VBCPS and is incredibly appreciative of the staff and educators throughout the division. Thank you, Ms. Campbell, for your service and advocacy, which earned you this distinguished award. We know you will work to continue to inspire others. And finally, rounding out the three honorees this evening is Heidi Yeager. Ms. Yeager is a gifted teacher with Kempsville Middle School and was named one of two 2021 Outstanding Teachers of the Gifted. She is described as a change agent for gifted students and gifted education throughout her school and the division. Her dedication and creativity are evident through her student outreach avenues, including social Zoom sessions and check-in sessions. And she's also started mentorship programs between middle school and elementary schools student shadowing programs between Kempsville Middle and some of the high schools, and a division-based high school academy gifted night. Ms. Yeager strongly believes in encouraging parents or guardians to be involved in a significant way and shows true commitment to the whole child by including families in relationship building activities such as gifted family book clubs. Your dedication and protect productivity in the field of gifted education provide a model for excellent curriculum and instruction and services, and we thank you for that, Ms. Yeager. Madam Chair, thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Spence. And our congratulations to our teachers and parents. <laughs> All right, approval of meeting minutes. We have two sets tonight. So we'll begin with the August 24th, 2021 regular school board meeting. Uh, any, modific any modifications to these minutes before I accept motions? All right, with that motion to approve, Mrs. Holtz, a second. Mrs. Anderson, discussion? All right, hearing none, please show your approval with a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. And for the record, how many votes, please? 11. Thank you. So now we come to the September 1st uh, special school board meeting. Any modifications to these minutes? All right, then motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Anderson, discussion? All right. Please show your approval with a raised hand. We have eight ayes. Okay, uh, nays a raised hand. I will be abstaining Ab since I was no longer there. Oh, I was gonna say abstentions now and please state your reason, uh, Mrs. Hughes. Or I'll let the clerk, I'm sorry, recognize okay. you. Ms. Hughes, your reason for your abstention? The meeting was scheduled when I was out of town, so I didn't attend. Thank you. Ms. Franklin? Same, same thing. I was on, uh, not in attendance. And Ms. Manning? I was also not in attendance. Thank you. So we have um, eight ayes, no nays, and three abstentions. So the motion did pass. Okay, thank you. Now that brings us to hearing of citizens and delegations on formal agenda items. The school board will now hear comments on formal agenda items from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to this meeting. Persons signed up to speak will be called up three at a time to line up. 
The speaker is, is asked to proceed to line up when your name is called. For speakers who are outside of school board chambers, school division staff, we'll bring those speakers into the hall to line up. In-person speakers will be called first, followed by those speaking through Zoom or telephone. We ask that you speak once your name is called. As a reminder, each speaker has four minutes to present and may be and will be given a 30 second warning before time expires. Once your time has expired, the speakers asked to stop making remarks and uh, to allow the next speaker to be queued to speak. If a speaker is not present when called to speak or not online when so called, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the pub public comment session. The purpose of hearing public comments at this point in the agenda is for members of the public to address the board regarding matters on tonight's formal meeting agenda. If a speaker begins speaking on matters not on, as not on the formal meeting agenda, the speaker will be ruled out of order and requested to discontinue remarks or and if the speaker continues to address the school board, uh, they will be ruled out of order and asked to leave the podium, or online speakers would be uh, cut off. Any discussions regarding whether speaker is addressing a formal agenda meeting item or is following decorum and order rules will not extend the speaker's four minute time period. The board reserves the right to maintain appropriate decorum and order in chambers so that the board and viewing public are able to observe and hear the school board meeting. Uh, Public comment is only allowed when a member of the public has been called up to speak during a public comment section. Speaking out of turn, excessive cheering or clapping, heckling of speakers will be considered violations of the decorum and order. Uh, should members of the public interfere with the orderly conduct of this meeting, uh, this board reserves the right to take appropriate action to restore order and allow the business of the board to continue without disruption. Uh, Please keep in mind the school board invites the public to also submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. If any speaker signed up for the formal agenda item public comment section would like to speak on informal and non-agenda items, please speak with school division staff in the hall and to be moved accordingly. If a speaker is ruled out of order once the speaker has begun addressing the board, uh, that speaker would not have the opportunity to continue uh, later on in the program. Uh, we do welcome the, the public in person and those viewing us this evening. And with that, Madam Clerk, please introduce this, the first speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speaker will be Gavin Grimm, then Jana Staltesiak, and then Matthias Paul Telkamp. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Good to see everybody. Um, my name is Gavin Grimm. You may or may not recognize my name, but if you do, it is likely as the client in a landmark civil rights lawsuit, Gavin Grimm versus Gloucester County Public School Board. My lawsuit happened, we filed in 2015, um, and six years later, I was victorious. The lawsuit hinged on whether or not Banning me from the boys' bathroom because I am a transgender man violated my rights um, uh, as, a, as a student in that school. I am here to speak to you today from that perspective, the perspective of a child victim of discriminatory policies, the perspective of a child victim for lack of support from my school board, lack of concern for my well-being and my rights. And I want to address some um, arguments we may hear today and make a point about um, this issue more broadly. <clears throat> First and foremost, if people want to engage with the concept of safety in bathrooms or other spaces, we need to talk about the real issue, which is that trans people are disproportionately more likely to experience sexual violence in areas where they are deemed not acceptable to be in. My school board wanted to force me into the girls' bathroom because they did not consider me a real boy. The issue at hand is not about predators going into the girls' room, as people love to argue. Um, and interestingly, with that argument, uh, assaulting people in bathrooms remains illegal, and criminals don't typically sit around waiting for loopholes. Um, 
This issue is fundamentally about the autonomy of students and their right to safety, recognition, and support in their schools. It was not possible for me to access my high school education on a level equal to my peers while I was going through the trauma and discrimination of being set apart from everybody else. Not only that, but it is fundamentally illegal, not only in the Fourth Circuit, but in Virginia specifically. There are federal and state rules now on the books that says that not protecting trans students with these model policies is illegal. I went to court for six years to prove that it was illegal, and I walked out victorious. The consequences of that was that the school board had to pay $1.3 million to my ACLU team for court costs and such, as well as pay their lawyers whatever that cost accrued. I want to caution everybody here to set aside their impulse perhaps to make a movement or make a move or a choice which would be politically favorable if you have conservative constituents and rather put aside personal social ramifications and consider what is best for the students in these schools. Trans students deserve the right to a free and open education just like everybody else does and creating a discriminatory, discriminatory environment in a school by mandating them out of public spaces with their peers is discrimination, it's illegal, and it's impermissible. I call upon every member of the school board to consider the rights of these transgender young people when you're making your decision, and consider that the existence and presence of transgender people in public space um, is not a threat to anybody. In states and in countries across the world uh, that have had transferring policies for many, many more years than we've been clutching our pearls about it. 30 seconds. Uh, these purported spikes in crime simply have not happened. It's not true. It's a bad faith argument. All of the arguments against trans children being who they are are bad faith arguments. So again, I implore every one of you to consider the rights of these children and their right to a happy, supportive education where they can flourish exactly as they are. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jana Staltesiak, then Matthew Paul Telkamp, and then Annie Palumbo. Welcome. Hi, my name is Jana, and I go to Virginia Beach Schools. I've come to talk to you a couple of times, but mostly on Zoom, because it still makes me really nervous to come in around all these people, so Thank you for making sure that there is space here and that everybody is wearing masks. Because what I have to say today is very important to me. And I wanted to come to say it, even though last time I spoke, people laughed at me when I talked about how afraid I was of my father getting COVID and dying. So thank you for making it as safe as you can. So most of you know my mom. So it would probably be surprising that for you to know that when I started questioning who I am attracted to, I was actually scared to tell her and my dad. I mean, my mom is very supportive and accepting, but she's important to me and I love her. And it would be awful if like she, she didn't accept me. So I talked to other people, like some of my really close friends or my brother and coming up to them helped me gain more courage to come out to my parents. And I'm lucky because it went as well as we would expect. And my mom has helped me as I have had to come out to other people about it, like the other members of my family and my doctors. But it feels like there's so many people I need to tell. And it gets scary, but nothing's as scary as telling your parents. But other kids, they aren't as lucky as I am. There are kids whose parents would rather hurt them than accept them. There are kids whose parents would kick them out because they don't love them enough to be around them if they aren't exactly who they want, they think they should be. And there are some kids whose parents just take some t time to get used to it, but can, it can really hurt while parents take that time. And there are kids whose parents will just refuse to accept that it's fact and will continue to refer to them by what they really are not. Some of those kids are friends of mine. They're figuring out who I am. They are just like I am, and they deserve to not have someone at school decide if and when they are ready to talk to their family about it. They deserve to be who they are and to have some place where it is safe to just be themselves while they are figuring it out. I hope that is home, but I know that there are 
many LGBTQIA plus kids that are in foster care and homeless shelters, and it's a disproportionate amount. I have seen my friends scared to talk to their families. I've seen them excited when a teacher lets them be who they really are. Please don't force my friends and others like them by to and make it worse for them by forcing them to talk to their families about it when they aren't ready. Don't out kids whose families could hurt them because they want to be themselves. Please give them a place where they can be safe. It's like when the home is in a safe place, you go to school almost every day. It's a place where you spend most of your time. And if that place isn't safe for you to be yourself, then I don't know where you would find a safe place if you can't find it at home or at school. And just 30 seconds. Up. So thank you. Have a great day. Our next speaker is Matthias Paul Telkamp, then Annie Palumbo, and then Amy Solaris. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Chairwoman Rye, Dr. Spence, and board members. My name is Matthias Paul Telkamp. And I'm sorry to see that you will be having a long evening yet again. It seems like the religious right has come out to tout their own personal ethics yet again. My only complaint with Policy 5-7 is that you appear to be putting all the onus on Dr. Spence and his team when you should be shouldering that responsibility. See, we know that the rules will be interpreted differently at every school. And let's be honest with each other. The dress code is currently written with the same language. The problem is that with me having three kids in three different schools, I have witnessed how that was implemented. Dress codes in this country are used to slut shame our daughters and blame women for being objectified without telling the boys not to object objectify them. There are many videos online as examples of how a male can wear the exact same clothes as a girl and not suffer the same consequences. And the guidance is that the policies are guides but not an enforcement position. And maybe you should consider that any policy that is outlined is handled the same at every single school. Otherwise, we will continue seeing disparity of equity between students. Kids should be able to wear what they want. They should be free to decide what they are comfortable with. And in the end, you are leaving school administrators to make decisions that should be standard across the district. Every kid treated the same, regardless of their gender or dress. I understand that you will be dealing with a lot of heat tonight from those whose lips are spewing fire and brimstone with their hatred. And we should feel sorry for these unfortunate souls that are prideful and shameful. Their knowledge and thoughts cannot properly understand what is written in the policy unless you come down to their level. Legalese is not something that the simpletons speaking as the opposition to this policy will be able to comprehend. So you may need to do more to clarify that with simpler wording, such as the golden rule, Matthew 7.12 and Luke 6.31. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Any unfair consideration they ask for should be something they want done to themselves. In the end, our students need to be protected. As you will most likely hear from others speaking tonight, 40% of our youth LGBTQ students have already considered suicide. And what you should be asking is how you can help these students feel safe in their schools. The students that we should be worrying about being around our daughters are the boys that buy into the male superiority and not the students that just want to feel like they belong in the schools. Nurture an environment of acceptance and make these students feel safe. Stay the course, but shoulder the responsibility. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annie Palumbo, Amy Solaris, Becky Hay. Good evening. 
evening. Welcome. You not start the clock. <laughs> Good evening. My notes are going to be all over the place because I had them all ordered until I heard the speakers in front of me. I'm going to try to speak as much truth tonight with a smile as I can, kind of like you guys all speak with lies with a smile. This is what I noticed, and I hear you laughing over here, so I don't know if you're on my side or not, but this is what really bothered me while I was waiting in line just now. I heard one security officer whisper to the others, the crowd's okay outside. We are a bunch of Christians praying out there. We have never, ever had any trouble out there, ever. And these lies that are going around, I heard them yesterday in the policy review meeting. You guys, people, somebody just got escorted out the back door because they were afraid. There's policemen out there with us. There's security out there with us. Has anybody, really, I want to see the police report and I want to see all the, the emails of people saying that we are, they're afraid of us. Because you all know that's a lie. So stop spreading lies. Trenace, Beverly Anderson, I don't know, where, oh, there you are. Because they're lies. It's not true. And you know it. Let's see, the crowd is fine. Um, protecting trans students. What about the straight students? I have no problem, nor does any of the other group, with transgender students. What I find alarming is the big number of transgender students nowadays. I mean, our schools are confusing kids. You're not okay as a boy or a girl how God, how God made you. So you must be transgender. That's my problem. That's our problem. And you know, all these rights for trans students, what about the straight students? I'm a girl. When I was in high school and junior high school, I, was, I didn't like going in the bathroom. I didn't. I was very self-conscious of people even, even seeing my feet under the stalls. So you want boys to go in there? Even if you decide you're a girl, I don't think it's right. And I mean, make one bathroom with a closed door. I don't care. But you've got to, you have got to think of the straight students as well. I did a little, I don't know, I did a search before I came here. 0.07% of the population is trans. So we are bending the rules for such a small population and ignoring the rest of the students. I don't get it. What I have a problem with this policy is that you all are passing the buck off to Mr. Spence, Superintendent Spence. And I was writing my notes today and I thought, gee, I wonder why they're doing that. Well, there's already issues in the, in the bathrooms from what I understand. So a boy who says he's a girl goes into the girl's bathroom, something happens to the girl, it's off of your shoulders and onto him because Dr. Spence made the policy, not you guys. I have a problem with that. I don't think it's right that the boys should go in the bathroom. I don't think it's right they should go uh, in, the, in the locker rooms. And I think it's horrible that I got a call the other day from a teacher who was so distraught because his seventh grader said, I want you to now call me by my, my pronoun. And he's like, I can't, I'm a Christian, you're a boy. So you're, you're, that is not for you guys to decide, none of you. It is for the parents to decide. And for you to say, don't tell your parents, that's wrong. But we're a fighting force. And we're getting lots of national attention. And you may say, it's because we want to be on TV. Nope. We want to shine the light in the dark. So we'll be on national TV again on Thursday for your information. Seconds. And we're going to tell them about how you are blocking all these seats off. It's 95 degrees out. Everyone's sweating out there. Uh, you're, you're trying to, uh, the funniest thing is the flags. You don't want to bring a flag in because they're used as weapons. I have a concealed carry permit. I could have a weapon in my purse right now. And you know what? You're worried about a eight inch flag? Seriously? Stop lying. Stop lying about us being a gauntlet out there and people being afraid because we have never been violent ever. And that is time. Our next speaker is Amy Solaris, Becky Hay, and then Thomas Conant. Welcome. Hi. Shameful. That's the word I've chosen for you guys on the Virginia Beach City Public School Board. You know who you are. Instead of looking at policies which have brought out so many of us parents to stand up and speak our minds to you, you have a special meeting where you talk about how you can limit our involvement even more than you already are with the number of seats and et cetera, et cetera. I watched that special meeting and not one of you could get your thoughts down to less than four minutes, yet you continue to press that number to us 
and even threaten to allow less minutes to us. The policies are our problem. We're speaking out because of the policies. Maybe you need to go back and look at the policies instead of limit parental involvement even more. Seems very simple to me. You've taken away parental rights when it comes to masking or not our own children. You've taken away parental rights when it comes to this new transgender policy, and you've also successfully taken away the privacy rights of my children. You've taken away parental rights when it comes to allowing us parents to be involved in our children's education, as the Code of Virginia specifically states. Shameful. I know you don't care about what your constituency wants. It's clear from day one you couldn't care any less about that as long as you're willing to continue your political agendas. I will continue to speak to make sure other parents know what's going on and that they need to open their eyes. I'm still fairly new to this, but from the start, I will tell you, as a parent coming to a board, you've been incredibly unwelcoming, which is amazing to me considering all of you were elected. It's been eye-opening for me and many others, which is why we're standing up. It's the policies. Don't limit us more. We're coming out because we don't agree with the policies. You're going down the wrong path. We don't want racism taught in our public classrooms. We don't want decisions regarding our own children's health interests taken from us. We want our parental re responsibilities and rights given back to us. And we will continue to stand up and fight for our children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Hay, Thomas Conant, Jessica Miley. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here to discuss um, Policy 5-7 regarding non-discrimination and non-harassment of students. I have four main comments and concerns regarding the proposed edits to the current policy as it pertains to the VDOE's transgender model policy. First, Dr. Spence should not be determining policy. He should be executing it. It is your role as the board to determine policy, handing off your responsibility to an employee of the district, someone who is not elected and not directly accountable to the citizens of our city is inappropriate and just plain lazy. The board should be reviewing and editing policy as needed with the input of the administration as well as all community stakeholders. Secondly, parental rights and notification trump everything. It is not the role of the school to determine what it will and will not tell parents regarding their students. It's a total usurping of parental authority for the school board to not include the parent in all situations and circumstances related to their children, unless a specific court order said, uh, says otherwise. Whereas in my previous point, you seek to shirk responsibility, on this point, you are completely overstepping your bounds. Thirdly, based on what I've been able to ascertain, there's approximately 100 transgender students in Virginia Beach out of 64,000 students. Gender dysphoria is real and we should seek to provide resources to assist students struggling with that situation. However, making more than 99% of students conform to accommodate less than 1% is ridiculous, especially when to do so will make scores of students uncomfortable. Along that line of thinking, it is unbelievable that the district is considering allowing biological males to use female locker rooms or allowing biological males and females to share a room overnight for a field trip based on gender identity. It's also wholly irresponsible. My last concern tonight is for teachers who will not be able to abide the requirement to use the chosen pronouns of transgender students. You are putting those teachers in a position of either losing their jobs or violating their conscience. I am sure you are aware of the lawsuit against Loudoun County Public Schools by elementary gym teacher Tanner Cross. Who's gonna be the Tanner Cross in Virginia Beach and sue our district when you discipline them based on their religious objections? I hope there are several of them because this type of policy mandate which disregards matters of conscience deserves to be litigated. One final note. It's disturbing to me the recommendations being brought to the board tonight by the Policy Review Committee many of which seek to deter and even disallow comments and concerns like mine tonight. I and many others have spoken to the board many times over the past 18 months, and frankly, I'm tired of it. However, it's my job as a constituent to communicate with my elected officials and persistently and repeatedly when my concerns are not acknowledged or addressed. Students and families in Virginia Beach need all of you to do your jobs regarding policy, even if it's uncomfortable or unpopular. The voters will hold you accountable as our elected officials based on your work. Your job also involves listening to your constituents, not finding ways to limit interaction 
or engagement or communication. Many of you are unwittingly fueling the fires of your own recall. You may feel comfortable inside your echo chambers, but outside, a storm's brewing. Citizens and parents united will not allow you to continue to abuse your privileged positions, and we will not be silenced. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas Conant, Jessica Miley, Mary Reismeyer. Welcome. Thank you. I oppose policy 5-7. On September 1st, a board member called me and questioned my integrity and my calling in pastoral ministry, saying, I wondered, where would you pastor? Well, those in the church I led believe that this book is the word of God and the standard of truth. That church strives to love God, love people, and make Jesus known. My opposition to this policy comes from my love for God and his word and from my love for people. The Bible states, and Jesus affirmed, that God created man in his own image, male and female. As Christians, we believe God created us in his own image and likeness, two distinct and valuable sexes that both men and women separately and together reflect the image and likeness of God. The Bible also teaches that sin entered the world and affects every area of life, causing disconnection and separation from God and others. The first commandment says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Saying I'm a woman in a man's body is one example of sin's effect in the world, since, it's, it, since it not only tells God that his creation is wrong, but it makes me God, saying that I know better than he does. And you can say that's, that's hateful, which is also how that board member described all those who oppose the policy such as this. But I suggest it is actually more loving to tell someone the truth rather than lying to them, which the Bible also says is sin. Now, science recognizes gender dysphoria as a genuine psychological condition, but also finds that the majority of childhood cases resolve naturally over time. As a Christian, I condemn any discrimination or hurtful act towards anyone who is confused about their sex. But I would not lie to them and tell them how they feel defines their identity, which again puts them in the place of God. The biblical view is that God defines us and we find our identity in Him. Jesus said some very harsh things about those who would cause a little one to sin. How can we justify telling 5 and 10 and 15 year olds that it's okay to disagree with God? Truth is defined by what is really real. And one's sex is clearly revealed at birth. And regardless of hormones or surgeries, one's chromosomes remain what they were born with. Lest you say, well, Jesus didn't condemn sinners. How can you? My answer is we don't condemn sinners. Yes, Jesus loved them. But Jesus also said, go and sin no more. We can be compassionate and loving to those who are confused without affirming behavior that leads to sin and more confusion. And while Jesus was compassionate with sinners, he often harshly criticized the religious and political leaders of his day, the Pharisees and scribes. What would that say to decisions today's elected leaders make? Is it right to require teachers to lie to parents about children's sexual feelings, which undermines the command to honor father and mother? or to command school staff to sin by lying to students and parents. It's possible to love God and people and still passionately oppose policies like this because what's really real is found in God's word. And I will not be silenced from standing for his word. Jesus said we're to be salt and light in our communities and sometimes salt stings. There's a distinct difference between passion for what's right and hatred or anger. We're passionate because we believe God's truth and we believe we are not being heard. The first century political leaders told Peter and John to stop preaching Jesus. Kind of like this board is trying to stop opposing views. Their reply was, we ought to obey God rather than men. Listen, Jesus died on the cross to pay for sins like the ones these policies promote. And he will forgive anyone who turns from any sin against God and trusts him as Savior. His truth is what really sets us free. We can love those who are confused and protect them from bullying and discrimination without lying to them about what is empirically real and true. I strongly urge you to vote against this abhorrent policy. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jessica Miley, Mary Reismeyer, Angela Jenkins. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you all for getting our kiddos back in school. I have two children at Old Donation School who have come home happy but exhausted um, for the last six days. So thank you for getting them back in school. We are very appreciative of that. Um, I'm not only a mom, but I also work at a pediatric hospital. So pediatric health care and mental health is very important to me in my personal life and in my career. 
Um, the last board meeting, I was here, um, the, and I was shocked by the hatred and homophobic rhetoric. And so uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And there is really only evidence to support that trans kids are the ones in danger. There's not much factual evidence to support the opposite. So I'm going to provide you today with some sources, uh, excuse me, some facts, and I'm going to cite all of my sources because there are some facts I've been hearing throwing around that I'm not clear as to where they got those facts. So I'll be citing my sources. The first one is from Harvard School of Public Health in May of 2019, came out with a study that said trans and non-binary uh, teens face greater risk of sexual assault in schools that prevent them from using bathrooms or locker rooms consistent with their gender identity. Researchers combed through data of 3,700 US teens and found that 36% of trans and non-binary students with those restrictions reported being sexually assaulted in the last 12 months. I'm now gonna move on to an additional source from the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm assuming you're all very familiar with this source as it sets the standards of care in the United States. It has over 70,000 pediatricians committed to optimal physical, mental, and social health and well-being. It's important to note that um, the American Academy of Pediatrics is also independent and nonpartisan forum. Recently, in the last year, the AAP revealed alarming levels of attempted suicide. Their findings emphasize urgency of building welcoming and safe communities for the LGBT community. You all have the power to do that. You have the power to create safe environments for these kids. I'm now going to provide you with some resources from Drs. Johns and Meyer, who presented a, a finding in 2020 that stated that LGBTQ youth face significant disparities in suicide risk compared to their straight peers. This was based largely on ways they are treated in their broad environment. That's school. 40% of the LGBT community contemplate suicide. 84% of the LGBTQ community feel unsafe. And this is not a small population that we're talking about. Over 15% of students in the schools of United States identify as gay. I'm gonna provide you a statistic straight here from Hampton Roads that shows that 70% of the homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. So there's a direct correlation there. I'm asking you to please vote in favor to protect our trans students. And as Gavin Grimm reminded us. 30 uh, seconds. Thank you. As Gavin Grimm reminded us, there is, uh, and I'm going to quote the ACLU legal director, Eden Heilman, said, there's a cost to the safety and well-being of kids and there's a cost to taxpayers when school boards break the law. Please come together, vote, use your core values that are posted right there behind you, and please vote based on facts and evidence, and please not vote on the homophobic rhetoric that you might be hearing tonight. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mary Reismeyer, then Angela Jenkins, then Andy Bond. Welcome. Good evening. There are so many important issues being discussed at this meeting tonight. Four minutes isn't long enough, nor will four hours be, to express all the concerns I have with 140 plus pages in the agenda. First, I'm going to start with, I'm going to hit the wave tops, and maybe we say wave tops when we're going to hit the things we think most important. The non-discrimination policy. I am not homophobic. I, do, I love all people who are born in the image of God. If anything comes from this meeting, it is imperative that you do not simply delegate to the superintendent the drafting of regulations without the requirement for those draft regulations to be made available for public comment and a requirement that this body, once they have been available for public comment, then vote on those regulations. You are our elected officials. That is your job. It is not to delegate it to Dr. Spence. If you simply direct the superintendent to write the regulations with no oversight, you are not doing your job, simply put. 
This policy and any implementing regulations is supposed to make everyone feel safe and included. How is it that the feelings of the majority of students are being ignored? Most girls will not feel safe knowing that a boy or even a man, an 18 year old senior, can walk into the bathroom or locker room at any time without anybody questioning. Why do their feelings not matter? Aren't you supposed to make sure everyone feels safe and welcomed in our schools? Were you aware that numerous students were required to stand up on the first day of school and state their name and pronounce their preferred pronoun? That happened in our school system. This policy has not been passed. It's already happening. This is absolutely unacceptable. This requirement, in the name of making everyone feel safe and included and welcome, had the dead opposite effect on many students. Many students are, who are suffering from anxiety that was worsened as a result of school's closings were made to feel awful, unwanted, uncomfortable. One student said, who did, wasn't asked this question went home and told her mom, if I'd had to done, do that, it would have pushed me over the edge and I would not have gone back to school, ever. Proposed changes to the bylaws. The vast majority of proposed changes are aimed at limiting the public's involvement at meetings, reducing speaking time to three minutes, stopping public comment at 8 p.m. to continue maybe later, com or completely disallowing the public comment. It was disheartening and infuriating to hear several members of the board say that they have to stop public comment to do the work of the school board. Your job is to listen to the people who put you on those, in those seats. That is your job. That is the work of the school board. The proposed changes would additionally result in bylaws that can be changed at the whim of the majority of the board. That does, not, that does grave disservice to the term bylaws. There's, there's a reason that the governing bodies use Robert's rules and follow them. It is precisely to avoid exactly what the proposed changes would result in. No one, not even the school board members, would know how the meeting will be run when they showed up that day. 30 seconds. Having listened to school board meetings for the past 18 months, it's apparent that the majority of the members don't know Robert's rules. So we just want to throw them out and not follow them. My bottom lines, don't delegate the regulation to the superintendent and shirk your responsibilities to the people who elected you. Don't approve the changes that severely restrict the public's ability to participate in meetings. Don't modify the bylaws as recommended. Doing so provides no structure or protection to the process. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angela Jenkins, then Andy Bond, and then Kyle Laflame. Welcome. Thank you. First, thank you for your time tonight and for your shared concern for our children. Our first and foremost mission in life as parents and grandparents is to protect our children. The proposed policy will strip parents of their rights and actively keep things from parents. While children still need permission slips for field trips, consent to take Tylenol at school, children will now be able to choose their name, their pronouns, bathrooms, locker rooms, and even overnight school accommodations to align with their preferred gender identity without parental knowledge. Children are not adults until 18, at such a time that they are emotionally mature enough to make life decisions. Section 1-240.1 of the Code of Virginia titled Rights of Parents says a parent has the fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education, and share, care of their children. This is the law and we have to stand up for our rights. We will not stop fighting until our children have a safe and unbiased environment to conduct their education with policies that are not based on gender identity feelings. Society does not live based on feelings. We live based on fact that every action has a consequence, good or bad. We're trying to adopt a policy based entirely on feelings, and by doing so, you're intentionally creating harmful acts against children and indoctrinating a generation who will be have no absolutes, believing there are no consequences, yet the consequences of this policy are grave. There will be emotional distress that will lead to mental health issues. You'll have young boys and girls who will eventually become victims of molesting and potential rape. If you think this is extreme, it is not. Uh, inside the Central California Women's Facility, it's been reported that at least one woman, possibly more, is now pregnant after housing a gender-confused man who entered the prison as a woman. The inmates are calling this a nightmare's worst nightmare. 
if you don't think this conduct will take place in school restrooms across this nation, you're wrong. My heart breaks for the children who are lost in the emotional clutches of a disorder of sexual development as transgender is during their formulative years. Many will suffer from depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, and other mental health issues that get swept under the carpet in the name of gender identity. Instituting alternate lifestyles as the norm won't help our children, nor will making restroom accommodations. How about considering adding a mental health counselor to every school to guide these children to a, ha to a healthy place during this time? In closing, let me tell you a story about a young lady named Corey Ten Boone. The word sex had stuck her in her mind. She was pretty sure she knew what it was that it had to do with boys and girls, but she wasn't sure. So sitting next to her father on the train, she decided, I'm going to ask father, what is sex? She turned to him and said, Father, what is sex? He turned to her and looked at her as he always did when answering a question, but to her surprise, he said nothing. In a few minutes, he stood up, lifted the suitcase from the rack overhead, and set it on the floor. Will you carry this off the train, Corey? As the train stopped, she stood up and tugged at it. It was crammed full of watches and spare parts. It's too heavy, she said. Yes, and it would be a pretty poor father who would ask for his little girl to carry such a load. It's the same, Corey, with knowledge. Some knowledge is too heavy for children. When you're older and stronger, you can bear it. For now, you must trust me to carry it for you. We're asking our children to carry loads that are way too heavy for them. 30 they seconds. They should not be forced as children to see and feel the world through the lens of adults. Innocence is worth protecting and worth fighting for. We need to do our part as parents, educators, caregivers to carry certain things for them until they're old enough to bear the load. We must make sure they are receiving an education, not an indoctrination. Parents, continue to fight for the protection and safety of your children. Their innocence is precious. Keep it intact as long as you can. So tonight, Virginia Beach School Board, will you stand up for our children? And that is time. Should you dis Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Bond, then Kyle the Flame, then Tara Chang. Welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Vice Chair, great to be with you again. We need you to make these decisions because you're elected. Now, you've heard that, and I'm going to repeat it because we've entrusted you with the power to make decisions in, on policy. Here, this it appears that we're, you all are suggesting you're just going to defer to the staff, but we already know that they want to inject parents in, or the, the staff into the parent-child relationship because, well, that's exactly what I talked about the last time I was here. So I'd ask you not to do that not to allow that to happen, I'd ask you to make you to make the decision in favor of parental involvement. And the reason why I ask you to do that, and I'm relying on a woman that's just hugely smart, Abigail Schreier. She says there are three classes of trans kids. The first, one in 10,000. So in our, all our population over our 80 something schools, there are six to seven. And they deserve all the protection that we should give everybody. And they shouldn't be singled out for more or given any less. Gender ideologists don't represent them. The second class is a contagion. It's like anorexia. The first class is mostly boys. The second is mostly girls. Now, how do we know that it's a contagion? Well, why aren't we seeing 50-year-olds and 40-year-olds coming out going, hey, I can be the opposite sex now because it's safe in society. We're not seeing that. So accommodating a child's decision to be the opposite sex, and because we're dealing with kids that are school age, you've got to deal with puberty blockers. And if you do that, then you couple it with Testosterone, because most of these girls are, they're girls, so they're, they get the testosterone. You're causing harm because that <laughs> makes them sterile. And if the staff wants to inject teachers into the parent-child relationship, then all I can see is that the parent, that staff will, will do what the child wants instead of what the parents want. And so do you want to bear that on your conscience that, oh, this, 
kid is sterile now, or this person is sterile now because we accommodated their decision at a young age. I suggest that's bad. And what's amazing is that the suicide rate, and I appreciate that everybody's concerned about that, I've heard it mentioned, is about the same. Intervention, no intervention. We heard that LGBTQ kids are worried about things and are anxious about suicide. Okay, that doesn't say that, well, they've changed. It doesn't, there's no evidence of that. So we need parents to protect them. And we need you to protect that relationship, not allow the staff. In class three, I said there were three, and that's just the activists that want to destroy the relationship in the families. 30 seconds. And want to destroy women's spaces, locker rooms, sports, because, well, CRT wants to divide by race. And there's a relationship here between CRT and, and the gender ideologists. We want to break up families. So support families by you making the decision in favor of parents, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kyle Flame, then Tara Chang, then Sandra Ann Frazier. Welcome. Um, sorry. Hello, my name is Kyla Flom. Sorry. Take your time. And we do need you to speak up just a little bit more, okay? I know you're okay. trying. Okay. I'm mostly going to be talking about why it's important not to out students to their parents without their consent because a lot of students go home and their parents could be mo emotionally or psychologically negative towards them regardless of if they are transgender and me, myself, I am lucky enough to have very supportive family, but I have friends who will go home afraid of their parents, and parents are supposed to be unconditionally loving. They're supposed to be there for them no matter what. And even it, without the fear of going home and being afraid, being accepted in school is also very important because... As a transgender student, there's dysphoria, there's mental health issues. And there's a lot of issues with, with like using the restroom. If I were to go in the restroom that correlates to my gender, assigned gender at birth, I would be looked at as, oh my gosh, that person's a creep because I present as the gender that I am rather than the gender that I was born as. And even myself, as a transgender male, I feel like a creep going into the women's restroom because I'm not a woman. You have another 90 minutes, so think about what else you want to say. Seconds are over. Oh, I read that. Sorry, I'm very okay. nervous right now. Um, I think that not only being supported in school and asking students what if it's okay to talk to their parents about their preferred name and pronouns because...
sorry. 30 seconds. And that is time. Our next speaker is Tara Chang, then Sandra Ann Frazier, then Melissa Harum. Good evening. Welcome. And uh, before I start, my pronouns are deep listening. Uh, let me list off a few names before I get to my point of bylaw 130. Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Darren T. Hoover. Marine Corps Sergeant jo Joanna Rosario Picardo, Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole Gee, Marine Corps Corporal Hunter Lopez, Marine Corps Corporal Deegan W. Page, Marine Corps Corporal Humberto A. Sanchez, Marine Corps Lance Corporal David L. Espinosa, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Jared M. Smith, Marine Corps Land Corporal Riley J. McCallum, who, let me just tell you, he just had a baby girl, Marine Corps Land Corporal Dylan Morola, Marine Corps Land Corporal Kareem Nakui, Navy Hospitalman Maxton W. Soviak, Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Noss. His last message to his mother was, I love you. If you I'm sure you guys don't recognize the, those 13 service members' names. Those were the service members who died in Kabul. Uh, all of those heroic service members have in common is they fought and died for the rights that you are stripping away from the Virginia Beach parents and citizens. You dishonor their deaths by trying to change bylaw 130. Have a good night. Our next speaker is Sandra Ann Frazier, Melissa Harum, and then Eric Fritz. Welcome. Thank you for letting me speak. Dr. Spence, superintendent, members of the school board, Okay, I'm here to remind you of who you all work for. You don't work for Planned Parenthood. You don't work for the LGBTQ whatever XYZ. You work for the citizens of Virginia Beach. You work for the parents of the kids who attend our schools and expect an education, not an indoctrination. We are falling behind. We need to be teaching math, science, English, real American history. That's your responsibility. And trying to change the bylaws. Oh, man. Somebody let me get back on track. I'm losing my mind. Okay. We just had, as you heard the name spoken before, 13 members of our military who died in Afghanistan after they were abandoned by the man in the White House, okay? If you are offended by their names, if you are offended by that American flag, you're telling people we can't bring an American flag in here because it's a weapon, I suggest you move to Afghanistan, okay? Just go. You don't have the right to prevent anybody from speaking at the school board meetings because you work for us. We don't work for you. You work for us. Why are you decreasing the amount of time that people get to speak from four minutes to three? You got to go home and watch your favorite TV show? What is it? No, everybody gets to speak, all right? No rallies? You know what? That is our land. That is our parking spot. 
doesn't belong to you except as a part of the taxpayers of Virginia Beach. We pay taxes. There has never been any destruction of property out there. So it is not up to you to tell us that we can't stand out there and communicate and hold a rally and raise the flag and say the pledge and say a prayer. That's not your right. Again, voting on an agenda without taking public comments is an abomination. And you can't do it. I'm telling you, you cannot do it. It's not allowed. Don't try to change the bylaws so that you get to do things that you want to do your way without having the American Virginia Beach people present and able. Because I'm going to start talking to all of my neighbors with and without kids so that they know exactly what's going on in here. And I will keep spreading the message. And you know what? I am 71 years old. I worked 35 years for the Department of Defense. I just had a son retire from the Army after almost 23 years. I'm a military kid. My dad was in the Navy. He would be, he is probably rolling over in his grave right now, actually. He would be unbelievably, like, he can't believe this is happening. 30 seconds. And you know what, I'm done, because I, I'm just telling you, watch how you vote. If you pass this transgender crap onto him or anything else, onto, and make him make the decisions, you're all going to be voted out. I'm telling you, I'm going to vote and work against every single one of you that vote to change this country. Our next speaker is Melissa Harum, then Eric Fretz, then Joshua Mastin. Welcome. Good evening. Um, my name is Melissa Harum. I'm the mother of seven children, uh, and most of my professional life has also been centered on children, education, special needs advocacy, and parenting. And I firmly believe that we have a responsibility to the children placed in our care. We already have policies in place to protect children from bullying, harassment, and we should. It is reasonable that no parent would want their child to be bullied or harassed for any reason. It would also be wrong to put policies into place that would lead to harmful practices and loss of privacy and security that I believe these policies would add. However, uh, the transgender policy that's moving forward is moving beyond the shared beliefs of anti-bullying it's in one of religion. By definition, religion is a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of persons. It is not the school's job to teach nor force the religion or beliefs of a very small percentage of our population on the rest. As elected officials, you are bound to uphold the Constitution. The only choice is to say no to what is outlined in this bill. Saying yes would be a gross infringement on the religious liberties of countless students and teachers. It would be unconstitutional to force teachers and students to abandon their convictions regarding gender. Further, this would be a gross infringement on parental rights. As public servants bound by the Constitution, you are not the authors of our rights. As stated in the Declaration of Independence, our right come from God and are unalienable. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such a form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. It goes to say that we should have reasonable grace before we act. But then it states, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, which I feel has been done, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. We're awake and we're watching. We don't consent to this, and you all have been put on notice. I would further like to address the parents listening. Have you been watching and aware of the indoctrination of our children for years? I propose to you that this school and every school in our nation has not failed in its endeavor to persuade young minds to accept this as the new normal. We are here to oppose this belief being pushed in our schools and on our children. 
This will cause way more harm than the good intentions it proposes. Even Adolf Hitler knew and expressed how wildly successful a group could be if they just taught their ideology to the children when he said in 1933, if the older generation cannot get accustomed to us, we shall take their children away from them and rear them as needful to the fatherland. 30 seconds. Thankfully, we are not parents who have completely given up our children to the state. We have much fight left in us. We need to get involved. We need to throw off the old guard and become the new gatekeepers. Parents and not bureaucrats need to be the ones who decide what and how our children are educated. However, until we have school boards, schools, principals, and teachers who will actually do the work of public servants, every child should be removed. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eric Fretz, then Joshua Mastin, then William Duke. Welcome. Thank you. Um, as I waited outside in the hallway, I couldn't help but notice the bathrooms that were right beside me. One said ladies and one said gentlemen. And I just think that we've come so far from the point where we're ladies and gentlemen anymore where we can just discuss things with common sense. Um, but I can only imagine what one of you ladies would feel like if I walked into the bathroom and you were using it. Um, I, I imagine that would not be a comfortable situation. And just think about the heart, the mind, and the soul of a young person. Well, my name's Eric Fress. I'm a Virginia Beach resident. I'm married with two young children. Um, they're not currently in the public school system, but they would soon be and will inevitably be impacted by the decisions you are making and the one you will make tonight regarding this gender identity policy. My wife went through the Virginia Beach schools and we have always thought highly of them, but ultimately we're deciding now whether or not our children will attend public school and probably many others are doing the same. The decisions you're making now will reverberate through generations of young people who are trusting you to guide them and lead them well. You're accountable for that. You're accountable to those children without fully developed prefrontal cortexes, not allowing them to think fully through their long-term ramifications of any decisions. And in some cases, they're making permanent decisions for temporary problems. You're accountable to their parents who are praying and hoping that you exercise wisdom and discernment in regards to their precious children. You're accountable to our nation and who our community and ultimately America will become based on how we raise our children. And you're accountable ultimately to God who created us. And we will all stand before and give an account for our lives and decisions that we've made, especially those of us in leadership positions. And I get the tension of the state and the federal government pushing this on you and making it seem almost like your hands are tied because of the assumed liability. If you choose not to adopt it, you are in a complex situation trying to balance all of the interests. I'm not envious of you. It's a, it's a tough spot. But what about the protection of all those who are potentially negatively impacted by this who aren't LGBT? What about their rights? Play the movie forward. If we capitulate to this, where does it end? Should we be totally upending the lives of every student for the fleeting feelings of a few? This simply isn't about the, the person who is seriously gender dysphoric. I, want, I love them. I want them to have rights. I don't want them to be persecuted. But what about the door that this opens to all of those who would maybe venture into the bathrooms and the locker rooms and take advantage of this policy? It's disheartening to think that you would elevate one group of students above the safety of the rest. The fact that any student can walk into any bathroom or locker room and a teacher can't say anything to them is a travesty. You have to protect our children. I've worked with middle school and high school students for the past five years, and I've experienced what, make their, what makes their souls light up. And see, in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, man and woman, two genders. It's clear. Their gender wasn't assigned at birth like sex education is trying to teach them nowadays. It was given to them by the one who created them before they were ever born. God assigned a specific gender to our children for a very special purpose seconds. in this life. It was his decision, not a doctor's, and it's not theirs. Let's speak purpose into our young children and give them something to live for. Maybe then we would see the suicide rate go down. Something bigger than themselves, something that never changes. God's truth about their real identities, that they were made by him and in his image. They don't need to change that. 
God created them exactly how he wanted them for reasons beyond their comprehension. This is what our children need to hear and know, the truth, and the real time. science. Our next speaker is Joshua Mastin, then William Duke, then Tim Kester. Okay, our next speaker is William Duke. Welcome. Thank you, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Duke. I'm the vice chairman of the Tidewater Libertarian Party, so you know. Uh, but I'm speaking on my own behalf. Um, for decades now, we've bemoaned the fact that parents don't get involved with the school board meetings, that they don't show up to vote, or when they do show up to vote, they'll vote for the top of the ticket and ignore the school board or pick a number out of the hat. They'll, uh, uh, I know this because I've worked the, uh, the polling lines and seen people who come in totally uninformed about the lower part of the ticket. And uh, I think in LA, they have like hundreds of thousands of students and they have school board meetings that are attended regularly by about 40 people. That's my understanding. So uh, that's just, that, that neglect of our schools by the citizenry um, is turning around a little bit. Um, I don't think I need to tell you this, but uh, you, could have, you could have somebody in every seat here and people standing in the hall waiting to get in. And you know where those people are waiting? They're waiting in the parking lot, right? They're, they show up early. They, uh, they cons uh, console one another, and they're angry. You know they're angry, right? So I guess it takes a sense of betrayal to get people involved in school board. And until today, I haven't shared any feeling of betrayal. I, I, I've seen you making difficult decisions. They're not easy decisions, and uh, I don't fault you for most of the things that I've seen happening around here. But I will say that, um, that today, for the first time, I share a sense of betrayal with the angry people in the parking lot. I feel betrayed because, not because of transgender or anything like that, it's because you're trying to limit our rights. All right, here, Constitution of the United States, the First Amendment, one of the most important paragraphs in the whole Constitution, in, a, in the whole of our country's history, it says that Congress, and by extension, lower levels of law, can make no law abridging uh, the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government, that's you guys, for a redress of grievances. So tonight or tomorrow, next time you meet, whenever you're going to vote about restricting the right of the people to peaceably assemble, which is what we've been doing out in that parking lot. No one has been hurt, no one's been threatened. We've been very careful to get out of people's way, all right? There's no restriction going on to the movement of faculty and staff out of the building, nothing like that, all right? We're peaceable people, and uh, we have grievances. Uh, a lot of these grievances I don't particularly share. But these are the people who've come to the meeting. They say, you know, uh, government is made by the people who show up. Well, they're showing up. And you know they're not showing up because they support the majority of this school board. I'm sorry to say they're showing up because they're angry with the majority of the school board. 30 seconds. OK. And uh, let's see. That's the main thrust of what I wanted to say, and I probably have a few other things that I'd add. But uh, I would, I would uh, uh, definitely uh, encourage you to reconsider, as the majority in here, reconsider restricting illegally, unconstitutionally, the, uh, the rights of and that is time. our citizens. Thank you. Good night. Our next speaker is Tim Kessner then Amy Morris, then Kathleen Brown. Welcome. Good evening. I return to oppose the changes to policy 5-7. This policy must be rejected with prejudice. 
Consider that bulimia is not much different than gender dysphoria. Both cause intense feeling of anguish when you look in the mirror, and both deeply affect young students. Imagine if a student came to a teacher and said, I ate too much for lunch. Can you guard the bathroom while I throw up? Also imagine that the teacher was required to tell the student, you'll feel so much better when you lose weight. I'll make sure no one's in, make sure no one's in the bathroom, and it'll be our little secret. This is how the DOE proposes we treat students wrestling with gender dysphoria. It's shocking how easily we accept this. Members of the board, refuse the demands of the DOE, and we will stand with you. But if this does not persuade you, at the very least, the language of the policy must address the issue of parental rights. Will schools notify the parents before implementing a gender support plan? The phrase I heard repeated over and over in the meeting was that things would be worked out on a case-by-case -case basis. This is unacceptable. What recourse will parents have if they disagree with how you're treating your child? They can't claim you violated policy because the policy is we make it up as we go along. The writing of the policy must make this clear. The school must obtain consent from the parent in writing for any student under the age of 18. And furthermore, when the school works with the parent, gender affirming therapy must not be presented as the only option or even the first. The parent must also be presented with the choice to wait and see if the behavior desists, as in many cases it does. Now, I watched all seven hours of the recent school board meetings. YouTube double play is helps you get through it. Some comments. Chairwoman Rye, you seem very eager to write letters on behalf of the school board. Is it really about decorum and order or respect and control? When you declare this is a past issue and not for discussion, it certainly seems like the latter. Ms. Weems, I think you stepped out. I commend your stance that the school's board's job is to hear every speaker that signs up, even if they're abrasive. Your ego is not so easily bruised. You see past their anger, and hear their passion. This is exemplary behavior for a school board member, and Chairwoman Rye should be taking notes. I trust that she hears me, though I can't say the same of Ms. Holtz. A poke for your pincushion. It took you five minutes to explain. I only need three. Ms. Anderson, you raise an excellent question about whether the board will approve the policy the superintendent is now writing. See to it that it's open for public comment and put to a vote. You also have a fair point. Speakers should not use public comment for political or financial gain. I expect then you'll be similarly upset with the superintendent for writing letters to influence city politics. It would be interesting to see if he has any ties with the hotel and restaurant community. Ms. Hughes and Ms. Manning, you two are sharp as nails. It seems that there are several cases Ms. Lanetti has overlooked. If the school board is averse to getting sued, perhaps they should more closely look at the cases you presented. Finally, to Ms. Holtz. You are indignant that a speaker was insensitive to the suffering of transgender students. One of the speakers previously gave testimony of her own assault in a bathroom. But you said that's a myth and things like that never happen. You spoke of an angry mob of people. But if you listen, the previous speaker, two behind me, was talking about how deeply he cared about transgender people and finding meaning in something more 30 seconds. Thank you. Finding something meaning in something more significant than a gender pronoun and accepting their bodies the way that they were created by a God that deeply loves them. This is not hateful. This is deeply concerning for the, um, out of deep concern and care for these people who are suffering from this. We cannot say your insecurities are right. You were born in the wrong body. Now go into the bathroom. It will be our little secret. Members of the school board reject this policy. Leave them kids alone. And that is time. Our next speaker is Amy Morris, then Kathleen Brown. Speaker number 22 asked to be moved to Zoom, so then it will be Allison Bell. Welcome. Thank you. This policy is fraudulent and intends harms to all involved, and it's knowingly written for that reason. It's reckless endangerment to expose minors to this phony scheme. Child sex habit and fetish advocates do not belong in K through 12. I'll remind you again, cases on the books prove it's evident children are being victimized and told they have the wrong genitals by lying predators. My family is proof of that. There's thousands and thousands of cases on the book, Biden's being sued. Um, forcing minors to participate in this socially constructed perverted cult is knowingly blatant evil. 
who is telling children it is not safe to use the accurate facilities and pronouns according to their birth sex? Who's doing that? How is it harmful for a boy to use the male's room? The only people labeling minors as trans are Dems, Democrats. They, can prove, they can't prove any validity um, to branding kids with sex habit and fetish for profit. They can't explain the sudden confusion which they fueled and paid for. Who exactly claims some kids require acknowledgement as the opposite sex, inaccurate pronouns, also known as misgendering, and somehow, oddly, the so-called diagnosis or branding requires that they have access to the opposite sex bath and locker rooms. That's what they need. That's what they, that's, that's what we're calling that care for children that are confused and suicidal, lying to them, making everybody else play along. No child is born with the wrong genitals. It doesn't exist. In fact, according to those who experience things like this, uh, I'll reference Kira Bell, Jeffrey Johnston, and Walt Heyer, as well as myself. Telling the truth saves lives. It is our duty to be honest. I've witnessed this evil up front and close. I recorded it, and I intend to share that reality. They say men are women. Suddenly, boys are girls, and those are, those are boys. Aggressors are the victims. Protection is violence. After coining the word trans, mandating widespread enabling of psychological disorders is sociopathy. And that's evident when little girls are being ignored, parents raising red flags dismissed of value by Democrat-ran school boards on a mission to pimp minors to cult with no good intentions for anyone involved. Telling a boy he is trans doesn't make him a girl. It makes you complicit with predators and child abuse. There are infinite ways to be a girl, none of which tip you over into being a male. Girls' privacy matters. Is, sex, is child sex advocacy, genital mutilation, forced participation, stripping female rights to safety and sex-based protections, stripping parental rights, banning accurate language for male and female, disqualifying boys from manhood, drugging them and then chopping off genitals, now what we are calling LGBT rights. That's what the Virginia Democrats are funding. A state that makes it illegal to protect your child's privacy, speech, well-being is corrupt. And VDOE better get their mess cleaned up. These are our children. To all the young girls with body image issues who are being led off to the slaughter by money-hungry butchers who exploit your pain to line their pockets, we see you. We grieve your deception. To all the little boys seconds. being told their outfit choice and personality determines whether they qualify for manhood to keep their penis, we see you. On behalf of parents of kids who think they are trans, I'm here to share this quote. Parents like us must remain anonymous to maintain our child's privacy. And because we face legal repercussions if our names are revealed, parents who do not support their child's gender identity crisis being fueled in K through 12 are being reported to and CPS and losing custody. This is ridiculous. Our next speaker is Kathleen Brown, then Allison Bell, then Richard Pickens. Welcome. Good evening. I want to start by saying that I've never felt welcome to a school board meeting by the board majority. So for my first topic, I want to discuss the numerous bylaw changes proposed. I listened to the September 1st special meeting in its entirety, and I'm sad to say that most of what came into the Policy Review Committee and out of the Policy Review Committee was not discussed in the meeting. Who directed the school board attorney to drop these policies if it was not discussed? Was it Aaron Spence? You all must think we're too stupid to notice what you're doing, but we're not. My main takeaway from the special meeting was that the board majority wants to give themselves pats on the backs for being engaging and welcoming, and that is why you think there's more than 10 people here, even if they are in opposition. Ms. Felton, that is a very factually incorrect statement. The opposition isn't here because we feel welcome. We are here because we are very dissatisfied with the job the board majority is doing. We aren't welcome here. We know it, and these proposed bylaw changes prove it. The proposed changes do not meet the intent discussed at the meeting. 
Rather, they include banning flags, not protesting outside, reduced speaker time, being able to suspend speakers at any time, the ability to suspend Robert's rules, and the ability to make on-the-spot bylaw changes on a whim. Oh my gosh, that was so much for me to say. I can't believe it. Um, you all should really be embarrassed. I do not believe that banning flags will reduce how long you need to sit here. Yesterday, in an emergency meeting was held that because the board did not do their work correctly the first time. At this meeting, while discussing bylaw changes, Beverly Anderson said she has seen where flags have been used as weapons before. When asked further, you said, no, not here. I saw it on TV. That's pretty preposterous. This is our American flag. This is not a weapon, and it should be per permitted in our meetings. We are in America. We do have some solutions for the timing problem that I can suggest. First, you could combine agenda and non-agenda items. This will reduce the constant interruptions from the chair, Ms. Rye, while, board, while citizens discuss the work of the board. Secondly, I would suggest the board do their work accurately the first time to reduce the amount of special meetings or emergency meetings. I do also think you could be making better use of the time in the informal meetings as well. Lastly, if you feel overwhelmed by how long the public addresses you, you are welcome to step down from your position. You are clearly in a different place in life than before you ran, and that's fine. We will happily accept your resignation and replace you with someone that wants to listen to the public. The people rallying outside in protest are not unsafe. If that were actually true, the same individuals would not be continually showing up into these meetings because nobody in their right mind shows up in a place where they feel like they're threatened. It just doesn't happen. Nobody walks into that. For my next topic, I would like to move to the anti-discrimination policy. I strongly believe Dottie Holtz is oversimplifying this policy entails by stating, and I quote, let them pee in peace. On August 24th, the school board attorney already stated the kids may use whichever restroom they identify as the board already passed policies to allow disallowed discrimination of the transgender community in 2016. The only difference between this policy and what is already in place is the stripping of parental seconds. authority. My child can easily change his name or preferred pronoun with this policy without any medical documentation or my knowledge, then go through the various hoops that you all have required to get a mask exemption. He can decide that morning, but you want to know by 9 a.m. On a final note, I want to reiterate that the board has given Aaron Spence too much power and control. He works for you. You have $130 million worth of reasons and to fire time. Aaron Spence. Thank you. Have a good one. Our next speaker is Allison Bell, then Richard Pickens. Uh, speaker 25 has not checked in, and then it will be Robert Dean. Welcome. Thank you. My name's, <clears throat> excuse me. My name's Allison Bell. I'm a mother of four. I'm speaking against the transgender policy. I support accommodating our students who truly suffer from genuine gender dysphoria. We're here for everyone. But with all due respect, this policy is lazy for three reasons. It promotes unchecked authority and autonomy for minors. It encourages our teachers to lie to parents and lying by omission is still lying. It disregards the well-being and security of the other 99.75% of Virginia Beach students. Biology is an objective fact, despite one's experience. It is on this objective fact that the rules of bathroom and locker room, locker room use are based. These facts have not changed. If we can request a doctor's note for absences, the same should be a bare minimum requirement to change the entire policy on bathroom and locker room use, rules that have been in place unchanged as long as bathrooms have existed. As this policy stands, however, it allows any minor at any time to decide which facility he or she cares to use, and teachers cannot even inquire about their status, quote, upon entry to the restroom, end quote. This is not a gray area for interpretation. When did the general population of minors get so much autonomy and authority? When? 
this policy is a free for all for students to take advantage, transgender or not, all students, without any authoritative interference. How many sexual assaults, or heaven forbid, rapes, are going to take place on school campuses before we realize how truly lazy this policymaking is? The current estimate is that 0.25% of Virginia Beach students identify as transgender. What about the other 99.75% of our students? What about them? The clear majority. This policy disregards the safety and security of the clear majority without consequence. Again, let me reiterate. I can support accommodation for children who genuinely suffer. But it should not be done without parent or guardian involvement. Without, it should be done with parent and guardian involvement with a medical note in advance, not on a whim. The current policy completely usurps parental authority by encouraging teachers to lie to parents under the guise of safety. If safety is a problem, let's utilize our counselors, our student resource officers. Let's use them for mediation. Let's involve them for safety. But do not use safety as a disguise for the overstepping of authority that this policy permits and dare say requires of our teachers and staff. Parents are always the first seconds. to be notified in the event of a health or safety issues. But under this policy, there is no regulation requiring school staff to inform parents of their ch own child's health status. Faculty and staff are not the parents to the student body. You do not know our children better than we do. And all of this, unchecked student authority, lying to parents, disregard for the 99.75% of the general population for what data shows to be a fashionable trend and that is time thank you for listening our next speaker is richard pickens then robert dean then carlos rodriguez welcome welcome my name is pastor rich pickens and the decisions made here impact over seventy thousand students and teachers and parents and volunteers from what I've read. And I read through this entire model policies for the treatment of transgender students in Virginia's public schools. And it was amazing that if you're basing your decision on this, I went to Appendix A, there's not one negative voice. There's no condescending or different voice. It's all positive. I went to every website, LBGDQ, transgender this, yes, yes, positive, positive. And if you're going to make a decision, you need to have both sides of the argument. And I didn't find any dissenting voice in that at all. You would think that based on this, that no one had a contrary point of view or opinion, but there are multiple voices op opposing uh, this process now being considered. I want to read from the congressional record. It says policymakers, which would be you, are doing no favors either to the public or the transgendered. By I'm sorry, sir. Can you just lift your mask up, please? It slips as I talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, they're doing no favors either to the public or the transgendered by treating their confusions as a right in need of defending rather than as a mental disorder that deserves understanding, treatment, and prevention. So that's an opposing view. It's a different uh, uh, viewpoint on that. Uh, Megan Kelly, who you probably know of is on television, said, at our boys' school in particular, when our son was in the third grade, they unleashed a three-week experimental trans education program on these eight and nine year old boys. And it wasn't about support. We felt it was more like they were trying to convince them, come on over. And the boys started to get confusion. We objected and so did a lot of other parents to the point where the school had to apologize, which they very rarely did. And she pulled her children out. So we see something different than just trying to be kind or caring towards people, which I think everyone is in agreement. We don't want anyone bullied, we don't want to be hurt. We want kindness, but we don't want this agenda pushed. When I read through this document, I see there's going to be forced upon teachers and students and volunteers and all kinds of people that if somebody wants to be called a man that's a woman, you're going to be forced to use that or you're going to be said that you're bullying or there's three different words that are used that are very detrimental to the person, I think, very awkward. And... Uh, 
So I was just thinking in terms of anorexia. I've met people in my life who are anorexic. I'm a pastor. I've ministered to them. I've tried to help them. I would be, feel it would be very wrong if someone said, you've got to call that person fat because they feel that they're fat. And uh, when they're actually very physically thin and going to be in danger. But perception can be what someone's mind thinks. They believe that they are. So I understand that. But to, make, to try to force me to be in agreement with someone else's perception is itself a bullying tactic, is itself oppressive to my rights and my freedom of speech. I read through this uh, statement right here. It says, parents are going to be uh, taking away their First Amendment rights. Teachers are going to have their First Amendment rights taken away. The First Amendment says clearly, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. Well, if Congress can't do it, then certainly this board should not be even touching this to say to, to, say to parents and different ones, you have to call a he a she and a she a he. And then the worst of all that every English teacher should be opposed to is calling to someone they crazy stuff that you guys are proposing. So there's penalties on teachers, students, employees, up to termination. I think that's bullying, discrimination, harassment. And Gavin Grimm, who was the first person up here to speak, she is a lovely young woman, but she is a woman, even though she claims to be a man. And I would not, I would encourage her to embrace her femininity. And, that and I'm is sorry time. if she's been hurt by anyone, and I would not want her hurt, and we would want to show kindness to all people, and we will continue to do And that is so. time. Our next speaker Thank is... Thank you. Vote no on this. It's craziness. That is time. Our next speaker is Robert Dean. Vote no Then on Carlos that. Rodriguez. And then Lizzie Bohan. Welcome. Thank you. I haven't started yet, ma'am. Could you reset the clock, please? <clears throat> Having been closely associated with this body over the last four decades, I have seen many actions over the years that made me feel uncomfortable, yet, but yet tolerable. But now there is little tolerance left in me when I have to endure escapades that are on the edge of unraveling the very fabric of morality, and as a libertarian, we are wont to live by the premise, live and let live. This extreme liberal body whose umbilical cord runs all the way through the Richmond Education Freak Show to the non-constitutional department of on education in the destructive Biden administration is changing the face of America and for that for which it stands, <clears throat> including sexual preferences. If a human being is born with a penis, science calls it a boy or male. If born with a vagina, a girl or female. This is science. In the human species, a male cannot reproduce and a female cannot produce sperm. That is irrefutable science. Let me take you and your staff to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot at Paris Island. You arrive and the first thing you encounter a group of badass drill instructors who take you to the barber shop and have your head shaved. Then you are issued utility uniforms and introduced to the showers and to the head where the discharge of human waste takes place. And when I went through, there were no stalls, period, just rows of toilets. And no one asked if you were a male or female, transgender, cisgender, or any of the contemporary terms that have been created to protect someone's feelings. Personally, I don't care about your feelings. If you have a penis, be a man. If you have a vagina, be a woman. That does not preclude you from having feelings for someone of the same sex. Just don't try to force feed me into watching your traits that may be an aberration to what I personally think is normal. Those on this school board who feel they need to direct the superintendent to develop a policy that protects and coddles self-identified transgenders, you are putting the superintendent in a very awkward position. Unless he has had intimate relationships with a transgender, he's pulling a policy out of a place that's unmentionable here. I'm also looking for the captured statistics of these so-called trans who claim to have been attacked by other students. Had there been over 100 attacks in the last school year? 500? Come on, you must have actual criminal records with dates and places, or do you? Again, contrived hysteria. Personally, like the great Bard state, stated, I believe it's much ado about nothing. I say, let's get back to teaching the facts in the classroom that will prepare our children for the workforce and throw the rest of this snowflake garbage 
of the dung heap with other radical Marxist nonsense. The chair needs to entertain a substitute motion that opposes this state requirement, thereby refusing to destroy all sense of morality and decency that historically our city and its residents are known for. This body already has a student code of conduct, so there's no reason to codify this outrageous state mandate. Remember, the right to do something does not make doing it right. As a former member of the Virginia Beach City Council, I can honestly say there's a 180 degree difference between this body and council. The council embraces open dialogue between, 30 seconds. Its, between its members and employer, the citizens. Time, of course, is provided to address the issues. And if there are 15 or 20 items or more, we, the people, have the right to address each and every item and give our opinions to that body. Each item gets three minutes. And on planning items, you get represent an organization. You get 10 minutes. The opposite is true with the eight of 11 members sitting here this evening who believe the people are subordinate to the crown and her minions sitting on the dais. Thank you. Have a nice night. And that is time. Our next speaker is Carlos Rodriguez, then Lizzie Bohan, then Robert Kirk. Welcome. My name is Carlos Rodriguez. I'm the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And I first of all want to thank you for your service. It's very difficult work that you all have to do, and I'm sure you're not in it for the money. Uh, you're in it because you care about people, and so uh, it means a lot to be able to speak to you today. As I said, I'm a pastor of Redeemer, and I'm opposed to the stated policy 5.7, 5-7. I want to address you both as a pastor and as a parent. Firstly, as a pastor in this policy, you are requiring teachers and administrators to call students by their preferred pronouns, even if those pronouns are factually wrong. Furthermore, they will be disciplined if they refuse to do so, possibly leading to the termination of their employment. Some of these teachers are Christians, people who are followers of Jesus Christ. As such, they follow the precepts set forth in the Bible. One of the greatest rights enshrined in our Constitution is the freedom of the exercise of religion. It's so important, it's in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. The Bible is very clear on this issue. God created only two genders and assigned them to individuals at conception. Genesis 1.27 said, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. This is backed up by science. There are over 30 trillion cells in the human body, and each one of them always carries the masculine or feminine marker that determines their gender. This policy will demand that these Christian teachers violate their conscience by forcing them to refer to someone in a way that is anti-biblical and anti-science or lose their jobs. I do not think this board has the power to suspend the First Amendment rights of its citizens. Furthermore, in the school system, as you well know, we are supposed to teach science, not invent it. Second, I want to address you as a parent. I have a daughter in the school system who goes to Cox. She is intellectually disabled. We got her from a Nicaraguan orphanage when she was five. Nicaragua is not a very safe place for children. In Nicaragua, our daughter was destined for a life on the streets where she would be sexually abused because of her inability to protect herself. I'm alarmed at the policy put forth today which states that a male has the power to declare himself a female without any substantiating evidence and upon doing so must be granted carte blanche access to female restrooms and locker rooms without question. You may choose to believe that not one of the 65,000 students in our school system are going to take advantage of this gigantic loophole to sexually abuse a student, but you are kidding yourself. There is still real evil in the world. If you don't believe this, just turn on the television tonight. These are real lives and your actions have real consequences. I want my daughter to be able to go to a school where I don't have to fear for her safety when she goes to the bathroom or changes in the locker room. She cannot protect herself. I am counting on you to enact policies which protect the weakest of our students. My daughter's well-being depends on it. For this reason, I urge you to vote down policy 5-7 and go back to the drawing board. This issue affects just a fraction of a percent of the student population. As such, you must use a scalpel to enact a fair and just policy. 
Policy 5-7 is not a scalpel. 30 seconds. It is a chainsaw that, like Pandora's box, will open up a host of unintended consequences that will do more harm to our children than good. Thank you so much for your time and your service. Our next speaker is Lindsay Bohan, then Robert Kirk, then Jim Fox. Welcome. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm here to speak generally about the policies you'll be discussing and voting on tonight. Yesterday, I spent the afternoon listening to the Policy Review Committee meeting. I am concerned that some of you on the school board have lost sight of what it's like to be a parent with children in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Please allow me to speak without interruption as I walk you through a scenario that may help you see the impossible position you have put the parents in. These same parents who are taxpayers that you were elected to represent. <clears throat> so I invite you to imagine being a parent with children in the system. Perhaps you are a former public ed school educator yourself. Imagine reading uh, the weekly email from your child's principal that is now policy that parents are no longer allowed in the school building. No more volunteering, no more class parties, school events, lunch with your child, nothing. The only time you're allowed in the school is by appointment only and only with administration if they are able to fit you into their schedule. Imagine realizing the significance the school board's um, immediate impact of your, has on your children's lives. I'm sorry. This is really hard. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, they, the, okay, one third, of, one third of their day practically. Imagine deciding to get involved. You read the meeting minutes, you sign up to speak, you show up. You realize there's more parents who feel the same. You are not alone. You gather before the meeting, you join hands with strangers to pray. Uh, you recite the Pledge of Allegiance, eat refreshments, mingle, fellowship, the kids play, you make new friends. Now imagine the school board, who has already implemented policies to limit your access to your children's school, who has already mandated medical interventions for all, regardless of individual needs or health status, has now made it their mission to adopt bylaws forbidding gatherings before school board meetings, claiming those who rally together in support of one another are a threat and are harassing employees, which is not true, and who could, might, maybe use the American flag as a weapon. Then imagine the school board members who are making these allegations never once coming out to meet their constituents, never getting to know you individually, only lumping you and others like you together into one group, the enemy. You speak at one meeting, sharing a few personal stories that your children have had, that your children shared with you. You sign up for the next meeting, this time using data. Maybe data will work, maybe they'll listen. Nope, nothing matters. Imagine the school board now leveraging all their supposed authority to restrict your speech at meetings, the length of time and deeming the content of what you have to say as on topic or not. They are limiting the in-person audience with fewer than 10 people. Imagine being a parent who just wants to be heard and to be part of this process, but now you are the enemy and you know very well that they couldn't care less about you or what you and your children are going through. Imagine that. Imagine reading the bylaws and model policy only to realize that the policies essentially take parents out of the conversation completely. This is the sad reality. Those of us who are speaking up for parental rights in all things, masking or children's education and curriculum, social, emo social emotional learning, their safety in school broadly and in the locker rooms, have been called every hateful name in this room without any condemnation from the board. You must agree, or maybe you're just grateful they were able to say it because you 30 can't seconds. from the stand at least. All we are asking is for you to consider how much you're taking away from parents. Blanket policies look good on paper, but rarely work out for everyone. When you consider policies, please take all the children into consideration. If you were a parent, would you stand by and allow the school board to strip away your rights like you are doing to us right now? Our next speaker is Robert Kirk and then Jim Fox. Welcome. Members of the board, I want to thank you for your service to the community and for your concern for the well-being of students under your care. You have a difficult job and I thank you for undertaking the vital task. I also want to thank you for this opportunity to speak against the issue that's at hand. And I humbly ask and encourage you to reject the adoption of the Virginia Department of Education's model policies for the treatment of transgender students in Virginia's public schools. 
As a resident of Virginia Beach, a Christian, and a pastor, I am deeply concerned with the school board's consideration of adopting these harmful policies. I'm concerned because these policies defy logic and reason. They ignore historical precedent. They reject traditional morality upon which our society has been constructed, and they undermine parental authority. Uh, first, in the, talking about defying logic and reason, these policies are not being implemented based on compelling evidence derived from scientific and peer-reviewed studies. In fact, there is a body of evidence that suggests that fast-tracking, transitioning individuals into the process can be detrimental to their health. Uh, for example, Dr. Lisa Littman of Brown University had to republish a study that she did uh, in 2019, basically because she identified a topic called rapid onset gender dysphoria. And what she was seeing was teenagers who had never presented anything in their life saying that of gender dysphoria, all of a sudden just coming out as trans, just all of a sudden. And so she did a study and it was peer reviewed. Come to find out it was more social media, peer influence that was doing this. And she found in doing her study, talking to clinicians, talking to the parents told her that when they go to the doctor, clinicians saw they were only interested in fast tracking gender affirmation and transition and were resistant to even evaluating the child's pre-existing and current mental health status. I found these stories compelling, she said, and heartbreaking. Gender dysphoria has been studied for a long time, and I recognize that this presentation was not consistent with the existing research. I saw that kids, parents, and families were suffering, and I felt like I needed to do something to help. She continued, she said, if these descriptions of the clinicians refusing to evaluate and treat trauma and mental health issues were true, it means that a vulnerable population was being deprived of much needed medical health, mental health issues. Now I'm afraid that if you implement these policies, you're gonna see a lot of those things taking place. I also just wanna to speak to the fact that the motivation for speaking against adopting these policies is not from hate in any way. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I realize that we are all made in the very image of God. And I like to illustrate it this way. It was explained to me one time. Let's pretend that on these little pieces of paper was written everything I ever did wrong in life. Take a lot more paper. I've done a lot wrong in my life. Let's pretend that this is me. This is my sin and God is in heaven. There's a problem that mankind has. I'm separated from God because I have sinned. And there's nothing I can do to get rid of this sin on my own. But the good news, and this is what the Bible teaches, and so when Christians talk about wanting to love others, it's because the eternal Son of God left heaven and came to earth and lived a sinless and a perfect life. And then one day he died on the cross, not for his sin, but for the sin of the world, for my sin, for your sin, for the sin of the world. 30 seconds. And through simple faith in Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. Because the Bible tells us all we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's our motivation. We want to tell people the good news and the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. He rose again from the dead on the third day. That's an established fact of history, and we rejoice in that. That is the motivation. We do this out of love. Thank you so much for, for, for this time. Our next speaker is Jim Fox. Welcome. Welcome to you, too. My name's Jim Fox. I'm a small business owner in the area. And uh, this is the first time I've been here, and I pick up there's a lot of frustration in uh, people, in general, the people speaking, and it seems like uh, rightfully so. But I'm not going to place any blame unnecessarily. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, I thank you for getting my age right. I'm number 30, and uh, multiplied by two. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I like I'm last, so I like being last. Last shall be first, right? So, my name um, in Spanish, I see we got a um, Hispanic Heritage Month coming up. Uh, my name in Spanish is Diego Zorro. Don't forget it. Okay. And I'm pretty good with the sword, the word of God. I want to mention the Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That's what President John Adams said. You know... I'll speak for myself too, I'm part of this. We are not a moral and religious people. And, our con and our, therefore our constitution is having a tough time working in our nation. What we really need to do, I hate to use the word, but we need repentance personally, corporately, 
etc. But talking about scripture, Genesis 127 says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I've got a degree in biology from the College of William and Mary. However, I don't need that degree to know the difference between a biological male and a biological female. Speaking of a biological male, um, you may know this, uh, hope it doesn't offend you, but one of our leaders, not really leaders, he's bottom of the barrel, Obama's boyfriend, Michael, is a trans. And if you don't know that, you can just look it up online, see what Joan, Joan Rivers said. She was killed a few weeks after that. That's a confirmation. So the potential legislation here is not only spitting on the image of God, like Jesus was spit on while hanging on the cross, it's spitting on the f each male and female because each male and female are created in God's likeness. So I want to mention that um, something else. You know, what happens in a culture when it's at the end and dying, gasping breath is what's described in Romans number one. You know, God loves us all. However, he loves us enough not to keep us in our sin, that whether that be individually, family, otherwise. And once again, I'm not going to put ultimate condemnation on you. I'm sure there's plenty to go around for all of us. But it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God has showed it to them. People profess themselves to be wise. What we hear, have here is a lot of intolerant secularism coming down from the DOE, from here. And I just want to say the bottom line is that parents are ultimately accountable, not you. They delegate to you, but you don't, you don't, you don't recognize that really. Because if you did, you wouldn't have any of this transgender policy stuff that's it's just secular seconds. intolerance, very intolerant. And um, people, what happens, people change the truth of God into a lie, worship the cre creature more than the creator, and then people give themselves up to all kinds of sin. God gives people over. that He wants them to change, but if they don't, he just lifts his hand. So that's what I'm saying. I'm going to pull the plug from public education and let it go down the drain, because that's where it's going, unless you repent. And that is time. Madam Chair, that was our last in-person agenda speaker. We will move on to our online speakers. Yes, we will. Thank you. Just can we take turns and continue? Well, how, okay, a show of hands, how many school board members would like a 10 minute break now? All right, five it is. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Carol and Rye. We are reconvening our formal meeting at 8.18 p.m. after uh, the uh, uh, agenda in-person speakers have, have had their opportunity. So now, Madam Clerk, would you please introduce our first Zoom speaker of the evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speaker is Miriam Millen. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. I'm speaking tonight because while there seems to be many loud voices filling this room with propaganda, ignorance. Miriam, please unmute. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Mary, give us one moment, please. Okay. Okay, Miriam, please unmute. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Give us one Give us second. One second. Okay, I have to do the okay, Miriam, you may start speaking. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. 
I'm speaking tonight because while there seems to be many loud voices filling this room with propaganda, ignorance, unfounded fear and hate, it's the voices we can't hear that are the most vulnerable. It's the voices of those who have been shut down, shamed and silenced. What I wish to discuss in regard to the model policy for transgender and non-binary students is the notification of parents or guardians of a student's sexual orientation or gender identity. School officials should remember that parents of LGBTQ students may not be aware of their child's sexual orientation or gender identity, and those students may have grave concerns about their parents' response. If the response is negative, there could be the very real consequences of rejection, depression, suicidal ideation, abuse, and homelessness. 1.6 million youth are homeless each year and up to 40% of them identify as LGBTQ. LGBTQ youth are more likely to become homeless at younger ages. Some of the most vulnerable populations for trafficking in the United States include LGBTQ individuals and homeless youth. Family conflict and rejection is the most common cause of all youth homelessness, but this is even more significant for the LGBTQ community. Half of all teens get a negative reaction from their parents when they come out to them. And more than one in four are forced to leave their homes. 30% of LGBTQ youth reported physical violence at the hands of a family member after coming out. And 32% of homeless LGBTQ youth have experienced physical, emotional, or sexual abuse at home because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Rejection and discrimination at home can lead to severe personal and social problems, including self-harm and academic failure. So please never out or disclose a student's sexual or gender identity without their consent or knowledge, even to their family. The priority is to maintain safety in the moment as there may be a long-term process of acceptance. And a few additional notes. The average age of identification of sexual orientation for both males and females is around the age of 14. The age of gender identity is much younger. There is no evidence that letting transgender people use public facilities that align with their gender identity increases safety risks. Being transgender or gender non-conforming is not a religion. It is biologically and scientifically based unlike the imaginary religious tenets that somehow condemn anything that is not the socially constructed status quo. Please stop speaking for all the students or assuming that your narrow view is the majority. Please stop misquoting the Bible to validate your ignorance, fear, and hate. The misinformed, hostile, ignorant, and hateful comments that I have heard tonight could not be a better example of why we should protect the health, welfare, and privacy of our LGBTQ students please pass this incredibly important policy. Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is, is Tova, Tova Gold. Gold. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tova Gold and my pronouns are they, them, and Zizer. I'm not a woman nor a man, I'm non-binary. I'm back here again to express why it's imperative to implement the VDOE model policies for the treatment of transgender and non-binary students per section 12 of the agenda. It kills me to still see so many of you full of hate, fear, and misunderstanding. You should all be ashamed of yourselves. For those who don't know, I'm Muslim with a Jewish background and part of the LGBTQ plus community. I just finished my master's degree in Washington DC and currently work in anti-human trafficking. I also volunteer with several LGBTQ plus organizations in the DC, Maryland area. I'm also a product of VBCPS, having gone to school from pre-K until graduating from the first class of the Global Studies and World Languages Academy in 2009. I knew I was queer when I was in elementary school, but I ignored it. I had a major crush in 10th grade to a similar gender expressed person. I ignored it again. Even with my LGBTQ plus friends around me, I wasn't yet ready to accept my own identity. I didn't fully come out until 2019. I'm still learning more about myself. I had a fantastic education, but if I had had support in school with advocacy policies and inclusive language, it would have made me feel much more comfortable in embracing my identities early on and would have saved me from a great deal of stress and depression. One major reason to implement this policy is the high rate of suicide among trans youth. 
According to the Trevor Project's National Survey of LGBTQ plus youth 2021, 52% of trans and non-binary youth considered suicide, with 20% having attempted suicide. As outlined in the bill on page 14, transgender youth with supportive families experience a 52% decrease in recent suicidal thoughts and 46% decrease in suicide attempts. Not only suicide, but human trafficking is an issue for LGBTQ plus youth. According to the Polaris Project's 2019 data, of the 40% of trafficked youth who identify as LGBTQ plus, 46% ran away because of family rejection. I know none of you against this policy would want to be responsible for that happening to your child. The blueprint to make VBCPS a safer, inclusive, and more positive environment is right here in the model policy bill. Implementation of this policy will lead to an exponential decline in bullying, an increase in student happiness and success, and a positive, holistic educational environment where students can focus on their studies and relationship building. They can have the skills they need as adults to navigate this world and spend less time trying to undo trauma from trans and homophobia, like we're hearing tonight. I especially appreciate that the bill includes dialogue sessions and trainings that address the concerns of parents, students, teachers, and staff. This can break down misconceptions while helping individuals understand and fully support trans youth. As Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. If implemented into the policy, Virginia Beach will be doing just that and creating a generation of authentically expressed global citizens who will be able to make the world a better place. I'm not here to debate religion because church and state should be separated, but again, would like to share two important verses from the Abrahamic teachings. From the Old Testament in Leviticus, it says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in, in the Quran, it says, we made you into tribes and families so that you may know one another and so build mutuality. One more thing to remember is the art, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And from the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights explains that no person, child or adult should suffer for abuse, discrimination, exploitation, marginalization or violence of any kind for any reason, including on the basis of their real or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity. And that is time. Transgender, Our next speaker is Paula Chang. Please unmute. I'm unmuted, I believe. Can you hear me? Welcome. Yes, we can, Mrs. Okay. Chang. Thank you. Okay. Tell me when to start. Okay. Spencer and maidens under the direction of Ms. Rye and Ms. Melnick are at it again. Failing so profoundly in leadership that tonight's agenda is almost entirely about ceding their elected responsibility to their employee, Superintendent Spence, whose inability to understand his position is so off base that he uses his position to present himself publicly as advisor for $139 million of taxes to the city council, sending, advising sending money to lobbyists. And Ms. Rao, you seem to have no problem with this. Your transgender policy 5-7, is an assault on parental and religious rights. Be aware parents that their goal is not about protecting your children as protective policies are in place. Their goal is power, money, authority over your children, family, parents, and individual liberties of all Americans. The process and motivation of introducing agenda items 13B, one through 17, that of limiting public speech and assembly is a primer on deceit and incompetence. They do not like the light of truth, so they try to shut it down. They silence us because they cannot handle our opposition and resistance to their policies. Many of my objections to the policies and the board's handling of them are illustrated by discussing yesterday's most recent special meeting to attempt to repair the mess of their previous inability to run a proper meeting and write policies with legitimacy. Yet they still expect us to respect them and abide their assault on liberty. To justify these actions of limiting speech and assembly, Trinace Riggs and other school board members falsely accuse speakers, attendees, and rally goers of harassing, confronting, interrogating, approaching, and forcing VBCPS employees to quote unquote run gauntlets. Also, we are factually accused of being an angry mob. No proof of this is ever, ever offered, even though I have requested it through FOIA because it is not true. We, we, Mrs. Rye and Ms. Melnick, actually have video disputing all of these allegations as from the board members as the public videos the rallies and speakers waiting outside. 
When Ms. Riggs deceptively called a gauntlet is the walkway we are forced to stand in in 90 degree heat or rain, as we are not allowed in the chambers often, look around, and we're told to wait outside there to wait until we're called to speak. Choose one, Ms. Riggs. As the basis for these changes, because the basis for these changes are false, that the behavior of the speakers is based on unchallenged lies, the need for these to be bylaws to be changed as a result does not exist. Thus, voting these bylaws based on false allegations is a blatant abuse of power and dereliction of duty. Ms. Ryan, Ms. Melnick, you allow these lies to be spoken on the dais and on record, yet you know it's not, not true. Policy and bylaw changes should be justifiable, fair, and reasonable, and much of B1 through 17 is not. What a legacy. I suggest, and I honestly suggest this sincerely, send it back to the drawing board, listen to the public. The incompetently written First Amendment assault of these bylaws were written by Ms. Linetti, not the elected school board as it should be. Ms. Linetti, the letter and spirit of the law are two different things and any ethics course should have taught that to you. So poorly written and procedurally flawed are these that they, that I can give you an example. Yesterday, Laura Hughes asked school board member why they don't write their own policies. Beverly Anderson responded with the exception that she's happy to have the staff do it for them as she's just too busy to type. Not twisting your words, Ms. Anderson, I listened and taped it. In the process of these special meetings, Ms. Linetti also explained the reason for limitations to the public's right to freely assemble, stating the school admin buildings and surroundings were our buildings, referencing it appears herself, the school board and admin. Correction, Ms. Linetti, it belongs to we the people. You, Superintendent Spence, the school board are our employees, employees of we the people. Start acting like it, please. Respect us so we can respect you. Speak the truth and redo these policies. Thank you. Our next speaker is Holly Edwards. Please unmute. Hear me? Welcome, Ms. Edwards. Hi, good evening, Chair Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, Dr. Spence, and members of the school board. I'm a parent of an elementary school student with Virginia Beach Schools and here to support the Virginia Department of Education's model policies for transgender and non-binary students. First this evening, I wanted to take a moment to say to anyone who's a member of the LGBTQ community watching or listening that I see you, you're valid, you're perfect, and you're loved just the way you are. I discussed this last time I spoke on the topic, but I wanted to re reiterate the separation between church and state that exists in this country. Many who have spoken tonight seem to forget this. We cannot have a freedom of religion if we don't have a freedom from religion. I would also like to remind our school board members of the hefty legal fee that Gloucester County Schools just settled to pay for fighting very similar policies, which are up for debate tonight. Discrimination is illegal, no matter how small the minority is, as some speakers tonight seem to allude to. Not only is passing this policy the right thing to do, it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. This evening, I have to wonder, after listening to so many people speak on this topic over the last meetings and reading rhetoric online, how often are people exposed to someone else's genitals in public restrooms? To hear you all tell it, it's quite astounding. As I mentioned, I have an elementary school student. So while they consider themselves a big kid now, I still know where every single public restroom is in every single restaurant and every single store we went to while we potty trained. I go to the gym pretty regularly and my kiddo has taken swim lessons for years. What I'm trying to say here is I'm no stranger to a public restroom or locker room. Yet I can probably count on one hand how many times I have seen a person exposing their genitals. And if I'm totally honest, it's always older women in the rec center locker room. The fact is we all use the same bathroom as people who identify as transgender and non-binary all of the time, and we don't even know it. This argument that small children or girls will be exposed in the bathroom is just not an accurate assessment of what would happen if these policies were put in place. What is accurate? What's based on science and research? We will improve the mental health of our transgender and non-binary students. We will improve their performance in school. What happens tonight will tell our students where our community stands. By passing these policies, we will tell our students that they are valid. We will tell them that they belong. We will tell them that they are an integral part of our community and that they matter because they do matter. They are valid and they do belong just the way they are. So please vote to pass the VDOE model policies to support our transgender and non-binary students. Thank you. 
Speakers number five and six are not online, so we will go to Diana Howard. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Diana Howard, and I'm the chair of the Virginia Beach Tea Party. We oppose your efforts to limit public comments, such as using a simple majority to alter the agenda. Do not follow Robert's rules and suspend the bylaws or portions of during a meeting whenever you choose. Altering the bylaws to say the school board may instead of shall accept public comments during school board meetings and reserve the right to discontinue or remove public comments from the agenda altogether. Saying public speakers signed up to speak during a school board meeting may be allotted up to three minutes to address the school board, reducing the time to speak from four minutes to three minutes or less, eliminating the non-agenda item speakers altogether. Suspending public comment at 8 p.m. to handle other matters on the agenda and resume public comments later in the meeting. Obviously, you don't think public comments are relevant. Not replacing a speaker's time when you're interrupting their comments because you don't like what they're saying or you think they're off topic. Limiting, limiting our right to assemble by not allowing gatherings outside on public property we pay for while you are not even allowing the public inside the building for meetings and requiring a permit to do so. Banning the American flag for fear it could be used as a weapon. I could use a sharp pencil as a weapon. Are you gonna ban that? We object to the superintendent, an unelected person being designated to draft the transgender policy to create other means by which the public may observe the school board meetings, how speakers may sign up, the order of speakers, the accommodations that may be provided to speakers and seeking accommodations and not the school board. Coincidentally, today is National Virginia Day and Friday is Constitution Day. Virginians wrote our founding documents, the Bill of Rights, George Mason, the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, our Constitution, James Madison, which gave us this great American experience in self-governance. Free speech is not only a right, it's necessary. It is our responsibility to engage our government. You should be considering encouraging more public comments by parents instead of suppressing it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kat Evans. Please unmute. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Chairwoman Rye, Dr. Spence, and the board. I'm speaking today to ask you that you approve policy 5-7 to allow transgender and non-binary students to have the use of restrooms and locker rooms to request accommodations, to have menstrual supplies required in all restrooms, middle and high school, and be, have them made available in elementary school. It might seem like this is just about a bathroom, but telling a child you have no right to be who you say you are, it has a powerful impact. Schools form the center of kids' social lives. And that's where they also develop their sense of selves. And according to a study in 2017, bathroom safety policies for transgender students had a significant impact on overall school safety, safety self-esteem, and grades. Almost half of all transgender students reported skipping a class at least once in the past month and missing at least one day in the past month because they felt unsafe or uncomfortable. Reducing harassment of transgender students significantly raises their GPAs. So students have all kinds of needs, whether they are gifted and talented, speak a first language other than English or transgender, and schools have a duty to provide for these needs. Dispelling harmful stereotypes and prejudices of all kinds creates spaces where every student has the opportunity to learn and thrive. I'm a teacher and I support my students and help them receive the services that they need to be successful and feel confident. Why can't our trans and non-binary students receive the support that they need? My daughter attends an academy at Virginia Beach City Public School. She has friends who are trans and non-binary. Her friends should feel safe to go to the bathroom of their choice. I promise you they are not trying to expose themselves or act inappropriately. They just wanna pee. These are children, a child, who identifies and dresses as a girl would feel awkward and stand out if she was forced to go to the boys' bathroom. It would expose her to derision and bullying. A student should be able to use the bathroom without discrimination. This is 2021. Whether you like it or not, transgendered and non-binary persons are in society. 
And they've been here all along, by the way, and our students will certainly know a trans person in their lifetime. So showing respect for a student's chosen identity not only will help them to show respect for people later in life, but it'll help that student feel more confident. It, express, they, it allows them to express their identity and using the bathroom that expresses their identity not only impacts their confidence, but it also can negatively impact their academics. Adolescents coping with stress due to gender related stigma are more likely to respond with avoidance of school via dropping out, low self-esteem and social anxiety, all of which are disruptive to educational achievement and attainment. I hear many parents who may not be willing to accept trans and non-binary students as they are, but if you ask the students, they accept them and they don't care which bathroom they use. They barely have time to go anyways because they're racing across school to get to class or <laughs> they have to get back to class so they don't miss out on what they're supposed to do. About half surveyed adults think that transgender individuals should use the bathroom that correlates with their gender they are assigned at birth. However, eight in 10 young people aged 14 to 24 years old, that's 79% say that the bathroom used by transgender people should not be restricted. The majority of respondents believe bathroom use is a pri private and personal decision, a matter of equality, freedom, and human rights. This suggests that young people's views on bathroom use by gender individuals different from the narratives that often presented in public debates. In closing, I ask that you adopt this policy and just let the kids go to the bathroom when they need to without stressing over which bathroom they are going to. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Dan Chang. Please unmute. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, Mr. Chang. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, regarding parental rights and transgender policy 5 tech 7 Ms. Ryan, Ms. Melnick, your board fails to follow its own bylaws. Virginia Code required transgender policies by the start of the school year. You missed a deadline due to incompetent leadership and the zeal to pass 5-7 with minimal public comment and review, sneaking it in. That did not work. You delegated the school board's responsibility for the transgender policy to Superintendent Spence, not the board, as Virginia Code states. Yet you conveniently cite code as a need for this policy, picking and choosing as it suits you. Where are transgender regulations 5-7.1, 5-44.2, 6-56.1, as they contain the meat of the VBCPS transgender policy? Are they still the same as previously briefed at the 24 August school board meeting? Why are you hiding this from the parents? There is no transparency to parents regarding these regulations and future changes. Once policy 5-7 is approved today, parents will not have the ability to voice their opinions and concerns with any changes to these regulations. The policy review committee's items listed tonight are further examples of this school board's incompetence and failure to properly function as a body responsible for the education of our children and the care of our tax dollars. I observed two PRC special meetings on the 9th and September, 9th and 13th of September, and appalled by the lack of professionalism and incompetence displayed at these meetings, as well as your own handling of the board meetings and the board itself. By the way, Ms. Anderson, which is on tape, apparently agrees with this, as yesterday at the PRC meeting, she stated that Superintendent Spence should be given some authority to run the school board meetings as there is too much in the chamber for you to keep track of. Previous board chairs seem to have done this, have seemed to been able to do this. If you cannot, you should step down and not turn over your responsibilities to an employee of the school board. As a retired vice president of a Fortune 100 company, I have run many meetings to develop policies and pr procedures. I see these policies presented today as unstructured in writing and implementation. The legality of the policies are not vetted prior to placing them on the agenda, school board agenda. Ms. Linetti adjusts language after meetings, actually writing the policies, not the board. The board does not tell the truth about, about, about and the insults the public as a basis to change the bylaws and policies. This is pr particularly egregious as the public hired you. In my business, if I if we freely and falsely insulted our customers, and I allowed this, 
I would and should be removed from my position. Regarding the policy review committee recommendations on today's agenda, numbers, uh, paragraph number 13B, one through 17. Ms. Rye and Ms. Melnick, I want to read to you from the First Amendment of the Constitution. When the school board took their oath of office, you all affirmed to support the Constitution of the United States. Amendment one, freedom of religion, speech, and the press, rights of General Assembly. The basis of that is the establishment of free, freedom of speech and for people to peacefully assemble and petition the government to redress, redress the grievances. Ms. Rye, Ms. Melnick, you are the government. Ms. Milanetti will say that these bylaws are in accordance with the law, but they are not in the spirit of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen Dean. Please unmute. Welcome. I'm speaking tonight in relation to a few items on the agenda. First is the proposal that putting a time limit of 8 p.m. to end public comments with only a possibility of having them speak later in the evening. As you can see, it's 846. So by this um, proposal, you possibly couldn't even hear what I had to say. Make this make sense. In listening to your special meeting, some of your concerns were about having to get up early the next day since some of you have other jobs. You knew what the duties and responsibilities of being elected as a school board member meant. If you can't juggle more than one thing, then step down. You forget that we the parents voted you into these seats and listening to the public's concerns during these meetings is your duty as a school board member. It is your duty to listen to all who have signed up to speak prior to voting on anything. This proposal is absolutely ludicrous and I cannot believe that this is up, even up for debate. Second is decreasing the length from four minutes to three minutes, as this is limiting our voice, especially when you combine it with the above issue that I just spoke on. Third is the banning of the American flag and the deception and tricks you try to pull in the wording and changing um, the wording from one meeting to the next. I watch and listen to every meeting that you guys have, and you have during the sudden special meeting last week, this item was specifically said flags, but yet during yesterday's meeting, it was switched to clocks, symbols, and emblems. When Mrs. Hughes asked if anything else had been changed, you guys said it no, but yet this had, and she continued to call you out on it because it had in fact been changed and you tried to cover it up. This is another item that is ludicrous to be wasting time on in the first place, as you should never, ever <laughs> ban American flags. What kind of example does this show our children? Lastly is the disorganization you have when it comes to your planning sessions and the time in which you send out the agenda last minute with errors and oversights. I am not even going to start with the confusion you have when reading it. Did you make it a point to make these proposed by bylaws so complex and so wordy that you don't even know what it really means? Listening to your meeting yesterday, it was clear that even you are confused on what you're going to be voting for. Why the sudden need to get all these bylaws voted on? What about discussing and voting on matters that impact our children and their education? You have seemed to lost the reason you were elected. You spend more time and energy going over items that are not relevant to our children's education and futures and spend countless of time discussing how this agenda item should have been A instead of B and how it's the typo. Why? Why are you not, you are not exhausted from listening to the public comments. You are exhausted because of the amount of time wasted on items that shouldn't have even been suggested in the first place. If you were really trying not to limit public comments, then you would vote to delete these suggestions since they shouldn't have even been brought up in the first place. Thank you for your time tonight. Our next speaker is Michelle Jones. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> I know that uh, none of the parents who oppose the transgender policy want the affected students to be bullied or taunted or called names or discriminated against in any way. That's already on the books. Bullying is already against the rules and students, teachers, everyone should absolutely have a safe environment to work and to learn in. What's being proposed with the General Assembly trans policy takes away the safety, the modesty, general feeling of security while a young lady 
or young man is using the bathroom and changing clothes. That really is what this is primarily about, for me anyway. Now, if I was a teacher, I would be shaking in my boots. I would be afraid to say the wrong name or pronoun for fear of being reprimanded or worse. Were I a parent of a trans kid, I'd be shaking in my boots and fear of a teacher calling CPS because my kid said that I didn't accept this lifestyle. But for me, it's mostly about the sharing of a hotel room, locker rooms, and bathrooms. I don't care if Bruce wants to be called Caitlin. I just, I just don't care about that. It's about the fact that the state seems to be trying to take over my job of rearing my children and my grandchild. I have a, a grandchild in your schools, at least for now, maybe not for long, he's a second grader. I also have two kids in high school in Chesapeake. I think what's really going on here with proponents of the trans policy is that they want all of us to accept this as normal, ask no questions, just agree, or else you are a bigot or some sort of phobe. Believe it or not, it's possible to disagree with a suggested policy whilst still being kind to others in our daily lives. One really has nothing to do with the other. It's not all or nothing. Allowing a trans student to use a private facility to change clothes or to go potty or to have their own room for an overnight band trip in no way will cause a kid to feel isolated or discriminated against. This is a lie that I heard at a previous meeting. I would have loved to have my own bathroom when I was a student. It's just, it's a ridiculous argument. There's a reason these facilities are separate. And I'm sure you already know all about that. It's about security and privacy among the sexes. It's very basic, but you're voting tonight on whether to take that privacy away from my grandson and my son and from my daughter. I wonder if you would be okay bored with your daughters and sons using shared locker rooms and bathrooms as a norm or sharing a hotel room with the opposite sex. If you pass the policy as is, you'll be forcing our children to do just that. And why do this to them? Why put all of this on the shoulders of our children? Can you imagine the anxiety that especially girls would suffer every day, knowing that there will be a boy or two in the locker room? None of you up there tonight and none of the teachers and none of the General Assembly men and women and none of, not even our governor nor them will have to endure what you're voting on here tonight, the shared facilities that is that portion of it. Please keep this in mind when you cast your vote. You're asking our kids to endorse something that no adult will have to tolerate. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is, is Joseph, Joseph Fitzgerald. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. I truly have loved hearing Jesus Christ's name multi mentioned multiple times today. It was absolutely beautiful. And I truly believe that America is really waking up to the evil that's going on in this country. That's very apparent tonight. I would like to talk about the uh, Constitution that was so beautifully written with God's hand all over it. It was a foundation for which we feel security in our lives as we all experience this crazy life that we live in, the amazing United States of America. It was written for the Bill of Rights, and it is very clear shall not be infringed. I have previously asked this board to refresh on the Constitution, which has clearly not happened based on this list of agenda items. There's an infringement through all the adjustments of the bylaws proposed by this board. You have proposed infringements on peaceful assembly, religious freedoms, and you have reserved the right to infringe all over our freedom of speech, which I find fascinating considering it was just last year Double Dip Spence was claiming it was defending his wife for public posting on Facebook, tagging him in her post that told the sitting president of the United States to go F himself. And I quote, I understand some people are upset about my post my wife made on social media. I'm rarely on Facebook, was not aware of the post and was regrettably tagged without my knowledge. Her views are of her own and I apologize to the post offended. Like everyone else, my wife is entitled to her opinion and I defend her right to speech and self-expression. I agree with that statement, Spence. However, we discussed this, what this means for us as a family and our community, and I'm confident in a situation like this won't happen. I love how this guy double dips on the Constitution as he tramples all over the very rights that he hid behind just as he hides behind the board, double dipping with all kinds of technology companies, and Lord already knows whatever goes on. On topic, life. please. 
Sir, Mr. Fitz, Mr. Fitzgerald, one more warning. Please get back on topic. To or on parents rights. have to terminate your comments. Never be closed. You do not have the authority to help my seven-year-old identify her sexuality. The age of consent is 18. Has everyone forgot that? She shouldn't know what sex is. Spence does not have or plan a plan for this bathroom debacle, nor has appropriated any funds from this, but I'm sure he's getting all kinds of fundraising and we'll be asking more for the taxpayers. Does the board know what the plan actually is? This kind of reminds me of the implementation of the cultural responsive practices before the surveys were passed out to actually identify the needs of the community. As I was listening in on the Zoom meeting the other day, last Thursday, when talking about suspending the bylaws, <clears throat> The question was asked, what is a good re reason for suspending bylaws on a whim? And the answer that was given was to pass the Virginia legislature that was given down to them. What do we need the school board for if you're just going to pass everything that's given to you? We elected you to make the best decisions for our community. These are not the best decisions for our community, as you can clearly see is what's being told to you night after night as we have gone over this for the past 18 months. Also, I'd like to appreciate, thank you for proposing the, Amer the banning the American flag because now I feel justified in calling you all communists. Good night, thank you. Our next speaker is, is Jamie Fitzgerald, please unmute. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay, thank you. Good evening. After reading the 140-page agenda, one word immediately came to mind, control. This is not about a collaboration with parents nor the community, but an opportunistic approach to further the school board's ego and agenda. I find it particularly concerning just how many times the phrase reserves the right is used throughout these proposed revisions. The school board reserves the right to suspend a bylaw, 1-30A, reserves a right not to follow Robert's Rules of Order, 1-40A, reserves the right not to accept public comments at any meeting, 1-47A, reserves a right to reduce the amount of time for public speakers to address the school board and or discontinue or remove public comments from agenda. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, reserves a right to take any action needed to ensure meeting proceeds in timely, orderly, productive, and safe manner. 1-47C number 15. Any action, safe manner, obscure words like these without clear definition, without clear definition, have no business being used in governing documents. The phrase reserves the right serves as a precursor opening the path to censorship. And while we may not be there just yet, given the track record of the school board, it's not hard to imagine. Freedom Forum Institute states many situations arise in which citizens are silenced because of the content of their speech or because they have disagreed previously with a government official. This raises the specter of censorship. Government officials may not silence speech because it criticizes them. They may not open a public comment period up to other topics and then carefully pick and choose what topics they want to hear. They may not silence someone because they consider him a gadfly or a troublemaker. Legal dictionary says censorship becomes a civil rights issue when a government or other entity with authority suppresses ideas or the expression of ideas, information, and self. This leads to my next point, the suppression of expressive activities before, during, and after meetings, but specifically under items not permitted, 1-48C, cloth, cloth symbols and emblems. Delicate language used here, but naturally one begins to wonder, could this be interpreted to mean the American flag? In closing, these proposed revisions are alarming. Not only is control a common theme, but there are instances where authority is being shifted away from elected officials to an appointed individual who is not accountable to the public in the same way. In my opinion, it is reckless of the school board to even suggest something like this. I urge your careful consideration over the next few weeks prior to voting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vic Nichols. Please unmute. Thank you. 11B1, why hasn't National Disability Employment Awareness Month been placed on there? Discrimination. Policy 5-7 and 5-28. 
Children can enter into contracts, vote, hold a full-time job, or enlist in the military. What makes anyone think they're capable of a decision that at least 40% end up opting out of or regretting? Handicapped people who can be parties to contracts, vote, hold a full-time job, and depending on the handicap and less, they're not giving rights to handicapped bathrooms, but transgender people would get their choice. That's discrimination, which the school board is furthering by allowing the repeated legal slander of one group. The state of Virginia has stated that they have to build handicapped bathrooms, but the handicapped are not entitled to them. So explain to me why others should feel entitled to any bathroom they choose. SCOTUS decisions always give control of children to the parents, not to the government. There's no consideration for others' feelings that they would be uncomfortable in that situation. Why should we listen to the other side? Where are the dollars going to be in the school board's budget for lawsuits, given that Wolf, the Women's Liberation Front, has demonstrated that males, including sexual predators, have pretended to be transgender and raped women in California prisons, they get pregnant, and when a female gets pregnant because someone pretended to be transgender to lose bathrooms or locker rooms or whatever is trust areas or a guy gets raped, it's the school system that's going to be nailed. Even if state law indicates no requirement to file, the fact that you do not protect kids under your control will get the courts and the public's attention. Discussion now is that lawyers are going to attempt SCOTUS involvement as the elected officials that we have appointed to govern in constitution and state laws are passing that power to non-elected single power persons. 13B9 or 1-48, preventing our flag that men and women have died for and occupies the space on the school board indicates a hatred for America that no elected official should be allowed to have and stay in office. 13B8, reducing time to speak simply because you don't want to be bothered indicates one who shouldn't be in the position at, because that's part and parcel of the job. 13B9, an unelected official has no business on rallies in the parking lot. In the lawsuit, what's going to be your proof of harm to the school board of the meeting? 13B3, advanced public notice means parents and kids have no idea what rules they have and for First Amendment rights to be asserted. 5-31, if students are living at home in dependence of the parents, why should parents not be allowed access to their records? And on Appendix B, what are the costs to move the board meetings? There has never been a cost-based analysis showing what it would take to move out of the school board meeting and to another place. Or is the problem that you would lose control over the meeting, that people would actually be allowed to attend the meeting and not be left outside in 90 to 100 degree heat or in rain, in dark situations, simply to keep control over things. And that's basically what we're getting back to is people taking control of people's parental rights, of their religious liberty, of their medical privacy, and their first and second amendments. And that's not going to happen here. Thank you. Our next Lubeck, please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. First, I, I want to uh, acknowledge that you all have a, uh, a challenging uh, topic here because on the one hand, as you heard from the first speaker, um, he spent six years in court and got over a million dollars from a school board and um, they got their, he got his own bathroom, um, or I'm sorry, he didn't get his own bathroom. That's what, that's what was offered to him, I think. He got to um, go in the ladies' room. I'm not um, going to um, get into what ifs in terms of people, kids being messed with when a transgender kid goes into the, the other bathroom or locker room or any of that. Those, um, Different, all kinds of things happen. I'm, I've got two daughters in two different high schools in Virginia Beach, and um, the whole gender topic is um, there's a, actually, in some cases, there's a, a majority of kids that are just saying, I'm bisexual, because it's easier to identify with something other than straight, because if you're straight, you're almost, you're almost suspect for being a bigot. Um, so they're, they're feeling that. Um, 
basically what my daughters have told me is that um, you, they, you know, I don't, they basically say, I don't really care. People can say whatever they want. I'm going to treat people the way I would want to be treated. All that's great. And they, they admit if someone's transitioning, they're going to have a hard time. And I know that's not the issue of the school system and you don't get involved in transitioning, but I will bring out a scenario that um, you should be concerned about. And that is if, um, if a kid comes to your account, one of your counselors and that counselor says, well, you're, you sound like you could be this other gender and they start going down that road. And they're encouraged to go down that road. And I don't know if the school refers, because now the, the kid's not talking to the parents at all. The kid uh, is referred to a, a doctor who does the transition. Um, is that still not in the purview of the parents? Um, and then what happens when, um, in some cases, doctors now feel like they're obligated because if they don't go full force and go with what the child is saying, they get labeled and can get in trouble depending on the state. So now they've had operations and been given uh, chemicals. Well, what happens when that child, and you could now says, oh, I think I made a huge mistake. Who are they gonna sue? They can sue the school system. They can go after the doctor if the doctor didn't go by protocol and wait the recommended number of, I believe it's three years, if it's someone under 18, you know, those kinds of things. So. Um, I, I think we have to be balanced with this. Um, I also think it's the responsibility of the school board to, to wrestle with this issue. Um, and I, I do want to say real quick, since I have less than a minute, uh, pastors are here not, they came today, a lot of pastors, not because they are trying to convert people. They are sharing a different worldview. They are not hateful. They care about people. They take care of people all day long and get paid not enough. So um, they can, and they can get fired. Some of them might've gotten fired up. Some of the other people got fired up. They're not dangerous because they're fired up. Is everybody as enlightened and, and, and the most woke person in the world? No. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a range of all types of people. Just like I know on the left, you have some very dangerous, wacky people. So there, there's also though a constituency of about 90% or 80% of Virginia Beach that's gonna be in agreement on this topic and be sensible. Um, and I do think we need to deal with any kid that's suicidal for whatever reason. Get to the heart of the matter. Let's let's solve that piece and, and help everybody get educated. Okay, speakers 16, 17, and 18 are not online. So our next speaker is Lindsay Nathaniel. Please unmute. Well, welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chairwoman Melnick, Dr. Spence, and school board members. My name is Lindsay Nathaniel, and I'm the mother of a junior at Princess Anne High School. I saw online that the ACLU of Virginia sent Virginia school boards and superintendents a letter on Friday to urge them to adopt the Virginia Department of Education's model policy for transgender and non-binary students. The letter also served as a reminder to school officials that it's illegal to disclose a student's gender identity without their consent, even to their parent or other teacher, and outing a student could have severe negative consequences to their safety and well being. 21% of trans and non binary students have attempted suicide. Trans and non binary students also experience anxiety and depression at a much greater rate than their peers. The General Assembly saw fit to require guidelines ensuring students are free from harassment and discrimination. And the 2020 legislation requires school boards to adopt policies that are consistent or more comprehensive than the model policies developed by the Virginia Department of Education that was supposed to start at the 2021-2022 school year. I strongly urge the board to adopt detailed policies to protect transgender and non-binary students. This should not be left up to each school to handle, as we have already seen that schools differ wildly with how things are implemented. It's a fact that people in positions of power can be transpho transphobic bigots. For example, I FOIAed emails and was shocked to see that former Commonwealth attorney Harvey Bryant emailed and used the words gays in quotes and used cross-dressers instead of transgender as he opposed the policy. This stresses the importance to have detailed policies in place. Please do the right thing for the students of Virginia Beach and support these policies for our trans and non-binary students. To the gentleman that felt it was necessary to misgender Gavin, we see you. Stop being a bully. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, that was our last agenda online speaker. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, that brings us to the consent agenda portion of the meeting. Uh, are there any modifications to the consent agenda? All right, motion to approve. M Mrs. Holtz and a second, Mrs. Riggs. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we read the resolutions and and then uh, I'll, I'll read aloud everything else on the list as well and that we then vote uh, one vote for the entire consent list. So uh, if we would start with the resolutions, please, beginning with Ms. Owens. Thank you. Uh, I have the resolution for National Hispanic Heritage Month, which is September 15th through October 15th, 2021. Whereas one of our nation's greatest strengths is its vast diversity, which enables Americans to see the world from many viewpoints. And whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month honors the culture and contributions of both Latino and Hispanic Americans. And whereas Latino and Hispanic Americans harbor a deep commitment to family, community, and education and a perseverance to succeed and contribute to the shaping of the country and our city of Virginia Beach. And whereas the 2021 Hispanic Heritage Month observation theme, Esperanza, a celebration of Hispanic heritage and hope, invites us to reflect on the contributions Latino and Hispanic Americans have made in the past and will continue to make in the future. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach recognizes the importance of culturally responsive education that embraces multicultural diversity within our school division. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach officially recognizes September 15th through October 15th as National Hispanic Heritage Month. And be it further resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to support and participate in the various school activities available during National Hispanic Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this 14th day of September, 2021. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Okay, Mrs. Riggs, our second resolution. So the resolution for Suicide Prevention Week, which is September 20th through the 24th, 2021, I asked to read this tonight because I wanted to um, uh, make this a memory of my husband's son, Jake Wakefield. Whereas suicide is the 10th leading cause of deaths in the United States and the second leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 15 to 24, and whereas suicide is now the second leading cause of death in the state of Virginia among ind individuals between the ages of 15 to 24, and whereas suicide strikes without regard to locality, social economic status, ethnicity, religious preference, or age, and whereas in the United States one person completes suicide every 12.8 minutes, and there are 10 to 20 suicides attempts per each suicide completion, and whereas education and community involvement are known to be the most crucial factors in preventing suicide, and whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach is fo focused on ways to educate students, parents, and school staff about suicide and prevention of suicide, and whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools, through sustained and dedicated efforts, has implemented programs for all employees and students that recognize a deep commitment at all levels to raise awareness of suicide and its prevention. Now therefore be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach designates the week of September 20th through 24th, 2021 as Suicide Prevention and Awareness Week in the Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and be it further resolved that strategies and activities to address suicide prevention and suicidal behaviors be ongoing in Virginia Beach City Public Schools and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 14th day of September 2021. 
Thank you, Mrs. Riggs. So our consent agenda begins with the uh, A, program evaluation schedule for 2021-22, B, the two resolutions just read, again, National Hisp Hispanic Heritage Month, and two, Suicide Prevention Week, C, Policy Review Committee recommendations, C1, Policy 4-1, and personnel and employees of the board, C2, Policy 418, Dismissal or Placement on Probation. C3, Policy 488, Holidays. C4, Regulation 5.21-.1, students, Student Suspension and Expulsion. C5, Policy 5-25, Student Placement. 6, Policy 5-26, course load, 7, policy 5-27, promotion, retention, and acceleration, 8, policy 5-28, reporting student progress, 9, policy 5-31, scholastic records, and 10, policy 677, literacy and response to intervention screening and services. With that, would you uh, all in favor of this consent agenda kindly show a raised hand? Madam Chair, we have uh, 10 votes, so the motion did pass. Thank you. Now the action portion of the agenda, 12A, personnel report administrative appointments. Motion to approve. Mrs. Manning, and a second, Mrs. Ms. Owens. Uh, please show your support with a raised hand, or discussion, I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> All right, uh, please show your uh, affirmation with a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes, the motion passed. Thank you. And Dr. Spence, you have some announcements for us? No, ma'am, none this evening. Okay. So 12B, Policy Review Committee Recommendations, Policy 4-75, Conditions of Employment. Motion to approve. Mrs. Holtz and a second. Mrs. Riggs. All right, discussion, and we have Mrs. Linetti at the podium. Any questions for Mrs. Linetti? Or discussion? All right, then, please show your approval with a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. Motion passed. Thank you. Uh, action item B. B2, policy 5-7, non-discrimination, non-harassment of students. Motion to approve. Mrs. Felton and second, uh, Mrs. Holtz. All right, discussion. This is why I'm just going to point out. This is one of the policies that the updated amendments were in your packet today. We clarify this at the PRC. The two amendments have to do with the citation to the statute. It should read 22.123.6. We've discussed this at previous information session before the school board. That was a clarification that came back to the PRC. So that is the amended the policy that you saw in the initial agenda. You do need to look at the amended um, version that came out later today, earlier today. So online, it's still showing. 2.2-23-2, that's what's still showing online. Madam Clerk, did the amendments were posted? It was revised and it was also sent to the board. That would have come out this morning when we verified the corrections that came out of yesterday's um, PRC special meeting. Okay, so it was fixed on our agenda? It was uploaded to the SharePoint site and was also uploaded for the public on the website. I'm looking at it right now, but maybe it's because I had uploaded it earlier. It just needs to be. Yes. 
That's a possibility. All right, well, discussion, Ms. Owens, then Mrs. Franklin. Thank you. I know that we've heard from lots of speakers today and over the past two weeks through emails and uh, other meetings, and I just want to take a moment to kind of speak to the transgender and non-binary students listening um, and those who have transgender and non-binary students in their lives who may have been made to feel less than worthy of the rights and protections of their peers. Um, I want them to know they are loved, they are heard, you are worthy of physical and emotional safety. Ensuring safety for you doesn't take away safety from others. Um, I know that we're open to comments and discussions at this point, um, but for me personally, the right for a person to feel safe simply for existing as their true and authentic selves doesn't have room for debate. Um, well, I would have been fine passing the VDOE model policy as Virginia Beach policy. I'm comfortable having the language um, that regulations will be in compliance with code as an acceptable start. I know that no policy is perfect and any policy may need tweaking and adjustments some down, sometime down the road as we evolve in our knowledge. Uh, but I think our students have waited long enough for our division to comply with Virginia code by implementing these protections, and so I am looking forward to getting this voted in. Okay, Mrs. Franklin. Thank you. I just want to thank the public for the large amount of feedback that you have provided um, both for and against the policy. I think it is important to understand how the community feels on these issues. I also want to state that this has been a very, very difficult decision for me as I do have many people that I love and care deeply for in the LGBTQ community. Ultimately, this does come down to an implementation issue for me though. Um, the number of students that would be impacted one way or the other, we have heard from numerous people on both sides of the issue. And I do feel like, um, quite frankly, I do not believe that a transgender student would put themselves in a situation where they would harm someone else. And sadly, um, the way I feel has less to do with them and basically how the policy opens up an opportunity for others to do something harmful as well. I don't know that I could live with myself um, if something happened uh, in a situation where the policy did open up others to be have access to um, the locker room. And also, um, and I'm also not opposed to working, or working on creating spaces in the buildings in the future where transgender folks and kids would feel more welcomed, but I don't feel like we are currently able to implement that right now without putting others in a position where they are uncomfortable as well. And I actually would just love to have um, an opportunity to continue working through this policy and have also an opportunity for the community to continue to weigh in on part of the implementation procedures. I'm not at, against having further discussion. I think that maybe if we could continue working on um, the policy that we currently have in place and then allow for community weigh in and weigh in not just on their feelings as they did tonight, but also on the implementation of how we could work forward in the future, I would be very much in favor of that. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak on this. Okay, Mrs. Manning, then Mrs. Hughes, and Mrs. Felton. Okay, I have several questions and, and then some comments. So I'll just start with my questions and then um, give someone else some time. Um, I, my first question is, in our last packet, at our last meeting, the regulations, the proposed regulations, were also included, but they were not included this time for the public, and I'm just wondering why that is. I don't know who that question is for, but whoever would like to answer it. It was my, my direction was to only put the policy in, as we explained it the last time. The, the regulations were, show, were shown as support for some of the questions that had come up, but when put in the agenda, I was told to only put the who, policy who was, in. Who told you? The chair. The chair. Ms. Ms. Rye, can you explain why the regulations were not put in this time? 
Well, they weren't part of the agenda packet because this was a vote tonight. It was an action vote, so the regulations aren't being voted on. But they had been as was they were. But it was there for information on the first. Why were they right. there for the in, for information? It's just not typical to not include in the packet what's not part of the vote. Anybody who had, we had the presentation with Mrs. Linetti on the 24th and a follow-up during the formal meeting, and they were post, they were put, they were posted as part of that agenda packet. Yeah. So yes. if, if it was presented for information, then it should have been pre presented um, well, for action. I mean, I guess it's time, a fair. So. You know, there's, you can look at it either way. Again, the. The per here what was to just make clear what the actual vote was on was the policy and, and I did want to remind everybody we had a pretty extensive discussion about the regulations at our last meeting and okay. there was an opportunity for people to follow up with uh, Mrs. Linetti and, and I'm told that a number of board members as well as staff members did so. So and that's kind of what I want to address right now is this being a regulation and not a policy. I've done some research um, because I never really understood where regulations originated on the board. It was just something that I was told happens um, when I first started on the board. So I started doing some research and wanted to know what the laws say and what our bylaws say about regulation and who can implement them. So in code 22.1-78, it talks about a school board may adopt bylaws and regulations not inconsistent with state statutes and regulations. So this state code says that a school board may adopt them. Code 22.1-253.13.7, each school board shall ensure that policies are developed, giving consideration to the views of parents, teachers, and other concerned citizens. So then I looked at our bylaws, bylaw 1-31. It is the responsibility of the school board to adopt policies for governing schools. When changes in policy are made, these shall be prepared, shall be prepared, notification provided to the public and staff, and placed on the division website. It is the obligation of the superintendent and staff to familiarize themselves with and follow school board policies and regulations. So if the superintendent's supposed to familiarize himself and follow regulations, that would seem to indicate that he isn't the one who is supposed to create them. So then I looked at, okay, well, what, what does state law say is the power, are the powers and duties of the superintendent? It says that the division superintendent shall perform such duties as prescribed by law, school board, and state board. So then I went to our policies. What does do our policies say is the job of the superintendent on this topic? Policy 2-8 states that the superintendent's responsibilities shall be enumerated in the superintendent's contract. So I went to his contract right here um, on page 2 of 14 of his contract. And I, I will say this isn't the most updated version. I didn't have that at my fingertips, but I don't think this language has changed. Um, page 2, item 7, it talks about regulations. He shall from time to time suggest regulations, policies, rules, and procedures. And then under item 11, it says, shall make recommendations for needed policy or regulation changes. Nowhere in here does it give him the authority to create regulations. And since the law says that the school board may adopt regulations. It seems that this would be in conflict of law unless I am not familiar, unless there are other laws that supersede this information that I've just mentioned. So I'm going to ask the, the superintendent and the attorney to respond to this because the, and, and to speak to it in terms of running an organization the size of this and, and the number of regulations in place in this division. So Ms. 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 Rye, with, with all due respect, but, but I'm asking me. a question about law. I'm not asking a, a question about practice. I'm asking a question about law and what Fine. our laws and our bylaws say, because that's what we're talking about here. The law you were citing said you may, the school board may adopt regulations. That does not mean it, that's the only way it can be done. So I would say that, right. that's but, but where does it say that it would be the superintendent? That would be up to your practice. It does not say the superintendent cannot. And we do don't that. have that anywhere. It's contrary. 
and this is your practice. This is how you have run this organization, the regulations, and that has been your practice for as long Just as Just because been. it's been our practice doesn't mean it's right or that we've been following our bylaws because as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, this board doesn't tend to follow its bylaws. And I did. We know for a fact that the, the, law pro, the law requires school boards to approve regulations concerning discipline. So, the fact, so that suggests that other regulations are subject to each school division. And this, for, for all of us who've been on the board this many years, regulations get, and I, and I would like to ask staff to speak to this, they get into the, I mean, for lack of a bit, the, my, the, the, the running of the division and all the details associated with that, we have 600 policies and most of them have associated regulations, but I'm looking for a more explanation here. Can I just say one thing? Mrs. Um, Anderson? So so I, I believe, if I'm not reading this wrong, this policy directs, we can, we can direct our superintendent to do things for us. And this policy directs the superintendent to come up with the regulations. <clears throat> Am I reading that wrong? Procedures. Yeah, well, I think, I think, seven I think is along the you. same lines, um, the issue for me is if you go through and you all you have to do is pull up any p parts of the policy manual and if you identify where you see regulations underneath the policy man underneath the policy itself and go into that policy you're going to see the statement the superintendent shall develop administrative procedures be used by the person making the appeal and that is where the regulations get developed and you'll, you'll uh, what are you referencing I'm, I'm sorry i'm not following you in any of the, if you go into the school, into the policies, any policy, so, I mean, pick one, you know, 5.6. Uh, okay. And then you look underneath that, and you see there's regulations. And then if you just go back to those policies, I think generally anytime you see a regulation, you're going to see in the policy the superintendent being directed to develop the regulations to make that happen. So from the superintendent's perspective again that's a policy direction so the superintendent it's anticipated that the superintendent will do that and i think that's what i see here dr spence may i break in at this point please go ahead bylaw 133 formulation approval revision rescission of regulations section a formulation the school board shall delegate to the superintendent the function of specifying required actions and designing the detailed arrangements under which the schools of the school division shall be operated. Such rules and detailed arrangements shall constitute the regulations governing the school board. They must in every respect be consistent with the policies adopted by the school board. Staff is responsible to the superintendent for familiarizing themselves with, the following, with and following school division regulations. In the absence of applicable policy, the superintendent is authorized to establish needed regulations subject to later confirmation of policy should the school board so wish. The school board shall itself shall formulate and approve or revise regulations only when specific state or federal mandates require school board approval and may do so when the superintendent so recommends in light of community, strong community attitudes or probable staff reactions. The school board reserves the right to review and veto administrative regulations should they, in the school board judgment, be inconsistent with the policies adopted by the school board. It goes on to talk about how you distribute regulations. That is your bylaw concerning regulations. Okay, and so that right there, it says school board itself shall formulate or approve or revise regulations only when specific state or federal mandates require school board approval. This, the VDOE, law that everybody's saying tells the school board to do it. It doesn't tell the superintendent to do it. So this bylaw right here seems to say that the school board has to be the one to do it. I will point out to you that there are multiple sections of the guidelines that have been proposed by BDOE. You have adopted your 5-7 is one of them. That's your policy on non-discrimination. That's one of the requirements. 
you have the dress code. You looked at that earlier this summer. You've dealt with the bullying. You've dealt with the Title IX section um, mm -hmm. regulations that we had to put in there. There were several that did on um, uh, 555, I believe, 544 on there. We have dealt with a couple of the other ones. So you have developed most of the policies. And this is yeah, and we did that properly, and I support those. Um, but now we're saying that we're going to give the superintendent the authority to create the regulations, whereas the law and this bylaw and the other bylaws that I mentioned seem to indicate that the school board has to do it. That's not Mrs. Linetti just read. Can you reread yes, what did. you just read? I'm reading shared. it right here, too. If your interpretation is that they must all be written as a policy or bylaw. No, I believe I heard that. you no, it say says that, that, that we can do it as a regulation, but the school board has to do it. That's what this says. The school board That's itself shall heard. formulate or approve or res revise regulations only when specific state or federal mandates require school board approval. So that's and the state mandated to the, the school board to do it. I use the example of discipline regulations. That's why those were right. approved by the school board because they're mandated by state law. Right. And so, so this is not being mandated that's by an state law? That's is this, an exception. These model guidelines are not being mandated by state law? We're, man we're, we're complying with that by, by, by proposing this policy that then, no. and, and the regulations that. No, you're that deferring it to the superintendent because we don't even know what it is you did we so I, I i i i completely okay, i do not that's okay I, you're entitled to the it is my opinion that this is a violation and if this gets passed i i certainly hope that the public will challenge it in court by um procedural all right. issues all right mrs hughes and then mrs help felton so this is not actually a policy. This is a statement stating that we are going to have the superintendent create a policy that we will never vote on. And based on what we just heard from Ms. Manning and Ms. Linetti, it would, I could see where it'd be appropriate to maybe have him draft something and send it to us to vote on. But this is just having him create a policy that we will never be approving. And that's completely inappropriate. Um, Creating procedures, correct, Mrs. Hughes? And the procedures are the are what were shared with the last meeting. I mean, the the, the actual five seven language. It's an existing policy with an amendment. And can you, so that we can all know what the actual. Uh, Proposed adjusted new wording is Mrs. Linetti to 5 7. 5 7 is policy Students, non discrimination and non harassment of students, again, an existing policy that you've had in place. Within policy uh, subdivision A, the purpose, well, the couple. Minor um, adjustment scrivener's changes, but then there is a suggested pair of sentence that would read The superintendent or designee is directed to develop regulations, practices, and trainings related to compliance with the Code of Virginia 22.123.3 as amended and the Virginia Department of Education model policies for treatment of transgender students in public elementary and secondary schools. That is the addition to that, and the end, the end there is the citations and the legal reference. Thank there are a couple of scrivener's changes. Right. Thank you. So we're directing him to come up with things. We will, I mean, we'll have to go look for it. Um, will we be notified if there were changes so that we'll be able to implement those? Or those will just be all done under the radar? Well, I mean, I, I had a question set aside for uh, when the regulations are posted, how will that be communicated? But they they were shared with us. Mrs. I Linetti. think it's traditionally they've been the superintendent provides you notice of the regulations when they come up. But on what can you share here with the feedback you did get? Um, were were there any minor changes in language to any of them? I did go back and look at the regulations. We were trying to clarify the difference between an adult student. Um, there's some language people felt was unclear involving the trip so we were looking at clarifying that or breaking up some paragraphs that were longer so we did work on some of that so information working on that okay any anything else you can think of based on feedback from anybody no what i remember the changes were differentiating between an adult student and a parent legal guardian 
uh, those changes were made. And again, there, I know there were some concerns about what right you had, making it very clear that you do have the right to ask for your own bathroom or your own room, and that you, no one was going to be forced to be in a room somewhere they did not want to be. So we were clarifying some of that language. You're speaking of, a, of school trips when you speak of rooms? Yes, that would be, specifically that came up with the school trips. When you, again, we had a proposed bathroom, we, we had to have the one regulation on the bathroom. We've never had a bathroom policy before, so we put it into regulation. And, um, and the, but there was some concern about restrooms. You always have the right to come to your administration and discuss where you would like to, if you'd like private facilities or some other accommodation for you. And then the trips, we were clarifying that you're not being forced into a room with anyone. You always have the right to ask for accommodations on there. There, it's a little tricky in that area because you're also required to maintain confidentiality, so you couldn't necessarily discuss with somebody. So we were trying to clarify how you would go about that. Uh, the indication I was getting from a couple of people was that it was not clear to them that someone was going to be forced to be in a situation they did not want to be in, and we were clarifying that, that you always had the option to ask to be accommodated or to have privacy accommodated by single user. Facilities. Right, but the question was if all of a sudden, say six months from now, Dr. Spence decides to make changes to it, unless it's pointed out to us or we're just checking it all the time. We'll never know, right? The public won't know. The board won't know. I, so what we're doing is passing a policy that gives him carte blanche to create this, and I'm guessing it, it could be changed as he deems fit. Well, I'm glad you raised the question because I was going well, to... Well, nobody's answered I, it. I've just I was, asked it two or no, three I times. I was going to propose. I think it's a fair ask that we ask the superintendent for any that any future changes be communicated to us. So we, I believe, have a process for doing that now where regulations are presented to the policy review committee anytime there's an adjustment. Those regulations are then communicated out to our principals to, to share with staff, and those regulations are reported to you in an update. So anytime there's a regulation change, the full board receives that in an update from me. And so at the bottom of every, every update, it says regulations. And any adjustments to regulations are actually put in there, and those come out after having gone through the policy review committee. For I, I think we need to read. Will these be notified? Will the public be notified as well? Yeah, the re any regulation changes are posted to the to the website. All right, it's just it's very clear that people are very passionate about this issue, both proponents and opponents. And I'm really surprised that either camp would want to see something passed without actually seeing all of the verbiage and knowing that they'll be notified when that verbiage changes. Um, also, I'm, I'm very concerned with uh, the direction this seems to be going in where parental rights will be undermined. Um, government schools do not supersede the rights of parents with their children, period. That's, that's hugely problematic. I do not think that anyone worth their salt believes that parents should be undermined or that parents should not have the final word on their children. And I, I can't even believe anybody would vote for something that could lead to that sort of thing. Mrs. Felton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I, get, can I get this answered, whether or not this is included or it won't be included? Oh, if, if I'm Mrs. not clear. So are you asking the legal question as to what rights? I mean, we will have to respect the rights of someone who had legal authority over a student. Parents have the right to know what's going on with their minor children. Again, and I would point out to you, there is no, prior to this time, we have never, there's no form, there's nothing we say which bathroom your child goes into. We've never had anything. So I don't know where you want to create a procedure for that. If it involves a name change or something official in the documents, we are going to have to follow whatever the court order is appropriate for that. Uh, depending on what's coming out, we would have to involve a parent changing something that is a legal matter. If it involves the safety of a child, then it's going to fall under different rules and regulations depending on what is going on. So again, I will say I agree that the Virginia Department of Education did not do a good job of explaining how we were to balance the legal rights on this, and this is something we will have to take up with the individual fact patterns, but we've been doing this for years. Nothing about this has changed. We always try to respect what the legal rights are for the situation that we're proposed. So Except I don't that we're now hearing that people are, 
or that staff, faculty are asking students what they want their pronouns and names to be and whether or not they want to use them in front of their families, that completely undermines parental rights. And that is something that should not be allowed here. I don't know at this time that we have any form that a parent fills out stating how you want to refer to your child. So I don't know that there's been a violation. I'm not clear what's been given out to the school division as to ask about pronouns uh, at this time. But there is no, other than you signing when you register a student on there, you never say on that form he or she. So I don't know where we're violating a parent's rights. So that, unless a parent can't. When you say, how do you want to be addressed? And then how do you want to be addressed in front of your family? What you have just said to a child is, do you want me to help you deceive your parents? That is completely inexcusable. And again, I don't have, you're telling me that this is happening. I don't know that we've directed the school division to go out and do this, or there's been a guidance on this at this time. I will sell, tell you, and I've pointed out this before, federal law has made it extremely clear what the federal government considers the law to be. And when they look at the term sex, it includes gender identity and sexual orientation. So choosing to discriminate against somebody based on gender identity and sexual orientation is going to be a federal law issue. The Virginia Human Rights Act was amended last year, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity. And I remind you that you adopted those into your policy in 2016, so you've already guaranteed the protections for that. So I do run into a problem, and I, I get what you're saying, because I will tell you the council school students was very concerned about how we were going to interpret some of these issues but right now you have both state and federal law guaranteeing protections for sexual orientation and gender identity. How that will play out with pronouns, the guidance has been given by the Virginia Department of Education to work with the preferences of the child or their family. We are going to have to deal with that as to whether that's a legal issue or not when it comes down to it. I will tell you this happens. We have been dealing with this for as long as I've been here, which is 20 years, on an individual basis of the student and their family and try to handle that. I don't want to do a, a cross. There's appear to be a cross the board blanket thing that people are saying, I think that's inappropriate. I think we have to look at what's going on with this student and handle what's going on with this student. I can't guarantee, I can't tell you what the factual basis will be for that. I do understand that there are legal rights of the parents and we will have to deal with that on an individual basis. Well, and I'll just layer on because you said you don't know that administratively the division has not promulgated any guidance to anybody to say, to ask what pronouns do you prefer? And the regulations as written do not oh, suggest yes. that. The regulations as written say if a child requests or if a parent requests. It doesn't say we ask. Um, so I want to be clear about that because there's also been some indication that we do gender counseling. And we don't do gender counseling in Virginia Beach. So it was stated that, you know, where the counselors are saying, well, it sounds like you're a boy or a girl. We, that's not, we don't do gender counseling. We do school counseling. We don't refer to medical doctors. We never refer children to medical doctors. And so that, um, I want to clear that up because there, it seems to be some misunderstandings about what's in those regulations. And those regulations are available and were discussed at length at our last meeting. Teachers have reached out that it is happening, that well, some it, teachers it, are it, asking, mm. you know, what do you want your pronouns and name to be? And do you, do you want us to use that in front of your parents? And so what you're telling me is that the only way for us to definitively decide whether or not it's illegal is for a parent to bring suit? That's a that's a matter of, of law that I can't dis decide because I didn't write the model policy. No, I was just asking Ms. Linetti that. But I will say this, another reminder to the school board, if you hear from somebody that something's happening, you've got to let me know that or else I can't address it. The first time I heard that was tonight when you made that comment. So if it's happening and if we haven't promulgated guidance to suggest that that should be happening, I need to know that so that we can understand what's going on so that we can address it. So if you hear that, just pass that back to me as required by my contract. Okay. Anything else right now, Mrs. Hughes? Go ahead and go to, to the next person. If you can put me back in the queue, please, I'd appreciate it. All right. Okay, Mrs. Felton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank my colleagues for this moment. And as I listen to and I view um, Executive Order 14021, it brings back a remnants of another law 
that I'm very familiar with, Topeka 347 U.S. 48, 1954. And these two laws for me has some, it resembles some of the dynamics of it is similar. Not quite the same, but they're similar. And what these two laws represent, it talks about, it includes students. It also include um, these two law comparing, talks about parents and students who want a quality education and a safe environment for their children. You're probably thinking, what's the point, Ms. Felton? The point is they are students. Over 60 years ago, plus 60 years ago, the board, Brown versus Board of Education, started the path to integrating schools. I must say this executive order, uh, 14021, has given us some model guidance guidelines and some deliberate instruction how to implement this law. When board versus, when Brown versus Board of Education, no such uh, guidance was given to us, no policies, no regulations. I lived through this. And because the schools were slow in implementing it, they had to go back and implement Brown II, making sure that all schools with authority move with all deliberate speed to integrate schools. We didn't have policies. And I attended First Colonial High School. It was no regulations either. How I know that is because one evening, late after school, in the last ending of our classes, we had a pep rally outside. That's where they used to hold them. And it was a lazy day because it was the end of the day. But as we proceeded back to our classroom, no policies, no regulations in place. As we proceeded back to our classroom and we, as we settled over the PA system, that's what we used to call it, the PA system, public announcement system. The principal got on the parade system and said, all black students come to the cafeteria. There were no laws, no regulations, no policy. I live this. So what we're going through tonight, I, I still feel those tendency of what went on. Thank God that the executive order 14021 is telling us that we have to put policies and regulations in place. And as we got down to the cafeteria and we moved in, all the black students sit in the cafeteria. This principal began to berate us because, and he said, you black students will participate. You black students will do this. But there were no laws, nothing to protect us. Um, I know what separate, separate and equal means. I know what it looks like. Bathroom for the blacks and bathroom for white. I know that. I experienced that. I guess you're saying, what's the point, Ms. Felton? These are students. We were just students trying to, 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 to embrace what society said that we needed to have a quality education from their education system. Because if we didn't, we didn't qualify for the jobs. What's the point? These are just students. And I'd just like to say that in the 50s and late in the 50s, there was only one black high school in the city of Virginia Beach. Separate but equal. That's what they said. It was one black high school, and it was called Union Kinsfield. And if you want to familiarize yourself with it, sitting in it, it was sitting in the same place that Renaissance sits now. And all black students from Crees, Pongo, Back Bay, Black Waters, this area, we went to that one high school, Union Kinsfield, until they said schools had to be integrated. After 1955, 1955, it took another 10 years 
before Princess Anne County, Virginia, the city of Virginia Beach fully implemented their schools. After the fact, another 10 years. What's the point? They're just students. We were just students trying to get in to do what we needed to get done. The EO 14201 is not, it's not perfect, but it is the law. And the main focus is to, to qualify education in an inclusive environment, period. The purpose of the education equity policy, in short, it says, the school boards value diversity in our community and staff. The school board believes that all student, staff, and community members, regardless of background, deserve a rigorous and respectful learning and work environment where diversity is valued and used towards achieving positive academic and social outcome. What's the point? There exist in Virginia Beach City Public School students. And when I look at this policy, I had no doubt I relived some of those days. It's the law. And I can, I can appreciate that they are making us or they're moving towards us having policy because without policy and regulation, people are tend to do any, any and everything that they wanted to do. And I say that with all deliverance because I know you're saying, so what, Ms. Felton? What's the point? I was a student in school, and I had a principal of this division to call me down to the cafeteria and berate me because I was an African-American. So I'm just saying, thank God for the uh, guidance that they've given us and how we're going to move forward. And again, I said, is it the perfect? It is not a perfect policy. It's not a perfect law. But it still remains that these are our students, Virginia Beach City Public School students. And I rest my case. Thank you. Mrs. Manning and Mrs. Hughes again. Um, so on the topic of the pronouns, I have also heard that, and, and I didn't bring it to the attention of the superintendent yet because um, based upon the model policies and the fact that it appears we're going to be implementing this, um, if we implement this, then there's no way around it. If we tell the superintendent to implement policies um, in accordance and compliance with this code, then if a teacher wants to ask a student what their preferred pronoun is and whether or not their parents know, they can do that based upon this. I have not been provided with any updated regulations. It sounds like they've been, they have been changed since the last time. We haven't seen them. So I'm going off of what's in this policy 5-7 here is that we are going to be in compliance with Code of Virginia 22.1-23.3, which says you can do this. So um, again, that's another reason why we should have these spelled out in policy, not a regulation that's going to constantly change and that our public is not going to be notified about. Saying that it's going to be on the website doesn't mean that the public is going to know about it. The public's not going to keep going on the website every week to see if that regulation has changed and what the regulations are. So. Um, you know, I, I just, I pray for the transgender students who have been forced into the spotlight on this topic throughout this state. Um, I think it's been done in a very poor way by our state legislature. And um, it, it's very sad that it happened that way. Uh, I don't support discrimination against these students or any other student. I support the anti-discrimination, anti-bullying policies that we have in, in place already to address this in our division. Our oath of office as, as elected school board members and the superintendent is to uphold the U.S. Constitution, um, the U.S. and Virginia constitutions. I believe that the model policies or guidelines, which actually is what the attorney general called them, created by the Virginia Department of Education violate law and the Constitution in many ways. 
The Founding Freedoms Law Center sent me a list of eight ways these model policies violate the law. I'm going to highlight a few of those that I had already identified. Excuse me? Please, please proceed. Paul. Okay, there's just a lot, of, a lot of other things going on, small meetings going on here in the background. So. Um, so, number one, it infringes on the free exercise of religion. The model policies violate students and teachers' free exercise of religion by compelling them to accept and affirm an ideology that could be at odds with their faith and forces them to undergo training, for, forces the teachers to undergo training that may be at odds with their faith. This violates the First Amendment's free exercise clause. The model policies punish as harassment and discrimination anyone who fails or refuses to speak another person's preferred name or pronoun, regardless of biology or proper grammar. This is a violation of the First Amendment's clause that prohibits the government from compelling speech. It infringes on parental rights. Virginia Code 1-240.1, Rights of Parents. A parent has a fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education, and care of the parent's child. On this topic, the model policy states, students will be allowed to use a name and gender pronoun that reflects the gender identity without substantiating evidence, and no parental requirement of approval or notification is required. At the writ written request of the student or parent is what the, um, I believe, the original regulations, draft regulations that we received. At the written request of student or parent of a minor student, use the name and pronoun that corresponds to the student's or parent's um, or students or parents request. So this is telling me that a student can make the request and the parent doesn't have to. In the situation where parents don't agree with the minor student's request to adopt a new name or pronoun, the student and parent will work with school administration to determine how, the address, how to address the student's needs. How can the government decide that a parent will work with administration to determine the student's needs. That's completely backwards and wrong. These policies also require school staff to report parents to Child Protective Services if they believe that the parents may not be affirming of their child's gender identity choices. Another way that it violates laws is it violates FERPA. It allows schools to shield out parents from receiving information about the school's plan to accommodate the student's needs and requests, which is page 21 from the model policy document. I firmly believe that this policy is in violation of both the US and Virginia constitutions, religious liberty protections, the First Amendment of the Constitution, parental rights laws, privacy laws, and more. I believe that anyone who votes in the affirmative for this policy or anyone who implements items in this policy will be in violation of their oath of office. I also believe that any administrator, teacher, or employee who enforces or implements the practices I have mentioned could be in violation of law and subject to lawsuits against them. If this policy is adopted, I feel there are school employees or parents who feel that their religious or First Amendment parental rights have been violated, or if they are disciplined over this policy, I hope they will seek relief in courts because I believe that it's a huge violation of our rights. Thank you. So Mrs. Manning, to clarify, you were reading from the model, you were, what you just shared with us was what source? Um, um, some of those were, were directly from the model policy. Okay, some of it, them were from the, uh, the documents that we received at the last meeting. And again, I don't know what those documents say now because I've been told they've been changed well, and I haven't well, she, received those. So. She, right. She shared 
So I would say that we have not outright adopted the model policy. Okay, so you're so you're saying now that we're not going to adopt the model policies? It never said that we were adopting the state model policy. It says that um, the superintendent is to create regulations, practices, and trainings related to compliance with Virginia Code 22.1-23.3. Yeah. So are you suggesting that we're not going to be in compliance with that no. code? There's a difference. Compliance, There's a difference? There. We didn't, there are divisions out there that just outright adopted the state model policies. We instead went back to existing policy if documents. If I can clarify, what VDOE did in their guidance when they couldn't resolve a lot of these issues legally, they said consult your school board legal attorney. And so they kind of threw it back at the localities to figure out how you were going to implement it legally which is why I was working with some of the regulations on there and you, some of the things I was suggesting don't exactly match what's coming out of VDOE. We're trying to balance it as best we can, but that, that was the tack that VDOE took and that I will tell you the council school attorneys did make those comments to them when the regulations came out. How are you resolving this? And they said, talk to your legal counsel and you figure out how you implement it. So that's what I'm trying to do for you is find a way that it, it's- Well, and, and it would be nice if we had it all spelled out in front of us in policy as we've been requesting and that's not happening. So um, I'm just relying on the fact that we are gonna be in compliance with the Code of Virginia. I don't know exactly what it is. So I'm going off of the draft policy, the draft regulations that we received at the last meeting and what the actual model policies for the treatment of transgender students state. And you know, I just think it's very unfair to the public to not have this spelled out for them. For people, whether they are, as Ms. Um, Hughes said, whether they're opponents or proponents of this, it's not fair. It is not fair to the public. Can, can I just get some clarification? Because I'm going to need to know how to communicate to staff tomorrow. And I just heard a board member say that if this policy gets voted in tonight, that she believes that my building principals and my teachers will be violating the law and the Constitution. So I need to understand where to go with that when I communicate to staff tomorrow. Ms. Linetti, I'm going to need some help. I do not believe that that argument has been made at this point. I believe, I don't believe it's a violation of First Amendment rights. I, the, the law involving employees is a little bit more complicated. They don't have an absolute right to First Amendment while they're performing duties for the school division, so they would have to prove that in court. Um, I don't know that it's a violation of law to ask about pronouns. I, they may have jumped the gun. That's another issue we'd have to deal with, but I don't, I, that is consistent with what the federal law allows them to do. The question involving parents' rights and what we're doing with that, that's more complicated, and honestly, I would have to say it's a fact-by-fact -fact situation as with any court case. I need to know how you're bringing it into court and what you think the factual basis is. So uh, I can't tell you it's against law. I do not believe it's a violation of the First Amendment. I think the Religious Freedom Act has to be interpreted in light of the factual situation brought up. Again, you just don't file a lawsuit. You have to have a factual basis to get into court for that. So I can't answer that question without knowing the facts. I do not believe, as we've drafted this information, that we are in violation of the law at this time. And again, we are all perfectly aware that these are issues that individuals are looking for the opportunity to file a lawsuit for, and we will have to deal with it, as does every other school division in Virginia at this time. Mrs. Hughes. Okay, so I have a few quick comments and then one question. Um, one is, um, Ms. Linetti just said she didn't believe he'd be violating any laws, but I do imagine the Tanner Cross case would be used as that was the issue that he felt that he was um, having to violate his own ethics and morality religion using um, pronouns that were contrary to biological pronouns. Um, Dr. Spence, we did just receive an email from the mother of a sixth grade child, which would be 11 years old, second day of school, received the gender preference survey. So I will forward that to you as soon as we finish. She Thank copied the whole board that. on it. Okay. Um, you know, Ms. Felton spoke very passionately about segregation, and I absolutely agree with her that no one should be segregated. But I also look at the fact that every child who attends our school can attend whatever school they're zoned for, can apply for any program. Um, 
So I don't see this as a segregation issue. Um, my last comment before my question is, we had a speaker tonight use the phrase slut shaming, and then we heard him and several others refer to anyone who disagrees with them as hateful, ignorant, homophobic, a, a bunch of other ugly names. This is thought shaming, which is no better or worse than slut shaming. So that, that's a real problem, and it's not a real selling point when you're trying to get someone to come around to your viewpoint. Um, the question I have is, I'm trying to figure out if we have implemented so many of the components of the VDOE's policy already as far as um, you know, non-discrimination, um, dress codes, that sort of thing, why, why we need more. And I'm looking at, don't we already have non-harassment and non-bullying policies on the books? Well, the answer is yes, we do. So are we failing at enforcing them? Because if we're not failing at enforcing them, then why we would need more, I don't understand. And if we are failing at enforcing them, why are we failing? And why do we think adding more policies is going to make it better if we're not able to enforce what we already have? It just doesn't make any sense. I think you need to address the General Assembly uh, and that because they put in 22.1, 23.3, directing the Virginia Department of Education to develop this and telling you as a school board that you have to direct. You've had non-discrimination forever. You dress code that was actually a separate law that came through in the 2020 General Assembly, so we had to comply with that and make it um, neutral. We did that anyway. They just incorporated this in there. The menstrual supplies, as I mentioned before, that is another law that came out in 2020, was not directly part of this. They just implemented it in there. Title IX came down for the federal government. We had to amend that. So we've had a lot of these things in there already. And so it just so happened that the General Assembly required that we then adopt what came out. So you're, I don't disagree with you that there may be an issue, but the issue is really with the General Assembly. You need to deal with them. So we, we required, and there was a guidance that came down from the Virginia Department of Education saying that it was necessary to implement these policies that wasn't good enough to cite to your non-discrimination policies. Now they were interviewed this morning on Wavy, and the question was asked, what happens if schools don't implement this? And the question was, and the answer was, we can't do anything. So if we're only implementing this to appease policies that have no teeth in them anyway, it doesn't make any sense. The only other reason I could find that we would do this is uh, political expedience, and that's not a good reason to do this either. Well, some would suggest we're doing this for the students, but um, I will. I want to bring up just the religion question because, Mrs. Lenani, I'm, I'm going to ask you this. I mean, we are a public school system. Okay, I belong to a a church, and but, but and and I have the option to send my kids to that denominational school. We chose public school, so I'm asking that in terms of employees employed by a public school. There is a limit to their religious beliefs. Like if I if I am opposed to philosophically or to to gay children, I can't as a teacher refuse to teach gay children. I don't belong in the public school system. If if I say that's my re my religion tells me this is wrong and I'm not going to do it, so don't put any gay kids in my classroom. Am I on the right uh, your path here? <laughs> your rights as an employee are different. Necessarily. You don't necessarily have the same right. If you choose to work for the school division, you would be required to comply with the policies. If it's necessary, you can demonstrate a way that we need to um, accommodate your ability to practice your religion. And we have employers that need time off to pray and things like that. We accommodate that. But to out violate another law or not um, implement a policy is going to be a problem for us. So uh, again, it, you would need to show me the fact pattern that was coming up for me to answer the question on that. But I do not, I, I cannot say that employees that their personal religious rights override the requirements of the policies and the regulations of the school division. Ms. Roy, what you just said was pejorative and not even close to what I said or asked. Oh, no, and I, if we had I, I any teachers 
who said they didn't what, want to teach a gay student, you, they should be wait, terminated. But it, I don't think that's if, happening. I, I you do have an absolute I'm, right to your beliefs. I'm not connecting my co my question with anything you said, Mrs. Hughes. I've had this question down waiting for everybody else to ask theirs. And I thought it was important to bring it up because a number of speakers did. And we do listen to our speakers. And a number asserted their religious beliefs. And I'm, I'm saying I fully respect their beliefs because I'm a very religious person. But there's a... When you step in as an employee of a public school, you just, as Miss, I mean, you just, con you just answered my question. I just wanted it on the record that we, we can't just bring our religious beliefs into a public school and expect that we can pick and choose which, which of the school policies we are going to follow. That's all I was. That's the only point I was trying to make. So. Uh, okay, is any other comments? So again, we'll, we, all right then. Uh, let me go back to where we are. So this is policy five by seven. We have the motion on the floor in a second. So all in favor, please show a raised hand. We have seven ayes. All opposed, please show a raised hand. And we have three nays. The motion did pass. Madam oh. Chair, uh, just a point of order. Could we just state that Ms. Uh, Weems had to... The reason yeah, she for the record, Ms. Weems was not able to vote. She, she had to leave the meeting. So Could you also state for the record, since the public's not here, who voted against it? Yes, Ms. Manning, I will read all the votes. So those school board members in favor were Ms. Riggs, Ms. Felton, Ms. Owens, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Rye, and Ms. Holtz. School board members opposed were Ms. Hughes, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Manning, and one non-vote in Ms. Weems, since she was not here in the meeting. So if we just could, uh, again, Dr. Spence, uh, it will be communicated when the regulations are finalized and posted? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. information we have the budget calendar and you all have a handout here and welcome miss pate thank you uh good evening chairwoman rye vice chairwoman melnick school board members and dr spence uh, this evening i'm presenting the budget calendar for the fiscal year 2022-23 school operating budget and the fiscal year 2022-23 through fiscal year 2027-28 capital improvement program the calendar contains the specific dates and timeframes for the key components and activities of the budget development process. It's an important guide for administration and the school board regarding the schedule and the events in the budget process, which will ultimately result in an approval of a proposed budget. I will just point out several of the key dates on the calendar. On November 16th, we will be presenting a five-year forecast and a joint briefing with city staff. On December 7th, that's gonna be our first public hearing on the budget. February 1st begins the process for the school board. We will be presenting the superintendent's estimate of needs and the superintendent's proposed capital improvement program on that date. And please note that this will be a special school board meeting. Every Tuesday after February 1st, the school board will have a budget workshop. And on March 1st, at your discretion, you can have another budget workshop. But also on this date, you are scheduled to approve the operating budget and capital improvement program budget. We will then be sending your approved budget to the city on March 8th. We will have a presentation to city council sometime in April, and that date is yet to be determined. And by state code, city council must approve the budget by May 15th. So I'll be glad to answer any questions the board may have on the calendar. Um, I will, and I wish Mrs. Weems was here because she and I discussed this this uh, last year. Uh, 
in her in her capacity at the time as chair of the uh, PPM committee, and you, you're already nodding that you know what I'm going to ask you about the first hearing date of December seventh. I mean, it, it is the start of the holiday season, and I know the question was raised about if that date could be pushed up. And if I remember correctly, this is somehow tied in with the governor's budget. Was that one of the reasons it's... It's, it's part of it. The governor would normally release that um, information toward the end of December, like the third week. Um, so sometimes we try to coordinate with that so that we have more information to present to both um, PPMC and to Dr. Spence. I'm sorry, you said when is the... It's usually around the third week of December. It's really late in December when the governor, depending oh, on so how. Oh, mm -hmm. so then December, and December 7th is before that anyway. So yes. is there, I guess I'm asking, is there any reason that this couldn't be in November, this public, or is it that the division needs the time to be prepared? Yeah, normally the way we, we're looking at it, we're going to try to be doing the individual budget meetings with the departments. We have a lot of new administration, so we are going to be trying to conduct those meetings beginning October 18th through December 10th. Um, but certainly, um, we can work to try to push those dates a little bit closer together. I mean, I, I guess I'm looking for any other input on that. Uh, I, can I, I just have a question? Mm -hmm. In December, is December 7th our school board meeting? I know she said that's a special meeting, but are we, so we're planning on just having one school board meeting in December? Or is it, could you look and... See, I mean, I just, so the 14th is the second Tuesday. I guess I could look on the, uh, just for clarification, I'd just like to know. Oh, I was asking about pushing it back to November before the height of, before the, ho and I mean, we, we vote on this, do, do we vote on this next meeting or you're just, next meeting you vote so, on it, yes. So we can, we can look into this a little bit out, mm -hmm. out, offline and we can take a look and if any adjustments are Absolutely. or not. And again, I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. You know, there's probably a good reason why it Mrs. Ryan. needs to stay here. <laughs> um, I'll answer Mrs. Anderson's question really quickly. December 7th is a regular meeting of the board and you That's have correct. a subsequent one on the 21st. Both of those are because you have the winter holidays, which would necessitate you missing a meeting if you didn't move them up. Okay. So it's a regular meeting on the seventh. Okay, thank you. That's correct, and we'll uh, we'll discuss um, either moving that public hearing into November or perhaps scheduling another hearing, which I, was also part of the conversation I remember having with Mrs. Williams when she was chair of that committee. Oh. So and another opportunity to inform. Okay. And then the second one here is listed for February eighth, um, and that's after the the superintendent es right after the superintendent estimate of needs is presented. There's not a whole lot of Time. There's not a whole <laughs> lot of wiggle room in that mm -mm. period. Okay. Any any other questions on this, sir? All right then. Thank you. Okay. Well, welcome again, Mrs. Linetti and PRC. Uh, so here to present. Uh, this group of policies, uh, that product of the last uh, PR, yeah. two PRC meetings. Yeah, let me give you a little history, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, School Board members, and Dr. Spence, Cami Linetti, School Board Legal Counsel, on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I am bringing to you for information for your consideration a series of bylaws and policies that we are suggesting will meet some of the requests that you made at your September 1st meeting. As you remember, you, you called for a special meeting on September 1st so that you could discuss issues involving the, how your meetings were run, concerns that you had on that. Based on what I heard at the September 1st meeting, I was taking notes. I did meet afterwards with um, the PRC chair, who is Mrs. Riggs, to confirm what she thought was the general direction you were going. I later talked to Mrs. Rye to confirm the same things, where we thought the majority of people were going. And then I sat down and I went through your bylaws and policies and I tried to find where your concerns could be best put into this. This was me drafting it. I don't know where all these wild stories are coming about other people doing it. This was me based on what you had said. And I remember during the September 1st meeting, I came up and said, well, I guess this is, I'm the one who's going to have to draft it. At no time did any, during the September meeting, did any of you look at a bylaw or policy, bring it out and make a suggestion. Nobody sent anything to me. 
So I just went through, based on what Mrs. Riggs and another time Mrs. Rye confirmed for me, seemed to be the main areas that you were concerned about. There are a lot of these in here when I'm pointing out because sometimes when I'm going through a bylaw, that bylaw also reflected another bylaw somewhere else and I had to go find through the bylaws and policies where I thought everything matched up. So that's why you have a lot of things in here. I'm just going to go through them. Again, these are for your consideration. We did the best we could to try to get what we thought you wanted based on what you were telling me. What I was hearing was you were concerned about order in your meetings, the ability to rearrange your meetings, to control the decorum in the room, to control the safety in the building and the grounds of the building on there, and to make sure that your, your, your meetings were able to proceed in an orderly manner. So that was where we were looking for this. So. This is a lot of information. Again, it's information. You are free to change it. The PRC has looked at it. This is our suggestion to you where we think the language meets it. I'm going to start you with Appendix B. Appendix B is what you refer to as your school board standing rules. The best explanation I can give to you is basically the outline for how your agenda is going to work. One of your main concerns was where on the agenda do we fit public comments? How can we move the agenda around? So this is what I started with. And again, I'll read it um, for you. It's a lot of information. I'm suggesting that you change and add a little bit more information under subsection A. Let be time and place for regular meetings, and it would start off with regular meetings of the school board will generally be held on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month or on the dates and times designated by the school board and as thereafter modified. The school board reserves the right to change the date, time, or location of a previously noticed meeting upon compliance with applicable notice requirements set forth in the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. In-person meetings of the school board will take place in the school administration building unless otherwise specified by the school board. When applicable, school board meetings may be held electronically or telephonically, and the school board reserves the right to meet other times, dates, and places. Before you just had a general statement, I put this in here because this appears in your bylaw on your meeting, so I want to make sure it matched that. I'm suggesting we add a subsection B to clarify. Administrative, informal workshop, closed session meetings are regular meetings. We've had some concerns about what we mean by those terms. And my suggestion was on regular meeting days, the school board will generally convene prior to the formal meeting to address administrative, informal workshop, and or closed session matters. The school board reserves the right to adjust the time of such matters, but will generally begin at 4 p.m. prior to the formal agenda start time. The school board chair designate with the consensus of the school board president may move or continue matters until after the formal agenda date. Then we're going to go into school board recess and subsection C. Again, you've never had a definition of recess. You mentioned this when you read your agenda every time, so we put this into the um, appendix. C, school board recess. It is the school board's practice to recess at 5.30 p.m. or sooner to prepare for the start of formal agenda. The school board chair with the consensus of the school board may present may alter the time for recess or not recess prior to the formal agenda start time and may recess the regular meeting at other times. And then we're going to go into the formal meeting. Subsection D. Agendas for regular meetings for the school board will generally follow the format set forth below. The school board reserves the right to alter the agenda when the agenda is adopted or at any time during the meeting by majority vote of the school board members present at the meeting at the time of the vote. The order of the, agenda, the formal meeting will be, I'll go ahead and, that's where I put your first op, uh, opportunity to say that you would alter your agenda. I will tell you, and I'm sure the PRC members will get into this, we went back and forth about how to order this, and uh, they'll explain to you why, but we, and this is the order we're going to recommend. One would be the call to order at 6 p.m. roll call, moment of silence. Two would be student employee public awards and recognitions. Four would be adoption of the agenda. Five would be superintendent's monthly report. Six is approval of the meeting minutes. This is where your first significant change comes in. Seven, public comments until 8 p.m. Then we go through an explanation of this. Again, it's just public comments. It is not formal agenda item comments. We were assuming that the consensus the, that we heard was that you had one section for public comments, and then we mentioned 8 p.m. At this time, the school board will hear public comments on items in accordance with school board bylaw 147 public comments or is otherwise set forth by the school board for the meeting. The school board may suspend public comments to handle other matters on the agenda and resume public comments later in the meeting. So that allowed you to go to your 8 o'clock time period, suspend it, and then pick it up. I'm sorry, Mrs. Riggs. Can I point out something? This public comment is including agenda and non-agenda. 
Okay. Uh, it's just public comment. We're not separating right. we're not, it. We're not separating it anymore. This is public comments. They may speak to whatever they want to speak to. Correct. So we okay, not, I just want to make closing. sure that people are informed that we're not taking away any chance for them to speak about anything on our agenda. Right, because may I, may I, may I comment? Because something was said earlier this evening by one of our speakers who, who said we've eliminated non-agenda speakers. We haven't eliminated it. We just combined them all together, So, which is what you know, was the will of the school board at our September 1st meeting is what the majority of the school board wanted to do. So we no longer will have a formal and then a formal uh, speaking on the agenda and speaking and then later on speaking on non-agenda. It's all together at, at one time. So we just, just to make that clear because it sounds like the public thinks that we've eliminated non-agenda speakers and we have not done that. So. And I just wanted to add also, we may stop speakers at 8 o'clock. I mean, if you only have two more left, we'll probably go ahead and go. But the what we wanted to do was stop it at 8 o'clock. And things that were just for information that staff was going to make presentations, they could make their presentations and leave if they wanted to. And then we'll hear the rest of the public comments before we do anything where we take any votes. Mrs. Hughes, do you want to explain why we're back and forth trying to figure out matters that were going to be voted on and information to explain how we got to that? We wanted to be able to start comments earlier on because there are people where we have students speaking, people who work in the morning, they come here straight from work, so we didn't want to make everybody wait until the end, but we did also wanted to be able to get staff out of here if they were making presentations that we were not voting on, but anyone who signs up to speak will be heard prior to any votes being taken for anything other than adopting the agenda and the minutes. And this is where we agonized a bit, and unfortunately we could not work it out, and Mrs. Hughes is pointing out. The thought was you will take information because you're not voting on them, so this allows a significant bulk of the basis for what a lot of staff is staying for, these information items. Then number nine would be return to public comments. The reason we put it there was so that consent items you do vote on, and action items you vote on. So the things before you vote on, you're going to get your public comments in before then. I'm sorry. Just real quick, the um, we talked about students having. Oh, sorry. that's that's in another one. Sorry. We said Miss Owens, and so I just. Oh, my bad. Okay, sorry. Um, I didn't know if the student part was going to be in a different regulation. Yeah, yeah okay. that'll come into public comments. Yeah, gotcha. thank you. Again, so we tried it a couple of ways. We couldn't make it work because we were afraid that we would end up putting speakers really late at night again. So the decision was information doesn't involve voting. We will take information items. Then you return to your public speakers. So we will not get all staff out, but you will get the information portion. You'll complete your public comment section. And then, then you're, that's when you start your voting matter. So you would have consent is 10, 11 is action, just clean up some words. Committee reports going down to um, 13, return to administrative and formal workshop close items. What you did in the past was a little different because you, because you did not have your informal workshop item speakers during your regular meeting. You had to stop your meeting, go into that, and then you had to reconvene. Because you because you're taking all your speakers at once, we don't need to do it that way anymore. So it would just be uh, return administrative workshop, close items, be everything left, and then adjournment. So that's how we're proposing. Okay. Mrs. Manning. Yeah, so I like this, and I like the fact that you're saying that it's going to be before any votes are taken. Um, could I suggest, because it wouldn't be clear if I didn't sit here and hear you say that, could I suggest that at the end of item number seven, public comments, that you add the words, um, but prior to any votes taking place? So resume public comments later in the meeting, but prior to any votes taking place. Been, I mean, you said that was your intention, so I thought we could just. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think it's that's fine. That way. Okay. Well, what do you, what are the rest of the committee? Yep. I mean, you guys. I'm okay with that. I think that adding that language. spells it out. Thank we you. were trying to make it very um, informative and let the public know, but those words help. That little phrase helps to make sure that they do know that. Thank you. Because we don't, we met, we want to make sure that they know that we are trying not to keep them from speaking. 
And we heard that so much tonight that, that they have that, that misconceived. So I just want to make sure. So I'll add that language at the, the last sentence in seven. And we'll add after and uh, resume public comments later in the meeting prior to any votes. Is that what part? What prior to any votes? Yes, and this is Rick speaking to that. I was like, I wanted to jump out of my seat with the number of speakers who were under a misimpression that we were just stopping all comment at eight o'clock. So this is this is okay. Very, also, which is very clear. Let here. me let me add this because this is something that um, Regina pointed out. We might want to add also accept agenda and minutes. We might we probably need to put that in there as well. Okay. So where, where would you put that? Pass that. I know, but let's let's be very specific. Okay. We want everyone uh, to know. Well, would, no. would you be better saying action and consent items? Yeah, action or consent. We can do Thank that. You. Same Good call. difference. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I have one more thing, just because of the fact that we did have a speaker who was confused about the non-agenda part. So I'm, I'm thinking that maybe the title in number seven that says public comments, uh, we could just label that maybe public comments concerning school board issues, period. Let me expand on the title. You're going to see in a couple of the ones I, I, I used a phrase over and over again. It had to be matters relevant to pre-K. Um, public Education, Virginia Beach, and the Business of the School Board and School okay. Division. That, I'm trying to be, be consistent. Good. So we'll, when we look at that there, if you're okay with that language, I'll pop that back in here. I, okay. I want to be consistent with what you're accepting comments right. on. Right, but I just I just think people need to know that we want to hear about school board issues only, you know, that type of thing. Are there any further suggestions on Appendix B? Apparently not. Okay, so I believe that takes me to one thirty. Okay, they're roughly in order here. So bylaw one thirty. This had to do with amendments, suspension or repeal of bylaws. Because if you wanted to alter how you were doing your order and procedures, we needed a method for you to be able to suspend this. As we mentioned, that like we were talking about the Roberts Rules of Orders issues before. Roberts Rules of Order does actually suggest that you should always have an option to suspend use of your bylaws if, so that you have that option available to you. So um, uh, my suggestions on this one would be amendment, suspension, or repeal of bylaws. The school board reserves the right to amend, suspend, or repeal its bylaws. Then we would have a section A, suspension of a bylaw. The school board may suspend a bylaw bylaws or a portion of a bylaw bylaws during a meeting or for short periods of time when the school board determines that there is good and just cause for the suspension if all elected and or appointed school board members are notified of the intent to move for suspension, such suspension prior to the meeting, or if all school board members are present in the meeting when the suspension is proposed, a vote to suspend the bylaws or a portion of bylaws requires an affirmative vote of one half plus one of the school board members present at the meeting. There would be a subsection B, amendment or repeal of a bylaw. Proposed amendments to or repeal of a bylaw should first be presented to all members of the school board in written form. Strike out the rest of that sentence. Amendment or repeal of a bylaw requires an affirmative vote of seven of the 11 school board members if all school board members are present. If less than all school board members are present, then the amendment or repeal will require an affirmative vote of one half plus one of the school board members present. Those are the recommendations for bylaw 130. Mrs. Manning. Okay, so typically in you know any organization I've been a part of or or read Roberts rules, it's at, um, by a two thirds majority on suspending bylaws and things like that. Why why do we get away from using two thirds? That we is used two -thirds. to we used to use two thirds. It depends on what you're doing. You're talking about suspension as opposed to repealing a bylaw. Again, and I remind you, you're not required to use Robert's rules. Robert's rule says you can make up your own rules. You are not required yeah, to do that. Yeah, but it's common so. practice, and we used to use two-thirds when we did, um, you know, stuff like that. So, so why, may I point um, out that well, two-thirds, seven I'm, people is, is two-thirds. I'm sorry. Ms. Linetti, I, I think, uh, sorry. A question? Thank you. Um, I mean, two-thirds is different than a simple majority. 
So, I mean, it, it seems like we would want at least two thirds if we are going to be suspending our bylaws that govern what we do. And what I point out is in amendment and repeal, it is seven of the 11. So that is in your two thirds. But I mean under suspension. Correct. In suspension. Simple majority. I wrote simple majority. That was a suggestion. Again, I'm throwing these out to you. You wanted to. Yeah, wait I mean, I would prefer um, at least a two thirds majority. Um, if, if, I mean, we have, I mean, bylaws are, are, are meant for a reason. It's to let the public know how we, how we govern ourselves. And I, I don't think that they should just be suspended, uh, you know, on a whim. Um, and, and I think it should require at least a two-thirds majority. PRC committee, was there a reason that this uh, percentage is different from the amendment and repeal percentage below? Just not, from what, what Ms. Um, uh, Linetti said. So It's what, not different. Yeah, it, it's... It, it, we it have one is. half. Wait a minute. It actually it's, is. Uh, there's a difference between amendment and repeal because you're permanently changing it. So that right. should be two-thirds of seven. You could write two-thirds. We have seven of 11. Suspension is a temporary issue. That's why it suggested a majority. You can certainly change it, but there's a difference between a temporary suspension as first to actually amending or, or repealing a bylaw. That's why I put the difference in there, but you can pick whatever what percentage you want. Is it one Ms. half it, plus one? It's not two thirds. So two thirds would be eight because, um, you know, technically two thirds is 7.2. And so it has to be at least two thirds. You round so round it would up. have to be eight no. people um, no. for Ms. Anderson, I'm asking Ms. Linetti, and you, it it's, it's a little annoying that you keep jumping into my conversation. Okay, please proceed. Um, but that's why so, we, don't, we don't, it's not written as two-thirds here. It's defined as seven of 11. So it's, okay, so it's not even two-thirds. It's less than two-thirds, and then the suspension of bylaws is even less than that. So, so. I would at least ask for at least seven um, for the suspension of the bylaw as well, which two-thirds would be eight. There seems to be some ra rationale to just use the same percent for each on its on this one bylaw. Right. We've had this discussion many times, and we came to the conclusion that 7.2 does not round up to 8. So, therefore, for our bylaws, 2 thirds is 7. You can't have. We're not, Point we've, we've been moving away, a lot of the bylaws have been many less, because we, we've stopped saying two-thirds, we've been saying 7-Eleven right. or something else. So we, some of them have changed with time, some of them have not. All right, so let's, let's synthesize this. Starting with B, we'll go backwards. Where? It's your, your second paragraph. Amendment or repeal of a bylaw requires an affirmative vote of 7 of 11 of the school board members if all school board members are present. If less than all school board members are present, then amendment or repeal will require an affirmative vote of one half plus one of the members present. Oh, so this is saying seven of 11. If you're all present. Which, and the one above is saying? The one above is saying, uh, school board may suspend a bylaw or a portion bylaw during a meeting for short periods of time. So good point. Second paragraph, a second sentence. If all elected and or appointed school board members are notified of the intent to move for suspension prior to the meeting, or if all school board members are present at the meeting when the suspension is proposed, a vote to suspend a bylaw or portion of bylaws requires an affirmative vote of one half plus one of the school board members present at the meeting. So you've been you've been given the notice. If you chose not to come, that's your choice. But so, if you're there and everybody's present, then you go through this procedure. So if all 11 are there, one half plus one is how many? Seven. Six and a half. It's actually the member, yes. It does, which rounds up to seven. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're both, up. so they are both the same, but they're using different language to get there. Can we use the same language for each? Check, check which one you want. Why don't we just say seven? And then and if all members are present, then seven would be the the what we would use, and if one person is not present, like there's only 10 of us, then it would, then the answer would be one half plus one. What if there's only eight present? I mean, you can't, you have, you have to, you have to account for, you, you can't just say what if it, I mean, then you have to say what if there's only six, what if there's only seven? Then the if answer is one half, one half plus, plus one. one. 
you rounding have, up, rounding you down, because round you're up. rounding down on the other one. If you one, have so. eight people present, so half is four, plus one is five. five. If you've got six present, three there, plus one is four. Correct. Excuse me. Yeah. Basically, we, we've, always, we've used seven for the past, I don't know, as long as I've been on the board, except for, we used, to, at one point, we did use eight um, in 2012, 2013. I am really trying to do that, and it, we're just completely out of order. Everybody's yelling out. I'm just asking everybody to raise your hand so I can keep up with this so that we don't have board members yelling out are we using the queue. Thank I'm you. trying desperately to use the queue. Thank you. So right, suggest what you feel, suggest what you think is the easiest for you to understand. Mrs. They Rick. can be the same in both or we can all. Mrs. Wonder. Riggs. Okay, as the, as the chair of the policy review committee, I am asking for us to make it the language across this, this entire um, bylaw equivalent. Everything's the same. Not to change it from going from one to the other. Let's make it say the same thing for both of those, for A and B. Which one do you want? Okay, now that's what we have to decide. <laughs> I, I, my thoughts are it should, it should be... I. What you said in the first paragraph, I think if people are informed that this is going to be presented ahead of the vote, all of the people that are there is half plus one. And if they're all there, then it's the majority, I guess the majority. No. The way you have it written? If all president, if all elected appointed members are notified of the intent to move for suspension prior to the meeting, or if all school members are present at the meeting when the suspension pose, a, a vote to suspend or portion requires an affirmative vote, ha a vote of half plus one of the people present. Yes, it's not a majority. It's it's a, basically a majority, but it's. May I make a suggestion? This doesn't impact any of the other bylaws. Can this go back to the committee to figure this out? So that we can move on to these other bot. You policies. can look at it. My concern would be, I will notice, one of my concerns is that if you don't have this in here and then you have another one that's altering it, I've got competing bylaws. I don't that overly kills it, but I don't want competing bylaws to say different things. Mrs. Manning and then Mrs. Anderson. Yeah, so I would like for it to be at least seven. If it's more than that, then that's great. But my, I have another concern about this. It says... Um, Sorry, is it my turn or no? I'm very sorry. You're not. Okay. So, if all elected or appointment, appointed school board members are notified of the intent to move for such suspension prior to the meeting, so how are we supposed to be notified? Does that mean we can be notified, you know, you know, by you know, by email as we're walking into the meeting? Um, I mean, I, I would like to get this information well in advance and. There have been situations in the past where we've received emails like the day of and we didn't see it. Um, so I would like for that to be spelled out a little bit better as well. If we could please. Do you have a suggestion? My next? No. Thank you. Well, my suggestion is that we not suspend them at all unless we have um, a, a majority, a two-thirds majority, uh, which would be eight by, if, you, if you look at the typical rules of order. Um, that would be my suggestion, is that we can't suspend them or amend them unless we have eight anyway. Mrs. Hughes. Well, I personally think you should have a unanimous vote to suspend or repeal a bylaw. I could live with two-thirds, which actually is eight, if we have a minimum notice requirement. We have had things we've had to vote on that were emailed to us as we were driving here that no one had an opportunity to read. And so that's just not acceptable. There needs to be a minimum notice requirement. Even if it's 
only 24 hours. There has to be a minimum notice requirement for anything less than a unanimous vote, in my opinion. Mrs. Anderson. So on the majority of our other um, policies that we have, it states seven. Um, a simple majority is six. Seven gives us one more. So I can live with seven. Um, seven. I think we should okay. spell I'm, it out and I'm say gonna, seven. If that's everybody's here. If everybody's here, correct. Um, and then if everyone is not here, I'm fine with the language as it is. Half plus one. What does the rest of the committee say about that so we know if we can move on? Mrs. Hughes or Mrs. Rick? That's what I was saying. I was okay with that too. I can go back and redraft this and send it out for people to look at. And you can send your comments back to me so we can. I'll so we're not, vote, oh, we're not voting on this tonight. Yeah, we're not voting on this tonight. It's information tonight. Right. All right, I will go back and attempt to get the language based on what you told me here. And I've got to correct in both places for you. You want them both to mirror both the amendment and the suspension to have the same voting procedure. Okay. Right. Yes. I would also like to address having a minimum notice requirement. How much time are you suggesting, Mrs. Hughes? 24 hours. 24 hours. If you have an emergency, asking for a week notice might be too much, but yeah, 24 hours. Can I start? When does the 24 hours start? Before the start of the meeting? Yes. Okay. Miss Allens, quickly. And maybe this will get respelled out after it goes back. So the half plus one thing, if we have 10 members uh, present, then we need six to change it. But if we have nine members present, we need also six because we're rounding up, or is that five because we're rounding that one down? In the past, we've used the phrase um, rounding up for a fractional member. So either way, whether we have 10 people present or nine people present, we still have to have six to six votes to suspend or change. Mm -hmm. yep. That's where it gets complicated, yep. yes. Okay. Mrs. Ricks. Okay, so you're Last saying call. we should have 24-hour notice, and should it be in some certain way? Because if, and if the person doesn't hear or doesn't answer their phone or doesn't read their email in that timely manner, then it's, it's shot. We don't, we don't do it. And I think that's what, what some of the problem is, is happening, is not everybody is getting their email or reading it in a timely manner or, or have access to their phone or whatever. That's what's happened. I know what's happened because I do know that Mrs. Rye has called everybody and sometimes she's not getting everybody. Well, I think it should be a minimum of 24 hours in writing with the reason that you're asking people to do this. And I, I tend to think most people probably check their email Monday night because we do get things that are updated. Our minutes are sent to us Monday night. It, we should at least be checking it for that. Well, so I, you would notice if you had another email. I get that. I understand that. But that's not, that's not been the case. And I can, am I, am I correct, Mrs. Rye? Chair Rye? I mean, well. Am I correct? Well, we're all in a position sometimes uh, where we uh, may not But see please something. answer that. Am I correct? What, if that's what ask, that's well, what I've been told by you. Well, it, it's rare that I'll ask for something back in 24 hours for that very reason because people right. You usually schedules. call, start calling a week ahead of time. So and you're you making a good argument call, for more she's, notice. So you say we should have call more. several several times and still not got got answers back from people. So I do know that that's been a problem as well. All right. So maybe we need more notice than 24 hours. What would you suggest? Well, She's, she's been giving more. She's given a week sometimes trying to work, trying to get it to them and not heard a response that they got it. That's the problem. Well, I, I think 
one, 24 sounds reasonable for this circumstance. If, there, if there's a good enough reason for it, you don't want to offer too much time, right? And it's just Point enough. of information, though. Yeah. So does this preclude ever suspending a bylaw when there has not been 24 hours notice? There could be a time that it's possible that we might have to do it. I mean, I'm not going to give a specific reason, but there could be a time that we might have to suspend a bylaw and we haven't given 24 hours notice. Is there some kind of clause we could put Actually, in Actually, I think if you read it again, if all elected and or appointed school board members are notified of the intent to move for the suspension prior to the meeting or if all such school board members are present at the meeting when the suspension is proposed. So if, you all, okay. if all of you are here, you can do that. If you're all, otherwise you, you had to give notice to them. Okay. So if we're all 11 here, then we, and we needed to do it, we could do it. But what if all 11 are not here? Even though there may, the need may arise. I think you fall into the first clause if all elected or appointed school members are notified they tend to move such suspension prior to the meeting then you can go forward if they don't show up or if all of you are here and you propose it but if you didn't send out a notice ahead of time and all of you and only eight of you are here then you would not be able to the way this is written you would not be able to okay. suspend it all right so we're asking for notice but as long as everybody shows up there's no notice required so you can just do whatever you want to do. I kind of I like think if you're all here, all 11 of you are here are the right to, to control your bylaws, then you could say, I would like to move to suspend it, and then you go through your procedure to vote on. So I don't know what you're doing otherwise. But if all of you are not here and didn't have the notice that it was going to be suspended, then you can't because you didn't have the opportunity to let somebody know that this was going to happen. If we're not ready to move on, I'm going to respectfully request again that this go back to the committee. We have to get through these others. and Or if we find that because of something else we come upon, we have to come back at this at the end. But can we proceed and put this aside for now? We've already spent 20 minutes on this. There's still no consensus even among the committee members. And I, I'm not criticizing that. I think it just needs more attention. And, and this isn't the time or place right now, given that it's almost 11 o'clock and we have a number of others to get to. Well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We discussed this two different times, okay, in our policy review for a very long time, a length of time, both times on both dates and decided to bring it forward because there was question among the three of us. And that's why it was, I think it was two to one to bring it back to you guys because we felt it was that important to discuss. Now I know it's been 20 minutes and I believe me, I've been sitting in these meetings, these last two policy review. So I understand. Yeah. Oh, and I'm just acknowledging that I, you, I know you, you, did, are. you did get the feedback that this that is the purpose yes. of an information meeting. So with this additional feedback, are you in a position now to come to a consensus or do you need to meet again to go over all the feedback you received in the last 20 minutes? Well, then I propose let's let's vote on that as, as a, well, I mean, I propose that we, t this is information. So I propose let's decide if we want to send it back the way we just asked her to write it. Is that an agreement to write it up the way we just asked you to? Can you read it one more time, please? I, well, I can't because I haven't worked out all the other language. So I can take an attempt at adding the notice requirement as it applies, explaining the voting procedure in there, and send it out to you. And if I don't hear, what I can do is if I don't hear any concerns about it, we can add it whenever we bring it back next for you to vote on. If I hear a considerable amount of concerns about it, we still haven't worked it out, then I would let you know, Mrs. Riggs, that it probably needs to go back to PRC or come back to the school board for further discussion. Are we okay with that? 
I'm okay with that because I feel like if we Thank go you. back to policy, we're, we're, I'm sorry, may I speak? I feel like if we go back to policy, we're still going to come back with the exact the same thing that we've worked on tonight. And we all three so, are shaking our head and yes. knowing that. Yes. So we know that. So. All right, for this one, I So we are asking people to please, once Miss Lynetti sends this out, we want your feedback on this. I, I, as far as it coming back to committee, I don't know if it's going to change anything. So we need your feedback when it's sent out, please. Okay. Or we, we could just bring it, put it out there, and then <clears throat> at the next meeting, we actually will have a time to discuss it again and actually take a vote. Thank you, Mrs. Manning. You yeah, have a if final I could comment? just make a, if I could make a suggestion, Miss um, Riggs. <laughs> Sorry, it's late. Get late, Miss Riggs. Would you mind just uh, on any policies that we you think that we need additional feedback here, and especially since Miss Weems isn't here, may, would you mind sending out an email maybe tomorrow saying, could you please provide feedback to either you or Miss Linetti on X policies. Why don't and then we do we a general on. email to the PRC group? And so it comes to all the PRC members and me and Mr. Sutton. So that way we yeah, all However, you want it. us to provide feedback. If you wouldn't mind just sending a prompting email to the whole board saying we need feedback on X, Y, and Z policies. And make sure, and, and we will put in there to make sure you include all of us, the three committee members and Ms. Linetti. Great. Okay. Be violating uh, for you by that, but there's no electronic, electronic meeting. meeting. No, that's yeah. electronic. There's no electronic meeting concern in Virginia for that. Um, again, I don't know that we're going to decide anything. It's just that you all can look at the same. Well, yeah, we're just providing the feedback. Okay. Okay. Would we like to move on to 132? 132 is approval content, sufficiency formatting for presentation policy adoption. The significant change, there are some scrivener changes that show up. The significant changes happen in. Subsection C, and it would now read policy proposals and suggested amendments to existing policies shall be submitted to school board members and to the superintendent designee in writing prior to a school board meeting at which such proposed policies or amendments shall be reviewed or discussed. A vote for adoption shall take place at a subsequent meeting of the school board unless the school board by majority vote moves to approve the policy at that meeting. A majority vote of the school board members present at the meeting will be needed for the adoption of the amendment and provision of the policy. D, suspension would be amended to read policies may be suspended in whole or in part by the school board, strike up language here, upon a majority vote of the school board members present at the meeting when previous note notice of the proposed suspension has been provided in writing or upon a unanimous vote of the school board members present at the meeting when no such written notice has it has been given, and there are no further changes recommended there. Mrs. Manning. Okay, so again, um, we have a process of adopting um, policy so that the public can provide input. Um, I, I really don't like the wording that it's just a simple majority that we're going to present it for information and then vote on it in the same meeting um, because that means then the public would not know. So while I'm not completely opposed to this, I think it needs to be much more than just a simple majority. And um, policies may be suspended. I mean, I'm trying to understand why we would want to suspend a, a policy um, is that like if we're just, if like, if it's a redundant policy or like an old policy? I don't see suspension as a long-term matter because then you would either be amending or appealing that you need to temporarily suspend something for a certain period of time. It might be necessary. Why would we suspend a policy? I'm just trying to think of. So this was a previous provision, and, and so the question is, yeah, why was it, has it ever been used? 
it's just because you're really just playing with the wording here, but the, the provision was already always Correct. here, and yet I don't recall it ever being invoked. I want to say it came up at a meeting or two before we were looking at one of the policies, whether we could suspend the policy on there. Again, policies are something you approve, so if, it, if a policy impacted what you were working on somewhere else, you were, uh, I can't off the top of my head think of an example, but I could certainly see where you had a, one policy might conflict with something else you were working on. Maybe there was a time limit you needed to work around or provision you had, and you might want that op opportunity to suspend it. Again, I don't view suspension as a permanent matter. It's a temporary okay. matter. Okay. But I would like to request that it be at least a two-thirds majority um, if we are going to decide to vote on a policy change at the same meeting that it's being presented for information, just because this is a big issue with the public being able to... Um, give input. Mrs. Anderson. So um, I think we should stick with seven as we talked about before so that there's no question so that some of some of the, our, our votes would have to have eight some of our votes would have to have seven. I, I think we just spell it out say by uh, uh, if all school board members are present uh, you need seven votes. Um, if not, we resort back to half plus one. I, I think that if we're consistent with that on everything, it, it, it makes it a little easier to interpret what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I, I, sorry. Mrs. Riggs. Yeah, I think if we're going to, if we're trying to be consistent with everything, I think we, you know, so we're not, that's what we were talking about with this last one. We don't need to be going back and forth and back and forth. And the other one, we were talking about policies and bylaws and, and, and those kind of changes, too. So I think it should be consistent as well. That's my thoughts. Hello? Okay. <laughs> um, Madam, okay, so who was first here? <laughs> Mrs. Manning, Manning um, and then so, Mrs. Hughes. So I think that we, we don't have just a general, we're going to have this amount of votes for everything for a reason. I mean... There are certain things like, you know, approving the agenda, you know, a simple majority is fine. Um, but if we're going to be changing our bylaws and changing something as important as the public being able to give input on something that we're changing at that meeting on a policy, um, I don't think that we need to be consistent with the, with the number of votes. That's why we've always had something different. I, it needs to be harder. Um, and so I disagree. I really think, I feel very strongly that this should be at least a two-thirds majority. Mrs. Hughes and then Mrs. Riggs. Um, I do think under C we should keep our procedure where we go from policy review to information to action or consent, whichever one is determined, because it, it is important to be consistent with the public and then under D, you know, with giving notice that we're going to suspend or take a vote to suspend a bylaw, again, I think there should be a minimum notice requirement in there. I would point out one of the reasons I was, was going for the next succeeding meeting, because sometimes we work on a policy and we're not ready the next meeting. So if we did this one, if I'm not ready for your next meeting, you According to this, it would need to be on your next succeeding meeting. It may have to come back at a while later on because we're not ready to do that. That's why I didn't like the language of the next succeeding meeting um, because we may not be able to do it that way. Generally, the process is if it's approved on information, it goes to consent or action, but sometimes it just doesn't happen because we're not ready. So, okay. Mrs. Riggs. So, again, can we you put this as one of our 130 and 132? As we send it out and ask Similar tomorrow to what when I did with the prior one. Take the same thing as we did the one prior to that and ask for feedback. Yes, okay? I can do that. Are you going with seven? Four. We're asking for feedback. Okay. Okay? Because we're going to go back and forth with this just like we did with one 130. So we want your feedback. Moving on to bylaw 136, this is open meetings and closed meetings. 
first change comes in paragraph A, open meetings. Meetings of the school board shall be open to the public except those meetings when the school board adjourns to a closed meeting as allowed by the Virginia Freedom Information Act. Then strike out the rest. The one be when health, safety, or emergency conditions exist that are not conducive to accommodating in-person observation of school board meetings, the superintendent or designee is authorized at the word two determine other means by which the public may observe the meeting. Somewhat consistent with the four changes. If Zoom's available, if it's VBTV, whatever is available under the circumstances, I didn't think that was necessarily the school board determined that he that the superintendent would figure out what we, what we had available. The next change is in closed meeting. This is not a this is just to make sure it's clear what Freedom Information says. I'd be adding in the middle of the paragraph, school board members may poll each other regarding the intent of the school board to act, but no action that requires a vote of the school board may take place in closed session unless authorized by law. Before you ask me what that means, suggest sometimes in litigation matters we have to get votes in closed session. That's always been there. That's not a change in law. We're just clarifying that. Dropping down to two on minutes on there, closed session shall not shall be, we have tape recorded, I'm kind of moving this to recorded, update this, with the exception of student discipline hearings, employee discipline, or license revocation hearing, other matters of law, those, as you know, we do record those. Next significant change, um, just to be con con consistent with what the new FOIA laws are, under C, electronic meetings, section C, section two, C2, the purpose of the meeting is to address the continuity of operations of school board and school division or the discharge of school board's lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities as reasons for the electronic communications. As you remember, as part of the COVID changes, the Free Information Act was amended to allow you to do that. Then we would go on to still under electronic meetings under Section 6. Arrangements must be made for the public to observe the meeting. When the school board determines or the chair or designee determine when there is insufficient time for the school board to act, that's in parentheses, that in-person observation is unreasonable, unsafe under the circumstances, the superintendent or designee will arrange for electronic or telephonic access for the public if reasonably possible, or the meeting will be recorded and made available to review when such means are not available. I don't think there's another significant change. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do. So going back to remote location participation, remember remote location participation is when a school board member individually cannot come, not when the entire board is, school, uh, is there. We went down to subsection two, talked about pers personal matters, prevents physical attendance. As you remember, the Free Information Act has limitations on the amount of time you can participate remotely if you're it's just for personal reasons. We wanted to clarify, since you're actually appointed to your committee starting July, it made more sense to count that time. Instead of the calendar year, you would count it on the physical year. So subsection C would say during a physical year, in parentheses, July 1th to June 30th, and to align with the committee assignments. And you go down a little bit further. Mrs. Hughes has asked that we made some changes here to make sure it's clear so that if you change a meeting, it does not adversely, not unnecessarily adversely affect a committee member who might be forced to use remote participation where she only has two opportunities. She asked us to come up with some language. You'll see this appear in two sections. And with suggested language would be committee members should be consulted prior to rescheduling a meeting so that committee members have the opportunity to participate and do not have to use limited remote participation opportunities. This is why you will see bylaw 128 and uh, appendix C also has similar language in it. Those are the recommendations for this particular bylaw. Comments or questions? Okay. Next one should be 137 annual meeting. I know you can ask me why did I put annual meeting in here? Because when we looked at the first one, you looked at Appendix B, we referred to Appendix B, it's actually called the standing rule. So I went back to look for your bylaws. Where else do the standing rules show up in your bylaws? This is one of the areas they show up in. Bylaw 137 has to do with annual meetings. It's set for certain things that you have to do by law. It has to be the first regular meeting in January after the start of the year on there. So I wanted to clarify, you had um, several things you had to do. One of them was, the third order of business may be the appointment of school board members to boards, committees, and commissions, and the fourth order of business would be approved the standing rules. Well, since you actually put your committees in effect on, you decided July 1st, it didn't make sense that you automatically did it. What you actually do in January, if you've had an election, 
or you're halfway through the year, you look to see if you need to make changes on your committee. So it did make sense to me that you need to prove your your committees there. As you know, you go through that process in May and June to determine your committees. So my suggestion was take that out. That is not required by law that you appoint your committees there. Also referring to the standing rules. Again, the standing rules are Appendix B. I'm not sure why you looked at this every year, but essentially they're a bylaw, so I'm not sure why you have to approve that every year. It's a bylaw. You amend it when you need to amend it, so I didn't think that it was just one less thing you had to have on your annual meeting. So my recommendation is to remove that, and you will see the standing rules show up in Appendix B in a couple other places. Those are my only suggested amendments to Bylaw 137. Any comments or questions? Okay. Thank you. 138 is regular meetings, order of business, recess meetings, and work session, public hearings, and retreats and abridged meetings. The question came out for us earlier this summer is what does it mean to have a, recess, a retreat and abridged meeting? Those are terms you've used for as long as I've been around. I thought we would go ahead and clarify that. So, in this particular section on, under A, um, because you're talking about regular means, it would now the title would read date, time, and place. And I would say regular means of the school board will generally be held on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month or on the dates and times designated by the school board strikeout. And as thereafter modified, period, new sentence, the school board reserves the right to change the date, time, or location of a previously noticed meeting upon compliance with applicable notice requirements set forth in the Virginia Free Information Act. In person means the school board will take place in the school administration building unless otherwise specified by the school board. When applicable, school board meetings may be held electronically or telephonically, striking out the rest, adding the word dates. Order of business, this is another reason why I did this, this recommendation, section B. The normal order of business at regular meetings shall be established by the standing rules, but may be altered by the school board by an affirmative vote of a majority of the school board members present at the meeting. So that goes to your ability to alter your thing, your agenda. <laughs> Um, section D, I was just adding the words retreat and abridged in there. I would suggest E because we've not had a real definition for what a retreat and abridged meetings are. The school board may schedule retreats to discuss, review, or work on matters relevant to the school board and the school division. The school board will set the agenda for retreats and may vote on matters at retreats if the agenda for the retreat calls for a vote or if a majority of the school board members present at a retreat, affirmatively vote to add a matter to the retreat to vote on. The school board reserves the right to schedule or add an abridged meeting to a retreat for the purpose of handling matters that need to be handled prior to the next regularly scheduled school board meeting. The school board may determine what matters will be on an agenda for a retreat and or an abridged meeting and will not be required to follow the format for agendas for regular meetings. Retreats and or abridged meetings will be considered special meetings of the school board then we would just re or renumber the next section to be F. So those are my suggestions for this particular bylaw. Questions or comments, Mrs. Riggs? No, Did no, no. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Hughes, Mrs. Riggs. Um, so the only thing that I suggested for this at the policy review um, committee meeting, and I didn't hear Ms. Linetti say that this was added, was if we are going to vote on things at retreats or bridge meetings, with the exception of um, administrative um, appointments, I think we should only vote on things where the public's had a chance to weigh in. We typically don't have the public speak. Was that on there? Did I miss that? Yeah, but oh, did you say that? She didn't read it, though. Oh, I'm sorry. Remember, you were supposed I, to say so long as right. there has been. That's what I was okay. going to write. That's what I was raising my hand Okay, for. good. The opportunity for public input prior to the vote. Good You're job. right. I'm sorry. I pulled up. So this that was not in there. The and it came after the school board members pre present at a retreat affirmatively vote to add a matter to the retreat to vote on so long as, and then that's put there. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm sorry. This I put it out of the the one from last night. Yes. And again, part of this came up because we've never had, and as long as I've been here, we've never had a definition for retreat or bridge meetings. This made just a little bit more sense. If there are no further questions, I can go on to bylaw 140. Okay. 
Article 140, Parliamentary Authority, Special Rules of Order and Standing Rules. Under A, Parliamentary Authority, I was going to suggest a new line that would read, the school board reserves the right by majority vote of the school board members present at a meeting to not follow Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised. Again, after reading Robert's Rules of Order, this has come up sometimes, but Robert's Rules of Order actually does suggest that you reserve the right not to follow rules if you don't want them. So that was my suggestion there. Um, again, you may want me to look at some of the voting procedures that are down here that appear in special rules. I don't know if I need to go through them again, but we similar have some similar concerns about voting. I can see if they're consistent. It, it actually, this is one of them where it actually states affirmative vote of seven of the elected and or appointed school board members if all school board members are present. This actually goes into that at the bottom. No. Mrs. Manning, go ahead. Um, the other thing I'd point out is it's, it's, it's adopted standing rules. As I mentioned before, standing rules are Appendix B. I took them out of your annual meeting. I, and here, adopting standing rules, we talked about you would do at the beginning of the year. My suggestion is once adopted by the school board by a two-thirds vote, the, the standing rules remain in effect until changed. The standing rules, in effect, will be maintained in writing by the school board clerk and will be made appendix B to the, appendix to the school board bylaws and shall be available, made available by the superintendent of the website. The standing rules may be suspended by an affirmative vote of some of the elected and or appointed school board members of all school board members are present. If less than all the school board members are present, Central will require an affirmative vote of one half plus one. This one we left in for some reason, the, the language I'm rounding up for the fractional member. This, before you get into voting, this is where I think you put your standing rules on this when you take it out of the requirement that you do an annual meeting. This allows you when you want to do it. So this is where I would consolidate the, the rule on standing rules. Okay, Mrs. Manning. Um, so, you know, I, I again, if we're gonna create rules for ourselves, we shouldn't make it easy to break our own rules. So I would request that if we're gonna um, reserve the right to not follow Robert's rules that we do two thirds vote rather than majority vote. Mrs. Anderson. So is this one of those ones where we need feedback again from the majority of the board before we proceed? Because yes, I because we're gonna we're gonna go back and forth again. This is one that we really do need the feedback from everyone. And I mean, we brought this forth because we felt like it should be discussed. But because it was discussed at length with one thirty and one thirty two, I think that um, this again is referring back to the same thing. Mrs. Manning's having, you know, her her request and her thought. And I know that Mrs. Um, Hughes had said something about it in our in our meeting. So yes, this is something we'd like to have May your finish? feedback. So let's put this as one another one, 140. May I finish? So so my point is six is a majority, but seven is more than that. And I think you know, we've talked about this over and over and over. It's for since I've been on the board, and so we came up with seven. And and so I think if we if we do that, I think that's it's this the way this is worded makes it make makes sense and if we stick with this throughout i think it really makes sense for us but that's you know so miss mrs manning wants eight i want seven so we'll just have to go with that and see and what it would probably say. be helpful when you ask for the feedback to give the two options instead of just leaving it open-ended since those seem to be the two options presented if that's my suggestion okay you guys are okay with that we'll put those two Suggestions in there when it's when we're asking for your feedback. I know you did. <laughs> three options will be sent. We'll put the three out there then. <laughs> All right. Now this is the time you want to get your caffeine. This is your big policy or bylaw system. This is, has a lot of information, a lot of rewriting to it. I put a lot of things in here. I'm going to read through them. Feel free to deal with them. I broke a lot of them into a lot of them into paragraphs as individual ideas, so that you could play around individually instead of putting them in large paragraphs. This is a big one to look at. All right. So bylaw 147 is public comments at school board meetings. First, I would add a paragraph that would say 
During certain school board meetings, the school board may accept comments from members of the public on matters relevant to pre-K through 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division. Members of the public have multiple methods to communicate with the school board and are encouraged to communicate with the school board outside of meetings. The school board reserves the right to limit, discontinue, or otherwise alter the methods by which public comments will be accepted by the school during school board meetings. Section A. When public comments are accepted at school board meetings, the school board may, during a school board meeting, when the agenda for that meeting includes public comment section, strike out everything through there, pick up at the school board reserves the right to not accept public comments in any meeting. Public comments are not accepted at school board committee meetings. Public comments are generally not accepted at special emergency retreat or bridge meetings of the school board. New paragraph B, new title. Arrangements for public speakers. You know, this is going to go into paragraphs. Members of the public may sign up to speak during public comment sections of school board meetings as designated in the meeting agenda or otherwise noted by the school board. When not otherwise designated by the meeting agenda or notice, members of the public must sign up to speak during public comment sections by noon on the day of the meeting. Two. The school board authorizes the school board clerk and the superintendent or their designees to determine how speakers may sign up, the order of speakers, the accommodations that can be provided to speakers seeking accommodations to address the school board, the methods for in-person speakers to address the school board, the methods for speakers to address the school board electronically, electronically, and other reasonable or necessary decisions to allow speakers to address the school board during public comment sections, large amount of strikeout, End sentence, the superintendent or designees are authorized to maintain order and decorum for all members of the public who are not called to the podium to address the school board. Note that, that sentence, that is where the PRC could not come to a resolution. Moving on to C, t limitations on public comments. Now you're going to see a whole lot of subparagraphs. I broke them for paragraphs so you could work with them more easily. Limitations on public comments. When school board... When the school board accepts public comments during a meeting, the following rules and procedures will apply. One, once the public comment section of agenda has begun, the school board may suspend public comments at 8 p.m. to handle other matters on the agenda and resume public comments later in the meeting. Two, public speakers may address the school board only one time during a meeting. Three, public speakers signed up to speak during a school board meeting may be allotted up to three minutes to address the school board. Four, priority will be given to students currently enrolled in the school division to address the school board during public comment sections of the agenda, and the school board clerk or designee is authorized to develop procedures to affect this priority. Five, the school board reserves the right to reduce the amount of time for public speakers to address the school board and or to discontinue or remove public comments from the agenda. A majority vote of school board members present at the time will be required to reduce the time, discontinue, or remove public comments from the agenda. Six, the chair or designee will be the only member of the school board who will address the public speaker. The school board does not answer questions except items from speakers or otherwise respond to public speakers. Seven, public speakers must limit comments to school board matters to the school board to matters directly related to pre-K-12 public education in Virginia Beach or the business of the school board and the school division. Eight, public speakers may not violate decorum and or, or the rules or other required safety or health mitigation requirements when addressing the school board. Nine, public speakers may not cede or switch their assigned positions in the order of speakers, cede any portion of the time, or allow other speakers to address the school board during the speaker's time. Ten, this is a big one, Public speakers whose allotted time has concluded, who have been ruled out of order after being warned, who are in violation of decorum rules, or who are in violation of safety or health protocols, must leave the podium and discontinue comments. Failure to leave the podium or discontinue comments will be determined a breach of order and decorum, and the public speaker will be escorted from the podium by school division staff, authorized law enforcement, or other authorized agents. The chair and superintendent designees are authorized to take appropriate actions to address the breach of order and decorum or violation of law or regulations, strike out the rest. 11. The chair or designee will determine when public speakers are out of order and or in violation of decorum rules while addressing the school board. Any comments to the chair or designee or the speaker regarding the issues of order and decorum will not extend the speakers a lot of time to address the school board. 12. 
Public speakers who are ruled out of order and or in violation of decorum rules or safety or health protocols will forfeit any remaining time to address the school board. 13, school board members who disagree with the determination of the school board chair may make a motion with a second to vote to overrule the chair or designee's decision regarding a specific speaker. Such motion must be made directly after the chair or designee's decision. Only one motion per speaker will be allowed. 14, public comment will not be accepted during the meetings from any person who has not been called up and is at the podium who has been called or who has been called to speak electronically or like telephonically. 15, the school board chair designee as well as the school board reserve the right to take any action needed to ensure that the meeting proceeds in a timely, orderly, productive, and safe manner. I'm going to just finish out the rest of this because it's short. The distinction in this next section is public comment at public hearings. This is what you specifically call a public hearing. It would be when the school board has scheduled a public hearing for the purpose of receiving public comment, the school board shall accept comment only on the topics for which the public hearing was called. The school board chair, or superintendent, or their designees may create procedures to address how public comments will be accepted during the public hearing and will not be required to follow the same procedures used for public comments during other meetings. Rules regarding decorum, order, and applicable safety health protocols will be followed. I did the best I can to reach the consensus of what we thought you had spoken on. PRC worked through some of these, but this is where we think the consensus of the majority of what you asked us to do on September 1st. This reflects it, and we understand that you may want to change some of these. Okay, who's on first? All right, Mrs. Manning. Okay, I have quite a few um, that I just highlighted here. I'll go try to go through them quickly. Um, so item number two, school board authorizes the school board clerk and the superintendent or their designee to determine how many house speakers may sign up. Um, and then at the bottom it says the superintendent or designee are authorized to maintain order and decorum um, who are in the chambers um, is what I... Well, how I how I read that it doesn't say who are, are in not the chambers at the podium. who are not called to the podium. So I just this is a, this is a school board meeting. This is not a staff meeting. So while I would agree that the superintendent and staff could have authority over the hallways and other parts of the building, I disagree that the superintendent should have any authority over what takes place in our meeting. That should be the chair. Um, so I would like for that to say the school board authorizes the school board clerk and the chair to determine how speakers may sign up. And then at the bottom, the chair is authorized to maintain order and decorum for all members of the public is how I would like to see that one changed in number two. And if you wanted to add, just to be specific, who are in the chambers to address the school board of people who are in the chambers. Um, that's my first suggestion. Can I ask for clarification, Miss Mrs. Manning? What was your first suggestion when you said the the, the I heard you say the superintendent? Yeah, and it chair? says the school board authorizes the school board clerk and the superintendent or their designees. I would rather that say the school board clerk and the chair okay, to determine I'll, how speakers okay, may sign up. I'll wait and comment on that later. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then at the bottom, the chair instead of the superintendent as well. Um, my second one is number three. I absolutely do not support reducing the amount of time. Um, C three, correct? I, item number three. C C three for the C, public. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. C three. Um, I I do have a suggestion, and maybe it would go here. I have a suggestion that I'll throw out there to you all to see what you think about it. Um, City Council does something similar. It's not exactly the same way. But a thought that I had to try to reduce the amount of time that speakers are here. If we have one person, um, John Smith comes in, wants to speak to the board, and there are 10 people who agree with John Smith, and they sign up and say, John Smith is going to speak for me on my behalf. They don't have to be here. They could be here. They could be recognized when they're here, but they don't get to speak. Just John Smith gets to speak. So if he has, if John Smith can get, you know, has 10 people, they're going to be here with him. Instead of them all speaking, only John Smith speaks, and he gets 10 minutes. Instead of those additional 10 people, 
and John Smith speaking for 44 minutes. Um, so it's a way to kind of get recognized people who are here, who, who have similar viewpoints, who can all be here, they, their names can be recognized on the screen, online, whatever, um, but they don't all have to speak. So that, that was a suggestion that I had that could potentially shorten. You want me to keep going? <laughs> Please. Okay. Um, so number four, um, the student one, um, I, I'm fine with that. But how will we? How will the clerk confirm that they're students? That's what I thought you. Uh, I'd invite that process in here, and that's why you see allowing her to determine the order. I, I'm guessing she'll have to either have the form they sign up or ask. That, that, okay. That was too minor to put in my opinion into the to the bylaw. Okay. So in maybe something like the clerk will determine how. To figure out that I think that shows or... up in two, um, B2, where it said that the clerk will determine the order of speakers and other issues. Okay. I kind of left All right. Here. I'm fine with that. Um, item five, um, again, I think that should be a two thirds vote if we're going to discontinue speakers or remove public comments from the agenda, not just a simple majority. Um, item six, we've always had a practice that if someone comes up and they have items to give us, they're to give it to the, the clerk. I, I that don't actually like... will show up later on in another policy and, and like a decorum. I put it there. You could, it, it shows up. In a it different... says that it has to be given before or after the meeting. And when we have people who are waiting, they can't get into the meeting to give it to the clerk before. So I would like it to still say they can hand it to the clerk or give it to the clerk or someone in the, the meeting. Here was my thought in putting that in there. For you to consider it, I mean, certainly afterwards they could hand it to somebody, but if they want you to look at it while they're talking about it, they need to get it to us so that we can hand it to you ahead of time. Because I think, I think the expectation is that you're going to read what they're showing you. Um, and so we, for us to be able to get it up to you, it's kind of hard if they're just showing up with it. So what I was thinking in this section, if you want them to look at it while you're presenting it, uh, when you're called to speak, to get it to us ahead of time so we can have it at your seat wherever you are. You can obviously, after the meeting, hand it and do something. It just gets a little confusing for those of us up Yeah, there. I mean, I, I like that. But with the situation that we're in now, people can't even come in here. So, uh, well, if they've, if they've printed it out to give it to us at the meeting, I mean, they could give it to the person when they check in to speak, maybe? We can look a little bit more. My, my only concern is I think people are disappointed that what they're handing to you while they're starting to speak, it's hard for us while they're speaking to you. That I'd like that if they want you to read it, can, is there a way can we get it to you so that when they come up to speak, you have it in front of you? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to aim for. I mean, I like that as well, but I don't want to you know, just earlier. cut them off from saying I can tell you, the something. clerk is really busy when speakers are going on, particularly now that I, I know. Zoom, so we have to figure yeah. out how to do this for her. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> just to perhaps add, add to that, so at least in my time here, and I'd, I'd bet those of you who've been around longer than me would, would also know, like Diane would do this, and I don't think we've really seen it since then, but if you came in with something, she would take it. She'd say, I'll, I'll take that. And then yeah. she would take that, and then she would hand that out after the fact. Yeah. Not during the meeting, but she would say, I'll take that, so that it was clear, we're taking your materials, we're just, it's just not going to be accepted by the board during the meeting. Like, yeah. It's to prevent, I think the idea is to prevent somebody from just walking up and passing things out. Yeah, I thought that worked so well. You, yeah, but, I thought, yeah. yeah, so if maybe the language could just be clarified to say the clerk maybe it's just will accept. The yeah, someone else, because with right. the clerk, Diane did not have this whole electronic thing that the clerk now <laughs> has to do, so it has to yeah. be probably somebody else. All right, we could, I can come up with some language to help you see if we can find a better way to do that. Okay, and then item number 10, um, under public speakers, about halfway down, it says the chair and superintendent and designee are authorized to take all appropriate actions to address the breach of the order. Again, this is not a staff meeting. This is a school board meeting. I don't even think it's fair to put this on the superintendent. I think it should just say the chair is authorized to take all appropriate actions of order and decorum during the meeting. Um, and then uh, on item 14, um, it says public comments will not be accepted during the meetings, and I understand that, but we do have exceptions during public hearings, correct? That's not what I meant by this section. Um, what I'm trying to say here is, 
in a limited public forum, you define how you will accept public comments. So it's people standing up and yelling out and other things. That's not their opportunity for public comments. They have to be signed up to speak. Oh. That's what I'm trying to get to here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then I think the last one on this, um, item C, public comments at public hearings. Oh, D is crossed out on mine, and it says Yeah, that's, sorry, that's okay. a... Uh, um, so it says the school board chair or the superintendent may create procedures to address how public comments will be accepted. Again, I don't... It, this is a school board meeting, not a staff meeting. I think it should just be the school board chair may create procedures to address how public comments will be accepted during the public hearing um, and will not be required to follow the same procedures during other meetings. Okay, we have Mrs. Riggs and then myself, and I'll be following up on some of Mrs. Manning's remarks with some of my own. So I don't know if you wanted to follow up on the chair or designee superintendent, if that was one you were going to follow up on. So I won't speak for you, but I mean, that's, I know you were, uh, okay. that well, you had asked for help with that because you were concentrated, this is what we had understood, you had been concentrating on the speakers and carrying forth the uh, the agenda, so therefore you cannot see everything that's going on so, in the chambers. So, I, yeah, I'd like to clarify, but I'll start at the beginning with the, uh, the arrangement for public speakers B. I think, Mrs. Manning, the, the reason here, I didn't have input into this, but that the, the clerk and the superintendent, th these are like the logistics. It's not really decision-making that we're doing here in bylaw. But, but determining how speakers may sign up, that, that involves, you know, are they, gonna, are they calling into the clerk or Mr. Din with registering online? It's like those, those types of things. Um, the order of the speakers, again, they're the ones keeping track as they're coming in. They're not making, they're not making unilateral judgments that, yeah, we're going to take uh, students first. That's a school board decision. But given the process they're just coming up with the processes here that typically have been uh the staff and and the clerk's role uh the accommodations uh and we don't get involved with that and the methods for in-person speakers to address the board again helping helping out with the zoom and and the, i mean staff please correct me if i'm wrong but these have traditionally been the, the staff functions right the intent was this little, in this section was the logistic pieces of Thank it. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if there's clarifying language that would help, but that's right. I mean, we handle all the logistics of how people sign up and how they get, um, you know, the Zoom links and all of those things. I'm not sure the chair could handle that independently. Okay, I, I'm fine with that. I did not understand that this and, was a logistical thing. And maybe we could thing. incorporate. I mean, I think putting in logistics. See if I can would find make another it, word like logistics. Clarify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we, you could just clarify that, that would be wonderful. I'm fine with that part. It's and and speaking, because I, I raised this question myself, so I'm not trying to shirk it. I don't think any chair wants to shirk their responsibility here. Um, if there is a way to still lend support to the chair, because I just want to be fair in in sharing that with when, there, when there's a, ro a room full of... of uh, observers and and the chair is focused on the speaker he or she can't keep their attention on the full room and so i don't know if there's some middle ground here to, to say the superintendent and the chair or some other way to offer the chair support a way to convey to me because i don't hear everything that everybody else hears necessarily or i don't see everything that somebody else may see so i just wanted you to know it's a bit of a dilemma and i'm struggling with what the, what the right answer is. Wait, uh, we have a queue here. Can you tell me what item that is? I'm it's still on. But it's, it's the last sentence in two. B2. Uh, B2. Right. Mrs. Melnick, you're in the queue. Are you, are you to speak to this or something else? Okay. Yeah. So I'm throwing that out there. Again, there's there's language elsewhere that says the superintendent and, and or designee and the chair, the chair and the superintendent or designee to make it more of a team thing, 
or if it's to say the chair, I just want to make it clear that the chair does need some other support. And so I don't know what other. Can, can I just speak briefly Please. to this? Just briefly to this. Um, and I don't want this to be misconstrued in any way as having anything to do with any recent speaking or anything like that. But I, to, to speak to this, I think there's a safety issue that needs to be considered here. Because if you're saying that the, the two people or the one person sitting behind the dais is the only person responsible for the decorum in a room and for addressing issues that may come up in this room, when you've got, I realize we don't have it now, but when you've got 100 people in here, I think... I think that's problematic and it ties the hands of the safe school staff or the security staff, for example, to say only the chair can address matters of decorum in a meeting or um, maintain order. Only the chair can do that. And I understand the point of like only the chair can gavel that down and say you need to you're out of order and it isn't my job or safe school's job to call somebody out of order. But if you've got an issue happening in your boardroom, and you're saying the only person who can address that is the chair and safe schools then can't intervene. I think that's a problematic issue just from a purely safety perspective for staff and for you as board members. So I'd ask you to think about, I don't know what the language is, but I'd ask you to consider that um, as you as you debate this particular piece. And again, I threw out, I haven't talked to anybody else about this, but I, I hemmed and hawed about it over not, uh, since yesterday, but you know, the, again, the, the the chair and the superintendent are designee. It's just a thought. Um, uh, Mrs. If we're still speaking on this, Mrs. Melnick and Ms. Yeah. Um, okay. I would just like to. Um, I haven't said anything through all of these policies, and I. I just want to make this point as. We are a governing body, and as a board, we hired the superintendent. That does not give him supreme power. We, we, we do oversee um, the division um, through governing, through policy, but we, he has a contract, and there are things that, that Dr. Spence is responsible for, and, and we tend to kind of forget that. Um, and our supporting staff, um, we have processes in place that we, we seem to forget quite often, which is chain of command, um, even within our, within our division. So you hear something, let Dr. Spence know. We want to bypass that. We want to put out videos. We want to tell things to people that our people are not even getting the opportunity to, to investigate and defend. And so I ask that we remember that again, um, that we hired a superintendent and he is contractually responsible for this division. And we are a governing board. We, do, our, we, we are not responsible for every single thing that happens every single day in this division, nor are we qualified to, <laughs> to do what he has been hired to do. Um, and if you go back and you look at other school divisions, um, they make that perfectly clear. And, and there are things that they oversee and there are things that they very easily turn over to their superintendent because it's what that's, the superintendent was hired to do. So not in all cases, but we, we, have, to, we have to let him do his job. And that's all I'm going to say about these policies. Um, Mrs. Hughes and then Ms. Owens. Um, so two things real quick. One is just to back up. We were talking about speakers who want to come in and, and give us something ahead of time. If they call and say they want to, just have them write their name on it. We have a speaker list. I mean, I, I always check through the speaker list. I make notes on the speaker list. I can see if that's the same name, number 10. I know, you know, pick it up then when that person's speaking. That would solve that. Um, as far as, you know, this issue with superintendent or chair doing something, you're right. We do hire the superintendent to do certain things. I should not be going into a school building and directing teachers. 
you know, beyond things that a normal person would do, like maybe you didn't see this spill or, you know, like a safety thing. But typically we wouldn't go into a school and direct teachers or principals on their jobs. But by the same token, when we're in a meeting, the meeting here is a board meeting, not a staff meeting. And I do think leaving the chair in charge of decorum and safety, that doesn't preempt safe schools because if safe schools is directed to do something in here, it just should originate with the chair. You know, if she looks at the superintendent next to her, if he's sitting there and says, hey, can you go get them? Or she just directs them. But it's just coming from her because she's running the meeting and that's where it should originate. When you're sitting in this spot and you look at all that's in front of her, I'm the one who's situationally aware all the time and we have to turn to each other. It's a very different thing when you're sitting at that seat and you're trying to conduct a meeting and you're trying to stay up with everything. There, a lot of things she doesn't see because it's very difficult to see when you're in that seat. See, and you just said you're situationally aware, um, aware then, and somebody already suggested that the vice chair would be her designee, but so maybe this is something only, that the two of you should work her. on together. I can only help her, but we do have safe schools for a reason, too. Um, and that's only recently become an issue. So, um, it's Miss Owens and Miss Nixon. I'll take you Okay. Okay. Um, just briefly. I, I would be in support of uh, safe schools assisting as needed with uh, addressing decorum issues. There may need to be some discussion about what kind of decorum issues would rise to a level that we would want some intervention. Um, but once that conversation happens, and obviously that conversation would have to include Dr. Spence because he is the super, we don't direct any of the other employees. Um, but I don't see why that couldn't be a sitting down conversation. Here's some of the things that we would be concerned of. What are some of the things that safe schools would be concerned about? Come to some general consensus about what kind of things they would generally intervene on. Um, I understand the idea of the chair needing to direct everything in the meeting. Uh, but it, it just sounds unnecessarily cumbersome to me for somebody to see something on the dais, then you turn to Dr. Spence and say, Dr. Spence, can you tell safe schools to redirect somebody? If somebody else is speaking and other things are going on, that if they safe schools person sees somebody jumping up out of their seat or doing something that just needs a, a redirect, hey, can you, can you have a seat, your time, whatever that we wouldn't want to do that. And so I would be in support of that with the understanding that maybe there needs to be an initial conversation or maybe an annual conversation about how we're working together with that decorum piece. Okay, Mrs. Riggs, then Mrs. Anderson. Um, I'm just gonna have to say again, I, as we've been in these meetings that we've had a lot of people in, uh, and a lot has been going on. It was, it's very obvious in watching our chair trying to pay attention to what's going on and move the meeting along, watching the, the people that are, the person that's up at the podium speaking and putting her attention on that. There's too many other things that have been happening and have been said that I feel safe for everyone in here, including me, that the safe schools or the superintendent who directs the safe schools department are watching for things that need to be taken care of. She cannot see. It's very obvious that she doesn't know everything that's going on. And it's very obvious that she's paying attention to that person. And for someone to say, for the chair or uh, the vice chair to say, oh, you need to, you need to, She's, she's concentrating on the person that's speaking at the podium and the issue at hand, which is that person speaking. So I feel like, you know, I'm just, I'm going to reiterate what Dr. Spence said. For the safety, not only the decorum, but the safety of everyone in here and to move, move this along in a fashion that we can 
hear everybody. We can see what's going on. We're, we're being able to understand she is. I, I think that um, the words that are left here is to support whoever the chair is in, in moving this decor, moving this meeting on. Okay, I'm, looks like M M Mrs. Anderson. So we chose these words, the chair, superintendent, and or designee. Th those words were chosen specifically, as it's been pointed out, to help facilitate the meeting. But as has already been pointed out, there are many times that the, that the chair and the vice chair doesn't see certain things. So I, for the whole purpose of, I mean, our, our safe schools people are standing by, they're watching what's going on, and if there's 100 people or more in this room, they're, they're more apt to see what's going on out in the crowd more than we are if we're co trying to concentrate on speakers. So I think the language as it appears in here right now is the way it should move forward. Um, and I, 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 I'm in favor of just moving this along as it's written. I think it's general enough so that when we say designee, that's who we mean. We mean somebody who the, either the chair has designated as, like safe schools as a designated person to help, people to help, or if the superintendent designates some of the safe schools people to be here. I, I think that's why it's written like this, generally speaking. This, that's why it's written this way. So if we try to say only the chair or only the vice chair, we're narrowing who can actually see what's going on. And this is written for a reason, and I think we need to leave this language just as it is. All right, Mrs. Manning. And I was still seeking feedback to my proposal to include both, but so whoever wants to comment on that with their comments, thank you. Um, so I would just like, it's, it's midnight. We have staff that needs to work tomorrow, um, school board members that need to work tomorrow. I would like to make a motion that we defer items 13B8 through 17 on information and put it on information on the next agenda um, so that we aren't, um, you know, going round in circles at midnight on these topics. And I'm sure the public is probably asleep um, if we could there's a second. In, in, there well, is, in, in fairness, Mrs. Franklin has not has not said a word yet, and she's in the queue. And so I think that's not fair. Well, well I, I'll, I'll be willing to, you know, amend my emotion to say and, and when we finish the conversation on this topic, but, um, I mean, it's midnight, and I, I don't think these are pressing issues that, but I need it. We need a second before. Mm -hmm. So if we agreed to let Mrs. Franklin go ahead first, then we'll get back to Mrs. Manning. I think uh, Mrs. Manning's well, asking if there's a second to her motion. I need a second to the motion, and then we discuss that. And But my motion was that I, we Okay, would, I thought yeah. we were agreeing to have Mrs. Franklin speak, but we'll all be happy to entertain a second to Mrs. Manning's motion. If I'm correct, Mrs. Manning, the motion you have is that when you finish the discussions on this bylaw that you stop considering bylaws and policies for the rest of this meeting and defer them to another meeting. Is yes. that the motion on the floor? Yes. If there's a second, we'll open it up for just quick discussion. Mrs. Second. She did. Ms. Hughes seconded. Okay. So Who did the second? Ms. Hughes. So the discussion Ms. on the floor is Mrs. Manning's motion to, after finishing discussion on the current bylaw, that you would defer everything to another meeting. Is that correct? Discussion? All right, we'll just go ahead and vote. All in favor, show a raised hand. There's two ayes. Okay. All Manning, opposed, Mrs. please Mrs. show a raised hand. And there are eight nays. Okay, so Mrs. Franklin and Mrs. Riggs. Thank you. Um, I do want to just comment on your um, feedback, 
Miss Roy, I do believe that we should have you and either the vice chair or have the safe schools person um, go ahead and uh, accommodate the needs of keeping decorum in order. And I don't know if you could just give me a little bit of levity here, but I did. I was not here for the September 1st um, meeting. And if you could just give me just a few minutes, I just wanted to kind of explain my stance because I've gotten some feedback and I would like to address the public if that's okay. Um, this is what I was going to say at the meeting if I was going to be here. I know that this isn't going to make me very popular with some, but I feel like it needs to be said because I want to explain where I am coming from on this issue. I'm not trying to squash First Amendment rights at all. I'm happy to listen to all points of view from the constituents. I've actually met with personal, met personally with constituents off uh, away from the school board building and um, at their request. Um, and had great conversations with them. But since I'm constantly told that I work for you as your employee, then I ask you, why are you not concerned about the health and well-being of your employees? How would you feel if your boss made you stay well into the wee hours of the morning to yell at you and tell you are not doing a good job only to expect you to get up the next morning and go to work? Many of us on the school board still work, as Ms. Manning just mentioned. And more importantly, all of the staff are expected to get up the next morning and do their job. I know that I care about their health and well-being. We have many ways to have you exercise your First Amendment rights without causing us to stay past midnight till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. When does it start becoming absurd? Are we required to stay a full 24 hours to allow all of the speakers to speak before it's absurd? And I guess that was just a question from me because I want to know what is proper and what is considered, um, you know, our expectation. For me, my vote has less to do about squashing First Amendment rights and more to do with the common sense of leading. As a leader in this division, I don't want to do that to the staff and I don't think it as my, po as my boss, it's okay to expect that of us either. Perhaps some on the board may have more leniency with their next day so they can stay behind and you can express your opinions to them if you feel like you haven't been heard. But to keep the whole board and staff here until 2 to 3 a.m. sometimes is just not fruitful to me. I heard a quote which I thought was really insightful we judge ourselves by our intent, but judge others based on their actions. And I understand that some in the chambers are thinking about what their intent is for the evening, but some of us are also seeing your actions. And it doesn't appear as if you're willing to understand what your actions are creating in terms of lack of concern for, for those of us here either. We are in no frame of mind to make decisions at that time, which then brings me to the point that you are not allowing your employees to be in the best possible situation to make decisions and have to vote on items and to do the work of the school board and division. I do care about the morale and well-being of my employees, which is why I'm vo voting for the new decorum real rules. And I thank you for giving me less than three minutes for, to provide my intent behind my vote. So I know that a lot of people have given me feedback about voting for um, decreasing the time to three minutes, but I actually felt like I had something to say and I said it within three minutes. And it does allow more speakers to be heard throughout the night and I think that that is an important point. And I know that that is probably an unpopular view, but I do feel like we, again, we are here till midnight and we still have, it looks like eight more topics. And my point is, I, uh, one, I would like to just say that I am glad that we are allowing the staff to go home at 8 o'clock for those that are not um, providing feedback on... on um, no, <laughs> no, I'm saying for those people that are, are not going to be providing presentations on action items. So, But yes, I mean, I'm talking about Regina. I'm talking about you know uh, other people that have to be here um, at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I just personally feel like as a leader um, and as someone who has some opportunity to uh, give them a little bit of, um, I'm, I'm tired, I'm sorry, but an opportunity to, to be considerate of their time and um, what their expectation is. I just want to make sure that we also think it's important to discuss this again because we should have some kind of expectation at the meeting um, to be able to get, you know do the business of the board hear th the speakers um, as much as we can and then be able to move on and allow the everyone else to and the staff to be able to get up in the morning so thank you and mrs riggs um mrs linetti um when we had our special meeting 
special call meeting on that Wednesday. What was the date, Wednesday the? Ninth. The ninth? Okay. Mrs. Linetti, um, and I know Mrs. Uh, Rye, I did, several people took notes of all the different things that the people that were here discussed and said we spoke for that's the first that's the first the time. first sorry that's why I said it's the first all um of us you know expressed what we felt about the decorum and we talked about all of these things and we asked her because she's because of bylaws policies these kind of things she wrote what we she had heard what we had taken down uh we also took into um um into account the emails that the people that weren't here mrs franklin mrs manning mrs um Hughes, they all sent their emails about how they felt about not what they what they thought on um decorum and just their ideas And she tried to put in these policies and bylaws what we had asked her to do. We met two different times. The first time, the meeting was changed for policies. The policy review meeting was changed from the 16th to the week before on the 9th. So we could get these discussed and talked about. It was found out um, by a couple of our school board members that we did not follow completely the, the rules. So again, another special meeting was called, mm -hmm. which was yesterday. Thank goodness it was yesterday and not today because I wouldn't have been able to do it to discuss it again and to vote on it correctly. We spent many hours doing it. And I did say, I want, and so did Mrs. Um, Hughes and Mrs. Um, uh, Anderson, all wanted it to come to you to, to speak about it tonight. But most of this was shared by all of us and how we felt and what we wanted to do and what we asked her to do. To, to take this and to not decide what we're going to do and put it off to another meeting, I do not. I'm not happy with being here this, this late tonight either. Mm -hmm. We still have a closed session. Yes, we do. I was, I was in the hospital since 6.30 this morning, okay? Okay. Came straight from there to here. So I, as far as I'm concerned, we've spent a lot of time on this. Okay. Right. So I would just like to propose, if there's no objection from the superintendent, that we just add the chair to the to the superintendent and designees. And designees would include safe schools mm -hmm. because there are some things. Collect I just think it represents that it is a team effort. And again, I, it's I, I'm not looking for the chair to sh shirk any responsibility, but acknowledging that I think it's been well stated why staff is also needed. So I could be wrong. Uh, Mrs. Anderson, then Mrs. Manning. I thought we were discussing. Oh, never mind. No. OK, Mrs. Manning, it is, I mean, yeah, that, I, I that have to kind go. of, does will, that meet you halfway at least? Um, I, I will, um, what? Does, the, does that meet you halfway? Yeah, you, I, you know what? I'm tired, and you know I think it's absolutely ridiculous that we're still here and keeping staff here, because all of these um, all of these items it's just about shutting the public down and limiting them, and if this is so important to you all, I, I just think it's absolutely ridiculous that we are still here. It's midnight after midnight. You're keeping staff here. They have to work early in the morning. They're tired. We're all tired. We're grumpy. So I'm going to provide my feedback to you in writing, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it on my website for the public to know what my feedback is on these policies, and hopefully you'll consider my viewpoint. But you, we have a closed meeting, and you already missed a closed meeting. Are you leaving? That's, that's ridiculous. 
Yeah. Um, Again, can a final comment on this policy? Can we add the chair to this last line yes, here? The, got the chair, superintendent, here. or designees, and or designees. Where is that? That's Still the last one in, in B2. So it would read the chair. The superintendent or their designees are authorized to maintain order and decorum for all members of the public who are not called to the podium to address the school board. I think that that, that represents the collective view of, of the feedback we got. Sign of a compromise. That's wrong. That the last sentence. B2. The very last sentence. On 148? No, you're on 147 still. Oh, sorry. Can I just say one thing? I'm in the queue. Mrs. Melnick. And just for the um, three minute piece to this policy, it was a difference of an hour. So we could have been an hour sooner. Um, it was a difference of one hour. We had, you know, 50, we have 53 speakers. So we would have gained an hour of, of our time back. And the intent really is to not limit the number not of speakers. Not to limit the number of speakers, so, but to be able to so that hear a everybody compromise. within a decent amount okay. of time, and which Ms. Franklin executed beautifully okay One. okay so you're saying at the end of b2 um it said it would say this the chair comma superintendent or designate yes. okay thank you okay. all right i think we're ready to move on 148 the quorum and order i'll try to go quickly the changes that you're seeing in a are not significant i think they're just quantifying so i'm not going to go through them you can take a look at that i'd like to move on to where i think it's more significant for you B, limitations on addressing the school board, persons addressing the school board during public comments, section B, one, shall limit their comments to matters relevant to pre-K, a 12, public education, but and business school board consistent with what we said before. We would leave two in. Three would be comply with the time limits and other rules of public comments as set forth. I think it should say the bylaws and agenda or is otherwise determined by the school board. C, going into expressive activities during meetings. At certain school board meetings, the school board accepts public comments during designated section of the meeting agenda. The public comment sections of school board meetings are limited public forums for the sole purpose of accepting comments from members of the public relevant to pre-K-12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division. The school board does not accept other forms of public comment during meetings or at those times immediately preceding or following meetings. Going in down to expressive activities, remember, this is where you need to look at the amended information that came out of the um, PRC yesterday. Expressive activities, including but not limited to petitioning, conducting polls, picketing, displaying signs that would now read items that block the view, I would think members of the public, but that's the right word, or poster solicitation, demonstrating pamphlet, pamphlet distribution, use of noise-making devices, excessive cheering, booing, and or clapping that disrupts the meeting, calling out disruptive and noise making intimidation harassment or threats to persons entering in or departing meetings attempting to instigate confrontations or other conduct intended to disrupt the meeting shall not be permitted in the location of the school board meeting the offices of rooms adjacent to the meeting location the waiting rooms and corridors adjacent to the school board meeting location the school administration building the grounds of the school administration building or any building where a school board meeting is happening in such times prior to or after such meeting, strike out the new sentence, the school board administration building, its grounds and reserved parking spaces are not open for expressive activities unless a facility, it will be the facility request or application has been approved. The superintendent or designees are authorized to designate areas of school administration building grounds and parking lots that may be considered for, again, will be facility application or request. The next section is D. In the second paragraph, we would be making amendments. This bylaw does not preclude persons addressing the school board from delivering the school board to delivering the school board or its clerk written materials, including reports, statements, exhibits, letters, or signed petitions prior to or after a meeting. During a meeting, the school board does not accept any materials. This bylaw does not preclude persons called to address the board during public comment section to use a chart or a graph or other item during the public comments so long as that item does not interfere with the school board or other persons observing the meeting to hear or see the speaker or and the item does not create a safety issue or otherwise violate decorum or order. Furthermore, nothing shall be interpreted to prohibit members of the public from communicating with the school board 
or the school administration on matters relevant to pre-K-12 education, Virginia Beach was the school board and the school division at other times, then the meetings strike out. So that was where I was putting the, the, um, the materials. I'll try to make that consistent with the other bylaw. E, the chair or designee shall preserve decorum and order and shall decide all questions of decorum and order during the meeting. The school board members may vote to overrule the chair's or designee's decision at the time that the chair or designee makes the decision. The chair or designee is authorized to work with the school administration, law enforcement, authorized agents to maintain order and decorum prior to the start of, during, and immediately after any meeting. Yeah. The school administration, law enforcement, authorized agents will have responsibility for maintaining decorum and order outside of the meeting room and outside of a building where a meeting will be or is taking place. The school administration, law enforcement, authorized agents may address disruptive conduct in the meeting room if the person causing the disruptive conduct or behavior that violates other bylaws, policies, and regulations has not been called by the school board to address the school board during the public comment section of the meeting. Jumping down to H, at the request of the chair or superintendent, their designees, the city police officer, other law enforcement shall act as a sergeant arms the meetings and suggesting pulling out the rest of the language. Again, we were trying to distinguish in the meeting room, outside the meeting room, who would have responsibility. All right, questions, comments? May I go back to C? Expressive activities. So with the examples, uh, flags was removed? Yes, ma'am. The PRC replaced it yesterday with items that block the view. I think it's the other persons in the meeting. I mean, it, including but not limited to. So let me get to my point, because I, I responded to three emails yesterday where I told them there's, no, there's not an outright ban on bringing flags into this room. And, and we're talking about expressive activities, but the way it's worded, because I guess of what it doesn't say, it's very misleading. Can we somehow, I was trying to come up with some sentence that, you know, certain items are, I mean, we don't want to say every possible item is allowed into the room, but generally speaking, items, items allowed into the meet, meetings, I just couldn't come up with the language, but it gets so, I don't want to be answering for the next six months questions about uh, responding to accusations that we ban flags from this building when that's not true. So I need, a, I need some extra verbiage here to make that clear. That the, what we're trying to get, there's two things that are going on. You always have the right to control time, place, or manner in a meeting. One of the important things, because you're open, because you're filming it, we want to be able to see that people can see. It's also safety issues. Well, that's more. the expressive activity part of it. People can bring in anything, a sign, and as long as they're not displaying it until they come up to the podium, they're allowed to bring in their sign. And our position with, and I don't, that's why I said no outright ban. Obviously, we're not going to have people bringing in flags that are, you know, the size of the wall. But, um, so we're talking about, we are saying there are parameters to what you bring into the meeting. And when it you, might be, it, it doesn't help to say the use of items that block the view as opposed to blocking. Is that because you're talking about expressive activities? What are you doing? Things that you are doing or items that you're doing? Is that your concern? Is that well, the I wanted, use of that I item? Want to, I want to understand where people keep getting this, this uh, impression that we're banning bringing things in. No, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. No, sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. So, so again, we understand that some decisions might be made outside, but in, generally speaking, if it's folded up in your pocket, your purse, unless it's a dangerous item that you can't have, nobody's going through that. It's when you get in here and pretend to use it. The problem being that you are defining what you're going to allow to it. So people in the audience waving things around. One is a safety and a, a, an ability to bind me. But it's also they're, they're using another avenue to get your attention when you've decided that people coming to the podium are the way during yeah, meeting. And, and we understand that about the expressive activity. But how can we get beyond, on, on the step before that, about items allowed 
It Maybe. could be if we add the, the phrase in front of items that block the view, you say use of items that block the view, because that would be the activity. Is that where you're trying to, because the beginning of the sentence is expressive activities. Oh, may I ask? No, we, no, not in queue yet. Can you put me in the queue, please? I mean, maybe this is something where we have to follow up with some suggested wording outside of this meeting. Point of reference. Oh, I just need clarification on what she just said. Okay. Do, do you mean to say, instead of saying items that might block the view of persons observing the meeting, instead of saying that, would you would you're you're suggesting the use of items that might block the view of persons observing the meeting? Is that what you're saying? If instead? what you're prohibiting is expressive activities, and then this list follows, then it would be the use of these items. So we are where it might the way or just said items that block the view suggests that those items can't be in the meeting. But it's the use of those items as the expressive activity. Is that where you're trying to go with this? What? Can we follow up? Can I follow up with our PRC chair on this, Mrs. Riggs? Are, are you trying to make sure we have some kind of language in there that says that we are not banning flags? Well, not out. <laughs> I'm, I, I would use the out the name the word outright for anything because we do allow certain items to be brought in, but right. we, don't, we don't have any single outright ban on any item, Miss Doctor Spence. Right, and um, perhaps I could just suggest because. It's easier for staff if we have clarity on the issue, you know, in terms of how we advise people who are coming in with items. If it just said, to Cammie's point, expressive activities including but not limiting to petitioning, conducting polls, picketing, displaying signs, using items that block the view of persons observing the meeting, and I would even strike or posters, because we do allow posters to come in. You just can't use them to block the view of people observing the meeting, and then solicitation demonstrating, and then that way we could just simply advise whether that's flags, posters, or anything else, you're welcome to bring that in with you. You may not display it in such a way that it blocks the view of others. That's all I'm are. trying to do. Yeah. So I think just that, just eliminating posters and putting the use of, as Cami suggested, would be ample direction for staff for us to be able to communicate that clearly when people are coming in with different items, which is the issue and which was an issue and which we addressed as we've discussed. So is... So, okay, we have, are the Q people to speak to this? Mrs. Hughes, Mrs. Franklin, Mrs. Hughes, let's just see. And then Mrs. Franklin. Um, I, I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna be able to support anything that bans people from gathering outside. I just, I've said it before and I'll say it again. You have a First Amendment right to address and, you know, petition your elected officials this is where they go for that, and I think they should be allowed to gather outside. Can can we elaborate that this that what this is and what it isn't? Can I, can I respond to that? What she just said, please. Okay, we are not banning rallies. We are not banning people from gathering outside. What we're asking, and what we're saying is there are certain parts of this building perimeter that they can rally. And it's not on the grounds in front of the building or the parking area. They can go on the sides where it is the public sidewalks that the city owns, but they're not right there on the grounds of the building are the parking area where they're blocking people and where people are having to go out. That's what, we're not saying they, they, they don't have to. And I have um, you want me to read the, the code. What we did in looking at this, um, the administrator directed that the city has, and again, we've been working on clarifying who controls this building and the grounds on there, and the current, our current opinion is that you have exclusive use of the building, the grounds, and the, the reserved parking lots. We went to look, so the question is, does the city get to control it? What are the city's roles on it? The city's administrative directive, AD 3.01, petitioning, picketing, or other expensive activities in city buildings reads, 
purpose. City buildings and work areas are not public forums. Again, what I was trying to get you to put into your bylaws. This directive is established in view of the potential for disturbance caused by activities not related to the conduct of city business. Minister Directive talks about the restrictions. No expressive activities, including but not limited to petitioning, picketing, displaying signs of posters, solicitation, demonstrating, pamphlet distribution, conducting polls, are permitted in city buildings in the restricted area joining such buildings and as defined by this area. Also talks about sales and soliciting. The scope is where we got to this. This directive shall be applicable to all buildings which are owned or leased by the city, whether or not open to the public or to, and to the exterior areas such as equipment, compounds, vehicle storage areas, horticultural nurseries, by the buildings and grounds administered by, by the convention center that allows maybe subject to individual. The next one is two, the exterior steps and ramps providing access to a building, adjacent lawns, the walkways which provide access to any building from its designated parking areas, parking lots, and the vehicle driveway serving such buildings shall be considered ad adjoining restricted areas for purposes of this directive. However, these guidelines do not restrict expressive activities conducted in compliance with city codes on public sidewalks adjacent to public streets. These rules are content neutral, and it goes on to do that. So this is actually your, what we're proposing is a little bit less um, restrictive than what the city has. But the city has banned parking lots, so my suggestion is you designate where it can happen, uh, develop a process, because my other concern is if you don't put limitations on it, it's not just groups maybe coming from a school board, it's other people that just want to use your lawn, so I want you to have the ability to state it. And this isn't really that different than what you do on any other property. You fill out a facility use form to have a tournament or something that you define out this one. I did not specify where specifically because I figured you all could talk about that with the superintendent. I am reserving the ingress and egress just like it does in the administrative directive, the parking lot so that the business of schools can go and people come in and out. That's not restricted. Where you designate it on the lawn and what facility, that's something you can decide. What we consider public sidewalks for potential public Can I just, forms. you keep talking about people being right here so people can't leave the building. You're going to have to acknowledge that the reason people are there, they're not having the gatherings there. It's because they can't come in here when they're signed up to speak. So they stay right here by the door so that they can hear their name being called. Because if someone calls them and they're not there and don't hear them, the person comes back and says, they're not here and they move on to the next speaker. They're only gathered on the steps and this front walk here when it's time for speakers. They move up there so they can hear their names being called. So if you don't want them there for that, you're going to have to come up with something different. But where, where do you want them to go when they're waiting for their names to be called? Again, this is allowing you the opportunity to start developing those procedures. We want to make it. And if, you're line, if the school division is lining them up, then I'm assuming that that's okay. What I heard from you on September 1st is there are concerns about getting in and out of this building and in and out of cars and getting cars on the parking lot. So how do we address that? And that's, this is what I'm suggesting. And what I'm trying to point out with the administrative directive is this isn't really different. The city is actually more restrictive than you are. This is consistent with what the rest of the municipal center is doing. So we're not going way out on a limb here. OK, we, we have Mrs. Franklin and Mrs. Anderson. Go ahead, Mrs. Franklin. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I just, I did want to address, because I thought that, um, I'm not sure where Mr. Robertson is, but um, he, he did actually bring up a good point that I believe that, uh, Dr. Robertson, did you not say that, that there is something that you're working on to have a little bit more continuity in terms of speakers and stuff like that? And then I just wanted to quickly address another comment that I feel like needs to be made or two. Um, one is that the reason that they had mentioned about doing the permits was because we needed to know how much additional security was going to be needed for a particular meeting. So that was the reason for the permit. And then also um, I, I, the cloth emblem. And I just wanted to, again, recognize that that was not referring to the flag. Um, so when we were talking about the cloth emblem, that is not referring to the flag. Well, and, and maybe we need to clarify that then, because from what I understood, it was not referring to that flag. And I think that there, ever since the very first meeting when some incident occurred, that we have been allowing flags into the meetings. So, um, but yeah, Dr. Robertson, if you just wanted to just quickly. 
mention? Yeah, sure. We are uh, looking at uh, using a method similar to when you go to a restaurant. You go up to the hostess okay. stand. Okay. Uh, you get give them your text, your phone number. We text you when it's time for you to come back up and, and uh, speak, so that way you don't have to sit outside in the sun or if it's raining. You can go to your car and we'll so we're looking at that method right now it, can, can i just ask some? a clarifying question again because I'm, I'm also seeking to understand here um it, it seems to me there's a difference between waiting to speak and expressive activities and that this policy specifically is addressing expressive activities right. and so i think if there's clarity on that issue that helps us as a staff say you're engaging in activities not allowed by the board. If you're here to speak, please just form a line and wait. Versus if we've got our bullhorns or we're, we're engaged in other, you know, we're waving things and people can't walk by or whatever it is. Uh, again, and I'm not making implications. I'm trying to understand. Then how do we, you know, then that's different than waiting to speak. So um, I think the intent was if there was a generally what I understood the intent of the conversation was if there's going to be a rally, then as with any other rally that happens in a municipal center, that's a permitted process. That's and, my that, intention. And, and the school board has the right to determine where those will occur versus them just occurring anywhere, like in our employee parking lot when our employees are coming out of the building. Regardless of how our employees are being treated, our employees don't necessarily want to walk out into the middle of a rally when they're going to their car would be our position as staff. And so I think that's one of the reasons why in the municipal center, you've got a permit for a rally so that we know where that's gonna be happening. We can tell our employees that in advance. We can, as was mentioned by Ms. Franklin, prepare whatever security may be needed, but given the size and scope of the rally. Lots of things that you do when you're permitting rallies, you're talking about a restroom's gonna be needed. So you're trying to work that out in advance with the rally organizers. So there's a lot of other things that that actually benefits everybody to know, so there's clarity on where it can be. We make sure it's not going to impact staff. There, there's, uh, I mean, again, reminder, this is a building where people work. Uh, and and uh, generally, just because of the coinciding of, of the board's um, meetings being held here and beginning around 4 o'clock, generally, our folks are egressing from the building right about the same time that people are showing up for rallies right now. And so, and, and I certainly would encourage the rallies, but I don't think it's inappropriate to permit those and, and ask them to be in a specific place. That happens all over the city. You, you, you don't do parades or rallies anywhere in the city without permits. And so I think it's wholly appropriate for the school board to consider it, but that's for expressive activities, not for lining up to speak. And I think we would just need to have our staff be clear on that. Okay. And I don't mean to um it's my turn. I don't mean to um belabor what Dr. Spence just said, but I was here last Tuesday for um a, a policy committee meeting, no audit. And um I walked out with eight employees who made it perfectly clear to me there are hundreds of people that work in this building who do not want to be here at five o'clock on a school board day. It is on social media, it is in emails that there are rallies here. And as we could see tonight, we have angry people here. I'm not saying it's wrong, but they're angry. And the, and the perception from our hundreds of employees who have to leave at the same time that this has already started is not fair to them because they are being talked to as they walk out. They are being followed to their cars and people are talking to them and laying hands on them and saying things to them and they don't wanna be here. They're asking to leave early and it's not fair. This is a place of business. I don't care that all that stuff goes on outside. It's been going on for a year. I don't care. I, that's anybody's right to do that. But to do what's being done to the innocent people who work in this building is not fair. They should not have to park out back to avoid it. They should not have to park down the street. This is their place of employment five days a week. And we have to respect that. Well, and... I need to layer on because I don't want anybody wagging fingers. This is not about anything happening right now. This Correct. board is setting policy for any future, future events, Correct. any future demonstrations by any group, anytime, anywhere. So I hear folks saying, hey, it's not us. We're, we're peaceful. It's a prayer group. You know, and I, great, wonderful. 
I'm not sure that would count as expressive activity, you know, and so it, we'd have to sort of figure that out and, and delineate clearly what that is. However, there have been rallies out here. There have been flags and bullhorns and uh, elected officials and folks coming in from out of the state and out of the out of town to, to participate. And, and so those things are happening. And I think we could anticipate those things may continue to happen. And there may be other groups who are, um, you know, opposing. And so we would want to know that so we can we can plan for that with security. So uh, I, I don't mean to belabor the point, but it isn't about a particular group at a particular time. And I don't think this policy is reactionary. I think it's thinking forward in a proactive way. How do we maintain a, um, a place where our folks can work here and people can come and they can express themselves with their First Amendment right to gather, yes. but do so in a way that's appropriate and um, managed just as if uh, it would be anywhere else in the municipal center. And you know, many I've spoken to many for a lot of years now. To me, I'm concerned about the fact that you don't have any rules here, and we keep having these events, which means you are then opening it. So, what happens when I have a group that's not even related to schools and wants to show up here? I don't have the ability to say the school board can't do that because you've created an open forum with no rules. So, you could have a totally unrelated group there. That's, and I have a li concern from business, a liability issue. If something happens here, I know when I rent facilities, and you all know I do Special Olympics, and I've used your facilities for 30 years, I had turned in my certificate of insurance. If something happens, I am the person there. You know who it is. You've got my insurance. I am responsible for those issues. You're not thinking those terms, but somebody gets hurt outside, and you did not, you know that rally is going on. You didn't have anything in place. You're going to be liable, or we're going to have to at least go through you know, a, a potential suit. Those are other things or business aspects that I feel like if you at least put some control on it, what if you have three groups show up and one group has a permit or use and the other one doesn't? That permit use person, that group should be the one to be here. The other one doesn't. We have to tell them they need to leave. Those are business reasons for it. So I would, I've, I've had an ongoing concern for many years that you don't have procedures in place. So I would like procedures in place so that you can handle the situation when it comes up. Not necessarily talking about somebody in the past going forward how do we protect this organization that's what i'm looking for so that's my suggestion on um, why you have a need for this all right so for the others in the queue tell me if you still it's mrs riggs miss owens and miss anderson have questions been answered or do you have more to ask okay miss owens just really brief um i just want to acknowledge that uh, as miss hughes pointed out uh right now and probably for the foreseeable future we're not going to have the space in our chambers to have people wait who are scheduled to speak and i do think it's worth exploring further the possibility of maybe one overflow seating room for speakers only as the weather is going to be getting colder as I love the idea of uh, having the pager system like at a restaurant, but I just want to acknowledge that there, there may be people who would like to come and speak who do not have a car to sit in. And if we know that they're coming to speak because they've signed up to have them stand in the rain or in the cold or in some other kind of circumstance that we may not be able to house 50 or 60 speakers to sit in a room, but to have something to get us started with the people Obviously, we can fit about 10 people in our chambers, and then if we had a, a room or something to explore, and I, don't, I know it would take another staff member because somebody would have to supervise it, somebody would have to set it up, it's a whole thing, just saying to explore it, where speakers could sit and those 10 or 15 or whatever it is we can safely fit in a room, sit as their numbers are being called, and then the next group of five or 10 or 15 can come in and sit to help alleviate some of the standing at the door if it makes us feel as uncomfortable as it seems like part of the discussion is. So just throwing it out there for further exploration. All right, Mrs. Anderson and then Mrs. Felton. So just for clarity purposes, um, in C, uh, paragraph two, have we settled on the wording using items that might block the view of persons in persons observing the meeting is that what we settled on because that's what i heard last that's what i wrote down okay all right and then on at the end of that we we, we we're definitely going with request or uh, uh or dr how about um dr roberts and i verify the 
what they use. I know you put in a request or an application. I think the forms of applications, uh, I, I'll talk with um, um, Dr. Robinson and the staff and just figure out what's the proper form, what the proper term is. Okay, so, all right, so I thought you were already going to do that, but that's okay. So, so you're going to fix that. It's not going to say permit. It will probably say application. I think or permit in. I think your form, your your term is application or request. Yes. yes. We talked about that. So I just want to be. I just wanted to be clear on that on that wording. So if you'll clarify that and then send that out to us. Okay. And Mrs. Felton. And Ms. Anderson might already hit on it. I know Dr. Spence there, but I'm I'm going back to where you have in the same paragraph, picketing, displaying signs, right? Cloth symbols. Uh, no, 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 no. It doesn't we're taking that out, right? Did we take all of that out? That's replaced with use of items block the view of the persons in the meeting. So can you read that for me again? Because I'm going to try. Move. All right. So expressive activities, including, but not limited to petitioning, conducting polls, picketing, displaying signs. I think this phrase use of items that block the view of persons in the meeting, solicitation, demonstrating pamphlet distribution. And it goes on to the use of noisemakers, devices, excessive cheering, booing, and or clapping with the additional phrase of that the that that goes with excessive cheering, booing, or clapping, mm -hmm. that disrupts the meeting, calling out, disrupted noisy making, intimidation, harassment, or threats to persons entering in or departing meetings, attempting to instigate con confrontations, or other conduct intended to disrupt the meeting, and shall not be put in, in there. That just explains the locations. Would it be easier for you if I bulleted them out? Would you like me to bolt them out so it would be easier for you to look yes. at them? Yes, uh, I think that would be a little bit more. Um, Please into the eyes and you can read it. Um, I mean, we talked about excessive cheering also. That was one, one of the things that came up in the meeting. And, and so we decided to leave that wording in there. And that would be up to the chair to determine if it was excessive. Because like tonight, when we had some students that were recognized, I wanted to clap, but I hesitated. Because I didn't want somebody said, oh, you were clapping. But, you know, I think if we leave that, whether you would rule whether it's excessive or not, that would be up to the chair. Okay. All right. Any? Are we ready to move on to the next yeah, one? I think this is Owens. Yep. Just in regards to the excessive cheering portion, I will throw it out as a suggestion. I really thought today's speakers went well, and one of the things that happened with today's speakers was it was silent when our speakers spoke. We were able to hear everything that they said, and we were able to hear the next speaker being called, and the next speaker was able to hear themselves being called. And I, I would propose that just during our speaker section, we just say, the chambers are silent during the speakers, except for the person who's speaking. And then it eliminates having to have the chair be a gauge about whether the clapping was the correct amount of seconds before it was excessive afterwards, et cetera. We want to be able to move our speakers through efficiently. And by having the chambers silent so that we can hear them, respect them, and efficiently move the next speaker in, it kind of gives delineation about when it's appropriate to clap, like during recognitions, and to cheer and to celebrate, and when it's appropriate to listen and focus and transition our speakers through. So that, that's just my thought to help eliminate some of the needs about excessive cheering or not excessive cheering. Okay, ready to move on. Thank you. Yes. Now, basically, I want to just explain to you about why we want to designate where you can in the property. The next series of policies are really actually related to that. They should go a little bit faster. That I just was trying to make sure we're consistent. You're going to see. I keep trying to use. I'm just trying to standardize a form of what I mean by facilities. So the first one I'll show you, and then I'll just skip it through the rest of the time. Buildings, facilities, grounds, vehicles, and equipment. So I'm using that, and I'm going to designate that term. You'll see it as facilities throughout there. This one is not a real complicated one. I'm sorry, this is 355B. Emergency repairs, again, just it's B is simple. Superintendent designees may authorize separate contracts for emergency repairs to facilities in accordance with applicable law. That's just making sure we're following the procurement. What's important on this one, I wrote, Clearing, clarifying that responsibility of the building, there's principles, but then we have administrative buildings. That's 
falls in a decision. So it's going to be the principal or building administrator or support services. What's important here is this definition in F, then defining facilities, explaining what, so when we use that term, that's going to keep showing up in the next couple policies. If there are not any questions on that, I'm sorry, the 716, I didn't get in there. Okay, let me jump real quick to show you where this shows up. You're going to see this again. And sorry. Um, seven, I'm going to jump you down to 749, also organization eligible to use facilities. So again, you're seeing that if you jump to 749, the facilities, just clarifying that who's running the building on there, talking about the groups on there. The only significant change in this one is that we're clarifying political groups. You actually have a pamphlet that Mr. Sutton sends out that talks about what political activities are there. I want to clarify on what we're doing here. Political groups are campaigning. Facilities may not be used for campaigning for candidates for elected office or for campaign related activities except when facilities are used as polling places and campaign activities are limited to designated areas for election officials. That's when you run out your polls. The purpose of this restriction is to ensure that school board owned or operated facilities remain politically neutral. Political groups, including but not limited to lobbying organizations, political action committees, local political groups may use facilities for regular organization meetings when condi under conditions that indicate that the school board and the school division are not endorsing the organization. So we're just limiting the campaign. So that's the facility one that goes with the last one. I'm going to jump through. 753, community use of facilities, application approval for the use of facilities. Most are here just clarifying again that the superintendent designee can designate who will do the, to handle those facilities with the community use on their last sentence. The superintendent designee is authorized to deny any application in writing for use of facilities for good cause. Again, we usually have conditions that, again, we have COVID right now, so we're not letting people inside our buildings to use that. The building is already rented by somebody else. That's what we mean by good cause, not choosing a content based situation. Click again to 754, rules and conditions of facilities, again, defining facilities. The last sentence in the first paragraph, adding health and safety protocols applicable to facilities will apply to individuals, organizations using the group. So if we have COVID restrictions, they have to follow them. This is an example. Individuals, organizations using facilities may not disrupt or interfere with educational activities of business, the school division, the superintendent designee is authorized to take appropriate actions and limiting some of the other things like alcohol and tobacco. That's all we're doing with that particular one. Okay, so those are similar. I won't go through those really quick. Um, 716 has to, is also similar for, for um, this is policy. Remember, policies in Section 7 deal with the community. This is also an expressive activity issue that we needed to clarify for that. Again, goes back to the use of your facilities. So the first paragraph general goes to the explanation of facilities explaining that the facilities are not open for public forums for use of public expression during the regular school days or when educational activities are being conducted during the business hours or when members of the public have not obtained permission to use school division, school board building facilities, grounds and vehicles. Um, nothing really significant there. Then I'm clarifying down here in two, the policy does not extend to the public sidewalks outside of or adjacent to facilities Public side merits is what I would call perimeter sidewalks. That's traditionally where they're usually against public streets. What we're talking about. Internal sidewalks and internal paths for ingress and egress parking areas are not open to public, not open for not open for open forms of public expression. So that's consistent with what we talked about the last bylaw. Hold on. Because I thought we added mm -hmm. a comma and we said unless a facilities use oh, application sorry. has been approved. This and approved, and that would be in the amended um, version that's on that have been added today. Yes, application again. The rest of this just pretty, pretty much consistent, so I wanted to show you that. And last paragraph would be on enforcement number E at the that if a person fails to comply with the building administrator, designee shall. Uh, so I request that the person leave and may take appropriate actions if the person does not leave the property, including contacting law enforcement. So that's just consistent with what we were talking about earlier. All right, 717, and that's last 
717 is actually a policy we use a lot. We have these situations arise at school where someone at a school is not acting appropriately. So how do we deal with that circumstance? I'm going to suggest that we, instead of just saying school, we would say visitors to school facilities. There's some cleanup language that's going on in the first paragraph and second paragraph. So paragraph three, when visiting facilities or school-sponsored events, visitors are expected to comply with the decorum and order guidelines health safety protocols and applicable bylaws, policies and regulations, principals and building administrators or their designees are encouraged to post a quorum and order guidelines at the facilities for visitors to view. And visitors seeking to meet with specific administrators should make arrangements in advance of coming to the facilities. Down at the end of the um, particular, that this paragraph, we would have visitors shall be treated in a courteous manner, shall be afforded prompt and informative replies to legitimate questions in accordance with school board bylaws and policy and regulations for safety and health purposes, the superintendent or designee may prevent or limit persons other than students, staff, and authorized agents from accessing school board property, school board events. Right now, when we've got health restrictions, that's an example of that. And the only thing that shows up after that would be the definition of facilities that shows back up. Are there any questions? Sorry, and that would be a, sub a new subsection C, carrying forward the definition of facilities we've seen in the last couple ones. Are there any questions on that? All right, so I went through 749 with you, went through 753, which was community use, went through 754, permit. And then because we discussed a long time ago, we talked about what to do with when you had to change meetings. At the request of the PRC, I went to look where else does it come in that we, need, we should honor the committee members, the board members, when you change meeting dates to make sure that they're consulted on there. So a little bit of cleanup work that in first paragraph, I'm sorry, this is Appendix C, which is the one we just adopted several months ago about committee procedures. First paragraph A is just some cleanup language about the lang um, electronic meetings for emergency. Members of the public should be able to observe the meeting and meeting locations must be open to public with ADA accommodations unless conditions set forth in bylaw 136 exist and the request of the PRC was to add a paragraph that they referred to for electronic emergency meetings. So in those situations where you, the committee can't meet, that you make sure that that, um, that we explain that, that that's why you would do that, but we would find a way for the public to know when or how to participate in the meeting. A little bit of cleanup down there. Where Mrs. Hugh's concern that we discussed earlier comes back in is in section five, electronic or remote, par remote participation. We're talking about when you either can't, all of you cannot come in or you some, an individual can't come in. Our suggestion would be, it would be that starting in the third sentence, by June 1st, the staff members will report to school board clerk all electronic means for the year, pick up a new sentence. All committee members should be consulted before changing the date, time, and location of means so that the committee members are not required to use limited remote participation opportunities to participate in the meeting that was changed. Goes back to the um, bylaw on open meetings, make sure that that's you're consulting the individuals in there. Again, this is committee, so if you're the committee chair, to talk to your committee members about it. I think that's the only place it shows up in this particular bylaw. And also because we're talking about committees, I then had to go to bylaw 128, which is your actual committees. And we added somewhat similar phrase in here. Let me get to that. All right, so you would be going on to A7. Oh, did I miss that again? Sorry. A7 and H. A7 and H. Okay. So let's start with A7. Roles and responsibility of the committee chair. It lists a 7 1. Subsection H, we are proposing, would read maintain the agreed upon schedule for committee meetings. I think it's regular schedule or regular meetings. Regular meetings, unless all committee members have agreed to change the date or time of a scheduled meeting. There was some discussion about how this should happen, but the suggestion was to add in there so that you're consulting committee members. It was slightly differently than the other one, but the intent in this section was if you set a schedule that every first Tuesday of the month you're meeting, before you change that, you're going to consult the committee so members. This is the, the language. Point of information. Should, should try to maintain the agreed upon schedule for committee meetings 
and give consideration to the availability of committee members before changing the meeting date or time. That we took was out the, the word all, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. That's what we put there instead. Yeah, I'm sorry. What I'm reading was the last language. Look at the amended language in your package. That's where that came from. Okay. So read that one more time. Maintain. Maintain. Um, maintain. The should, try to, should try to maintain the agreed upon schedule for committee meetings and give consideration to the availability of committee members before changing the meeting date or time. That's H. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Cammy, did you get that so we can fix Yeah, it? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm reading for the last copy, not the okay. copy. It's okay. And Cammy, that was um, when uh, Anna sent that to the committee members on the attachment that you sent yesterday, last night, after our meeting. Yes. Yeah, so That's all in there. This it's is all, all in there. Okay. And the intent of these, because it came out of discussions that we saw in the first ones, we were trying to match Appendix C and Appendix 128 with the bylaw that you changed earlier. I believe that is it. And I'll just summarize. I'm, I will be taking those suggestions you have. We will draft them out. I will have Mrs. Riggs sent out from the Policy Review Committee to the rest of you if you would respond back to the whole committee so that we can consider it. If it appears there's a general consensus on language, those can go forward. If not, we'll have to figure out about the ones where there are significant changes, and that's how we will go forward with this. Is that correct, Mrs. Riggs? Yes. I have a okay. comment to make. I'm Mrs. Melnick. Mrs. Linetti, I just want to thank you and, and, and the Policy Review Committee. Nobody cares about my comments at 1 in the morning, but I just want to say, as an adult, I've been involved with Virginia Beach City Public Schools for 31 years. And when I taught, <laughs> I didn't know who my school board members were or the 600 policies that, that governed this, this school system. And I have never seen transparency like this ever, including I have friends on other boards. Nobody's as transparent as we are. It, this is absolutely amazing. And the fact that we have a policy committee that's been in existence for five years, um, and they go to the, this length, and it is vetted through this board the way it is, and that we're sitting here at 1 o'clock in the morning and still going on, surely proves to the public that this is important to us, and we mean business. And I'd, and I'd like to say that the um, that finally, and I should say finally, the citizens of Virginia Beach do know who their school board members are, and they are engaged, and they know that that we welcome them, and um, that and and we like their participation. And I'll also say that um, these policies we are required to go through these. That didn't happen as often as it does now, and so kudos to this group. It's a lot of work. And it's a, and, and this is the checks and balance that, that exists here um, so that we're all involved. And I thank you. It's a lot of work, and I thank you. PRC has done a lot of work. Thank you. Okay, um, a, a question for Madam Clerk. Is there a way, because I do have to conclude the formal meeting, is there a way to determine if the two non-agenda speakers the are two non-agenda speakers are listed online all right so I'll, oh i will read awesome. i will read that but so uh committee and board reports if you'd be kind enough to email those to us is everybody agreeable to that okay so then i'm here i'm concluding the formal meeting and uh we'll allow a moment for transition line to read a motion to go into closed session. Move that the school board recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions of open meetings allowed by section 2.2-3711 part A paragraph 7 and 8 of the Code of Virginia namely for consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting 
merely because an attorney representing the school board, the public body is in attendance. This is for, again, how to do with the purpose of subdivision. That this subdivision probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or which the public body or legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be convinced by or against a known party. Nothing in subdivision, again, permits closure of the meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is, per is present or attending or consulting on the matter. This is namely to discuss the status of pending litigation related to the school board. So moved. A second. Mrs. Felton. All in favor, show a raised hand. We have um, nine, a nine. We have nine eyes to go into closed. All right. So we need another moment to transition. All right. Go ahead, please, Mrs. Melnick. Whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such a closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. I need a motion. So, so a motion, Mrs. Franklin, and a second, Mrs. Riggs. All in favor, show a raised hand. We have nine ayes. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk, and we are adjourned.